Some Like It Hopeless. Written by Megan Bryce. Narrated by Tess Irondale. Prologue. Of course, Cassandra would be wearing purple when it happened. The dress made her look as wide as a house, the color making her look like a zombie bride. Or bridesmaid, really. Because that's what she got for being a sister. Trussed up in the ugliest dress, in the ugliest color known to man. And she'd worn the stupid dress, and she hadn't complained too loudly. At least, not to her sister. Because her best friend, the love of her life, the man she would die for, had looked at her and told her to work it. So Cassandra had pulled up her Spanx, had mentally flipped off her sister, right, like her sister hadn't done it on purpose, and had worked it. And it had been okay, because Shane was right there with her, working it too. His dress shirt and socks matching the putrid purple of her dress, his arm linked through hers, his smile wide and manic, his whispered observations snide and catty. And Cassandra could smile at her sister, could tolerate her parents. And then, he wasn't right there with her. He was off having fun. Then, off getting distracted by a pretty new bird. And then, off. Gone. Gone. Cassandra watched Shane forget about her, watched him leave the reception without her. The first time ever that he'd forgotten about her. Hadn't made sure that she was okay with him going off for a little bit of fun. They'd been each other's wingmen for years, and they'd always made sure the other was okay with being left alone. Always. Shane wouldn't even have asked today, because he would have known that Cassandra couldn't handle her family without him. Except, there he went, with his pretty new bird, and Cassandra decided Shane's pretty new bird wasn't all that pretty. His pretty new bird looked boring, brown hair, brown eyes, and wearing a white shirt, black suit, and black tie. He looked like he wasn't even sure he was gay. Cassandra had known this day would come. She loved Shane, and he loved her. But they were a bird and a fish, in love with nowhere to live. She'd known that someday he would find another bird to fly with. He'd find a bird he could love and he could live with. Shane would have never left Cassandra alone at her sister's wedding, wearing this dress, unless he'd found that bird. How fitting that on this day, she looked like death warmed over. Because this day, she watched her heart walk out the door. This day, she died. Fucking purple. Chapter One, 30 Minutes Later. The bartender poured her another shot. You okay? Cassandra didn't look at him, just tipped her head back and tried to kickstart her heart with another shot of liquid fire. It's the dress. Purple is not my color. It's not the dress. It's the tears sliding down your cheek. Cassandra blinked, focusing on him for an instant, before taking the little square napkin he was offering. She patted her cheek, and decided that alcohol wasn't working fast enough. She wondered if a different sort of distraction would work better than alcohol. But not with this bartender. He looked young and fresh, like tragedy had never touched him, and Cassandra wanted to reach across the bar and choke him to death. She turned away from him, scanning the room of the swanky hotel on the outskirts of L.A. Everyone was happy. It was a wedding. Cassandra wouldn't find what she needed here. She crumpled the napkin in her hand and stood, making her way to the door. She'd go home, get out of this dress, and do something. Maybe do nothing. Maybe do nothing for a really long time. She left without telling her family, gave her ticket to the valet, and waited. And waited. A deep voice behind her said, I've called you a cab. What? Cassandra turned, nearly taking a step back when she got a look at him. Tall, big. He wore a well-fitted suit over his bulked-up body. Black suit, black shirt, black tie. An ugly scar snaked down his cheek. His dark brown eyes looked nearly black, his expression empty, except for the loathing radiating from him. 
and Cassandra knew this man had died, just like her. Cassandra stared at him. He stared back. I've called you a cab. No one leaves my hotel drunk and driving. Where's your designated driver? Cassandra's throat closed, and she choked out, he left. He looked at her, and she knew he could see the death in her eyes as well as she could see it in his. He said, we make our own tragedies. And Cassandra whispered, yes. He turned back to the hotel, holding the door open for her, and she followed, searching for a way to stop the pain, even if it was for a little while, looking for a way to forget that she was a dead woman walking. Cassandra let herself into her little bungalow the next morning, rumpled, used, abused. Two people had come together last night, punishing themselves, punishing each other. It hadn't been pretty, but it had been exactly what she needed. She threw her phone on the counter without turning it on. She didn't want to talk to anyone. She didn't want to talk to a specific someone. She didn't want to find out that Shane hadn't called her yet, that he still hadn't remembered her. She jumped at the knock on the door, whirling to face it, telling herself that she wouldn't cry in front of Shane, telling herself she had to open the door because he had a key. But when she looked through the peephole, it was No Name the Giant, in a different all-black suit, looking clean and crisp, still scarred. She opened the door slowly, narrowing her eyes at him. Did you follow me? He held out her driver's license. I tried to catch you before you left. You can't drive without a license. Cassandra had stuffed it inside her bra yesterday, along with her phone, so she wouldn't have to buy a purple clutch. It must have been lost in the scuffle of clothing removal. You could have mailed it to me. And you would have been driving around for three days without a license. She said, you're a real stickler about driving. Do you follow every law to the letter? I do now. She waved him inside, grabbing her license as he passed her. I'm not going to ask. Good. Because last night was a one night stand and I'm not ever going to see you again. He nodded, looking around her little living room. He'd taken her to the penthouse of his hotel last night, bigger than her whole house, and Cassandra had wondered if his hotel was actually his hotel. It could be. His suits said money. The hotel staff jumped when he so much as glanced at them. Of course, they might have been jumping because he looked like he could crush anyone who got in his way and would enjoy doing it. He said, maybe you'll never see me again. And since you won't ask, I guess I'll tell you. Yeah, I noticed you were a bit contrary last night. I follow every letter of the law now, because I've been to prison and I don't want to go back. Cassandra eyed his body, the girth of his biceps, the dead look in his eyes. She said, for how long? Not as long as I deserved. Any tattoos? She'd seen his body last night, but it had been dark. She might have missed one. He pointed to the scar on his face. This is enough for me. Did you get that in prison? His hard face got harder. No. Prison. Cassandra wasn't sure how she felt about prison, about someone who'd actually been in prison. He didn't ever want to go back, so that might be a point in his favor. He'd come right out and told her, and Cassandra didn't know if that was in his favor or not. Cassandra climbed onto a bar stool in her hideous and now wrinkled beyond repair bridesmaid dress. Not that she cared. She had plans for this dress, and it involved a pair of scissors and then a match. Well, thanks for the license and last night. Goodbye. He sat down on her couch, taking up all the room. He relaxed, leaning his head back and closing his eyes. I feel like we have some leftover business from last night. I brought some rope. Ick. Maybe next time. Maybe never. He opened his eyes to stare at her, obviously not believing there wasn't going to be a next time. She said, I don't think you know how a one-night stand works. He smiled a little, just the corners of his mouth moving up. I know how a one-night stand works. 
I don't think you know how a fling works. Her eyebrows hit her hairline. You want to be upgraded to a fling? She thought back to last night. It had been hot and fast, cold and emotionless. She might be willing to upgrade him to a fling, might be willing to use him to warm her sheets. He said, not right now. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. She'd been there. She knew. First, tell me why you went to prison. For killing a woman and her child. For killing my woman and my child. Cassandra's breath rushed out. She looked at the scar on his cheek, felt the fear dance in her belly. He probably weighed a good hundred pounds more than her, and she knew that if he turned out to be some psycho, she was toast. She scooted off her bar stool, walking around the kitchen counter and pulling a glass out of the cupboard. She filled it with water, all the while getting closer to the knives. If he tried, he would take her, but she'd make him suffer for it. She took a long drink, watching him over the rim, and finally asking, how? He'd been watching her through slitted eyes, his head still leaning against the back of the couch, but at that, he closed his eyes completely. I was drunk and high, driving too fast. I flipped the car and killed them both. She didn't say anything, just traced the scar on his cheek with her eyes and remembered what he'd said yesterday. We make our own tragedies. And last night, when she'd asked, he'd had no alcohol in his suite, wouldn't order any up. He said, don't think that because I didn't mean to that it makes me any less of a killer. Cassandra said, and it wasn't a question, you don't drink anymore. He shook his head, and she said, no one drives away from your hotel drunk. No one. How do you stop them? He opened his eyes, and Cassandra thought, stupid question. He could stop a bull in a china shop. He said, I either sit them down at the bar and pour more liquor down their throat until their wallet is empty or the cab has arrived, or I take them upstairs and fuck them until they're sober. A little tingle made her want to fidget. She took another drink of water instead. And do you upgrade all of those sobering fucks to flings? You'll be the first. Cassandra snorted. And how many of them believe that? So far, none of them. She wanted to laugh, damn it. She wanted to take him back to her bedroom and stop all this talking. So why me? I'm sure there are lots of women leaving your hotel drunk enough to believe their car is in your penthouse. She narrowed her eyes. Maybe lots of men, too. Not reliably enough. She waited. Waited for him to say one way or the other whether he was a bird slumming with the fishies. She didn't care, really. She just couldn't handle it now. He didn't answer her question, just said, Shane. And Cassandra's stomach clenched. He said, It's not my name, though I answered to it a few times last night. Cassandra thought about blushing, thought about being embarrassed, but decided she didn't care. She didn't care what he thought. She didn't care that she was pathetic. I alternate between Shane and Ethan, I'm just warning you, in case I take you up on the fling. Who's Ethan? He didn't ask who Shane was, and Cassandra wondered what else she'd told him last night. She hadn't thought she was that drunk. My other best friend's husband. She won't send naked pictures, so I have to project. She looked at the brooding Hulk sitting on her couch and said, You're nothing like him. I probably won't call you Ethan. That's good. I'm easily confused. He didn't look like he was easily confused. He looked sharp and dangerous, and Cassandra wondered why he'd followed her. Last night had been, maybe not fun, but it had been just what she'd needed. He might be just what she needed, and she knew suddenly why he'd followed her, knew why he was sitting on her couch. Because she understood. She'd known that a part of him had died, had known before he'd told her that he'd killed his wife and child, that whatever he was looking for, he would never find. Cassandra knew what it meant to live like that, how to get up in the morning, 
hopeless, how to make do with second best. She loved hopelessly. She could never have what she wanted most in life. She couldn't have Shane, couldn't be what he needed, couldn't have his children and his name. The man sitting on her couch would never have what he needed either, would never find forgiveness for his sins. She put her glass down, rounding the kitchen counter and stopping to stand in front of him. She turned her back to him, indicating her zipper. I need a shower. You may join me. He scooted to the edge of the couch and pulled the zipper down slowly. He murmured, so magnanimous. Yesterday you got lucky. Today is a tryout. If you please me, Shane, I'll think about your upgrade request. He pushed himself off the couch, following her. Cassandra Elaine Spencer, don't you want to know my name? She didn't, not particularly. Why? You answer to Shane. When they entered the bedroom, his eyes met hers in the full-length mirror. He was big and dark, brooding. He was dressed head to toe in rich black, and his mouth looked like it only smiled when he had you cornered in a dark alley. He was nothing like Shane. But he only said, Hope you have a big shower, your majesty. And Cassandra thought she'd probably grant his request. He was big. He was distracting. He just might be funny. He might be just what she needed. Carlton Brady Roberts IV left Cassandra drowsing in her bed and headed back to work. Seven days a week, sometimes 24 hours a day. He lived and breathed his work. Early morning conference calls with New York, late nights tracking Asia. He took his sleep when he could get it, living in the penthouse and rarely making it back home. He'd find a couple hours this afternoon to sleep and let himself feel that sweet oblivion of nothing so tired that he wouldn't even dream. Despite what he'd told Cassandra, he only occasionally invited someone up to spend some energy on. He chose carefully, and not very often, because that smacked of hedonistic pleasure when he deserved none. But he'd seen Cassandra sitting at the bar, in that ugly bridesmaid dress, her short brown hair curling as much as the length would let it, her tears leaking down her cheek, had seen her looking for a distraction and finding none in that happy crowd. And then she'd tried to drive away from his hotel drunk. He still hadn't been thinking of taking her up to his penthouse when he'd made sure the valet was calling her a cab. His staff was well-trained, but the day staff wasn't as familiar with spotting drivers who shouldn't be driving. And when she'd turned, Brady had seen in her eyes that it was an old wound, recently reopened that it was something that would never get any better, and she'd accepted that. Just sometimes it struck hard enough to make her bleed. Brady knew all about that. He went about his life because he couldn't do anything else. He'd killed those he loved most in this world. There would be no forgiveness for him. He'd served his time. Six years was what the state had demanded for the death of his family. And then he'd been let out early because of good behavior and prison crowding, and because of his money. Money bought second chances, even when you didn't want them. At the hotel, Brady gave his car to the valet, nodding when he saw it was Rodrigo, and deciding to go find a little sleep now. Rodrigo could spot drunk or high ten yards away. Efe, you get your lady friend taken care of? Brady raised an eyebrow, and Rodrigo said, You spend the night occupied and then chase after her in the morning. There's going to be talk. What's the talk? Just the usual. Hefe's going to be in a good mood. Go ask him for that raise now. Brady almost smiled. Rodrigo said, Hefe's not going to be able to walk. Bring him some ice. And then ask him for a raise. I don't need ice. And I'm not in that good of a mood. Man. Rodrigo peeled away. And Brady let him go. The only time his little Z got any action was when Rodrigo got behind the wheel. It took Brady an hour to get up to the penthouse, putting out fires and returning calls as he made his way. And then he sat down in his chair, listening to the quiet. So quiet. And when he slept, it was dreamless. 
Late Sunday morning, Brady was told a woman was looking for him in the bar. When he went to see who it was, he recognized the back of Cassandra even without her purple dress. Her short brown hair was spiked instead of curled, and she wore three sets of silver hooped earrings on each ear. He sat down next to her, shaking his head at the bartender as he started over. Miss Spencer, I heard you were looking for me. Strange, since you don't know my name. I guess I didn't need to know it. You got my message. Hmm. And who did you ask for? Cassandra took a sip of her bubbly brown drink. I said I was looking for a big, surly-looking guy who liked to wear black and walked around like he owned the place. Brady didn't look down at his black suit. He said, I do own the place. She grimaced and let out a long sigh. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. I didn't think I'd ever say this, but money complicates things. I didn't think I'd ever say this, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't? You don't think I'm sniffing around you because of your money? He choked. No, I know what it is you're sniffing around. She started smiling, covering it with another long drink, and then offering it to him. Would you like to join me? It's just Coke and ice, in case I have to drive home. She turned to him, meeting his eyes. He said, you don't have to drive home yet. You're not too busy? I am. Give me a few minutes and I won't be. He stood, and she said, I'll be waiting for you right here, Shane. She waved the bartender over. Let's put a little rum in this Coke. Brady chuckled under his breath, not missing the startled looks he got from passing staff. He hardly ever chuckled, and he never chuckled when he was coming from the bar. But he was in a good mood. He'd finish up what had to be done, and then take Cassandra Spencer upstairs and let her call him Shane. Because Brady Roberts was looking forward to being someone else for a little while. Brady woke when Cassandra climbed out of the bed, his eyes flying open, his fingers reaching. He sat up in surprise when he felt soft sheets and realized he was sleeping on the bed. He rubbed his face. Sorry, did I wake you? No, I just need to use the bathroom. He was still sitting up when she came back out, and he said, I didn't mean to fall asleep. She climbed back in the bed, patting his arm. It's okay. It's not like you fell asleep before we were done. And I didn't wake you? She shook her head. You were pretty dead. I didn't think you'd wake up if I took care of some business. I didn't. He took a deep breath, shaking his head. He didn't sleep in beds. He slept too soundly, dreamed too deeply, screamed too loudly. Brady looked over at the armchair that was his normal resting place then slowly lay back down. Cassandra propped her elbow up, leaning against her hand. How often do we have to sleep together to be able to call this a fling? More than once a week. Do you think you could move your hotel closer to my house? He smiled, then stopped. He said, I'll see what I can do. Until you get that figured out, maybe we can alternate locations. My place next? Brady nodded his head reaching for his phone and searching his calendar. She watched him quietly for a minute, then said, Oh, God, never mind. You just killed the mood permanently. I'll never get that image out of my head. The image of me looking at my calendar? Yeah. What are you going to write in there? Nookie, three o'clock? I was just going to write Cassandra's. It's the writing it down at all that's the problem. It's so horribly boring. We're scheduling our fling? He mimicked what she'd said last week. Today you got lucky. I rarely have time for unscheduled activities unless it's a burning issue. Cassandra pinched her lips together, and he said, Wednesday night? She grimaced, then sighed loudly. Fine, maybe I'll be able to get the mood back by then, but we are going to work on your spontaneity. We've gotten spontaneous three times now. She eyed him. Well, technically it was more times than that. Brady bit his cheek to keep from smiling, 
and blocked off Wednesday night. He put the phone back on the nightstand before he could check the 13 new messages he'd missed. He looked at Cassandra and said, just let me know when you're ready. She raised an eyebrow in question, and he said, for my name. Cassandra stared at him long and hard, then said, I know your name. Since when? Since I tried to get a message to you, your staff politely informed me that the person I was looking for was a Mr. Tightass. He barked out a laugh, making both himself and Cassandra jump. She grinned at him. Don't do that a lot, do you? He shook his head. He did that never. Remind me to fire whoever said that. I'm pretty sure it was all of them. Who's going to be left to run your hotel if you fire all of them? I'm pretty sure it was only one of them, and I'm not ready to fire you yet. She laughed, rolling onto her back and pulling the sheet with her. You can't fire me. You're not paying me anything. Although, I am thinking of negotiating for pool privileges. Done. And now I can fire you. Aw, oh, man. I should have brought my bathing suit. I was sure you were going to say the pool was for guests only because you're such a tight ass about breaking laws. Only actual laws. And only laws that resulted in death when broken. Cassandra turned her head running her eyes down his uncovered body. She wiggled under the sheet, and Brady forgot completely about those 13 messages waiting for him. She said, I'm ready now. Brady shook his head, trying to bring his mind back to their conversation. He opened his mouth to tell her his name, and she poked him. No, I'm ready, Shane. Oh, have you forgiven me for that scheduling fiasco already? He rolled toward her, sliding under the sheet and glancing at his watch. We'll have to be quick. Okay, just whatever you do, don't check your calendar. She scooted closer, her legs tangling with his, her arms sliding around him. There's no calendar for a good 30 minutes, Cass. She froze, then whispered, don't call me that. Brady stopped, pulling back to look at her. Too real? She nodded, her smiling mouth no longer smiling, her laughing eyes no longer laughing. He said, what should I call you? Cassandra took a shaky breath, then cracked a small smile. I liked your majesty. He let out a long put upon sigh and said, you would. She relaxed against him, the sparkle coming back into her eyes. You would, your majesty. Brady bent his head, taking her lips and whispering against them. And it wasn't your majesty. She laughed, and then they had a little fun with each other. Fun and not too real. Brady had gotten Cassandra out the door and down to the lobby in time for his next meeting. She'd sighed longingly when he asked if she was going to use the pool, then said, Next week. I'll bring my suit. Brady wondered if he'd ever take her to his home, let her have free reign over that pool. Then he shook his head. Of course he wouldn't take Cassandra to his home. His home was his wife's domain. He wouldn't take a piece of tail there and disrespect her memory. He made it back to his office, in time for the weekly meeting with his father and three brothers via video conference. They talked business, and that was it. Sometimes their wives and his sister sent Christmas cards. Sometimes his mother sent a photo of a niece or nephew, but Brady never responded. He knew, as did his brothers, that there was no point. His father, Carlton Brady Roberts III, had never forgiven his oldest son, would never forgive him, not for the embarrassment, not for the shame, not for the pain. The whole family had left L.A. when Brady had been convicted, because it didn't matter how good your attorney was when you insisted on pleading guilty. Brady considered himself lucky. When he got out, unlike most ex-cons, his job had been waiting for him. His family ashamed of him, but still family. It was all Brady would ask from them. The Roberts family owned hotels around the world, on every continent but Antarctica. But L.A. was where he stayed 
because his wife and son were here and they couldn't leave. He'd decided years ago that neither could he. Living in L.A. wasn't exactly a punishment, except for the traffic. And even that usually worked in his favor, since Brady always drove the speed limit. It was a daily reminder, a daily punishment, to own a car that was built for speed and never let it have its head. When the meeting finished, Brady signed out, calling down to get his car ready. In a few hours, Tokyo would wake and start the week. But he had until then to take his usual Sunday drive. These meetings with his family always reminded him of what he'd had, of what he'd thrown away. Brady didn't blame his father for writing off his oldest son. His father's legacy had died with Carlton Brady Roberts V. The child and the name and all it meant, gone forever. Brady accepted that, to his father, he died that day too. Not should have, but did. Brady had given up judging others years ago. Hard to have fun with it when your own fucked up life beat everyone else's. He'd come to the conclusion somewhere between the California state prison system and his penthouse suite that life was life. People were people. Life was a bitch, and people were crazy. And that was that. Outside, Rodrigo handed him the keys with a head nod and silence. Understanding these weekly drives, Brady's need for penance, like no one else could. Understanding what a man with blood on his hands had to do to keep the demons away. What it took to keep from becoming that man again. He was a drunk who didn't drink. He was a user who didn't use. Not a drop, not a snort, since that night. It would have been easier to lose himself in that, instead of constantly living with the battle. But he knew this was why he had been spared, to suffer. And maybe if he suffered enough in this life, he could find a modicum of mercy in the next. He would find, when he saw his wife and child again, that there was not hate in their eyes, but love. Not cold justice, but forgiveness. The morning's traffic was lighter than usual, and drivers flipped Brady off as they tore around him. But he stayed exactly at 45 miles per hour, cruising past again and again. No little white cross marked the spot. No flowers. But here, where the road turned slightly, was where his wife had died, instantly. Here, his son had fought to stay alive and lost. Here, his child had screamed with pain, the last memory Brady had of his son. Here, Brady had killed his soul. Chapter Two Tokyo woke, and Brady was still driving. The sun set, and Brady was still driving. He finally turned off the memory-filled road, but kept on driving. When he pulled in front of Cassandra's house, he left the engine running and gripped the steering wheel. Cassandra opened the front door, and Brady looked at her through the car window. He finally turned off the car and slowly got out. She said, well, this is spontaneous. He looked at her, silent, not wanting the pain to stop, but here anyway. Not deserving any kind of relief, but here anyway. She cocked her head and said, are you going to come inside, Shane? Brady shook with his fear, afraid that he'd found something that eased his suffering. Afraid that he'd found something worse than alcohol, worse than drugs, something that he just didn't have the strength to fight. It wasn't the sex. It was the being someone else. It was being someone who was loved so completely that no wound could ever stop it. He said, could you ever stop loving Shane? She blinked. No. No matter what he did, no matter what he's done. She looked at him, and Brady whispered, no matter what he did. She crossed her arms, belligerent and unrepentant. I will love him until the flesh is stripped from my bones. I would love him no matter who I had to share him with. I love him no matter what. Brady didn't see his wife when he looked at Cassandra. His wife had been sweet, kind. She'd had long blonde hair and blue eyes and a smiling mouth. Cassandra had a sarcastic mouth, 
Her hair was brown and chopped short, her eyes gray and worldly. But when she called him Shane, he saw in her eyes love. Love that lasted through the pain. Love that Brady had seen in his wife's eyes. And when Cassandra called him Shane, Brady could believe that his wife still loved him, through the pain, no matter what he'd done. He said, I'd like to come inside. As Shane or as Brady? Cassandra did know his name after all, but he didn't hesitate. Shane. She turned, walking back inside and leaving the door open for him, and he followed. Of course, Cassandra had Googled him. His polite staff had told her she was looking for Mr. Roberts, and it hadn't been hard to connect him to his hotel. Carlton Brady Roberts IV. It was a lot to stomach, but she'd remembered his bulging body and decided to forgive him. He hadn't picked the name. He'd obviously worked for the body, had paid for that scar running down his face. She'd found the news of the car accident, where his wife and son had died, had found his arrest photo, had even found his marriage announcement, young and happy. We were all young and happy once. Cassandra thought she probably wouldn't have liked him when he was young and happy. He looked like he'd been a douche. She looked at him, sleeping on the bed next to her, and thought that some people were just more interesting, a little more tolerable, with a little tragedy behind them. He sighed, his fingers twitching, and Cassandra wondered if she was supposed to wake him. Surely he had things to do, meetings and other important stuff. But she let him sleep, and when her alarm woke them in the morning, he jumped out of bed, looking around wildly. He stopped when he saw Cassandra. He said, what the hell time is it? Seven? In the morning? Shit. Cassandra rolled out of bed. Don't you have an alarm on that fancy phone of yours? He grabbed for his phone, groaning as he thumbed through his missed calls. I've never needed to use it. When did I fall asleep? He stopped looking at his phone to watch her pull her underwear out of a drawer and put it on. Around midnight? Seven hours? I haven't slept seven hours since... never. I must have worn you out. She grinned at him over her shoulder, and he looked so confused, so surprised, that she walked over to him and wrapped her arms around him. She said, you're welcome. I've missed hours of work. You're welcome. He let out a breath of air, laughing and not laughing at the same time. She said, don't you feel relaxed and well rested? Maybe you'll get twice as much done today. Hmm. He looked down at smooth skin, ending in tiny little panties, and started walking her toward the bed. Maybe you're right, and my staff is well trained. One more hour won't hurt. She shook her head. I have exactly one hour to get out the door so I'm not late for work. No minutes to spare. He grumbled, but let her go. Cassandra said, are you still coming over Wednesday night? He grabbed his pants, the silence lengthening as he thought about it, and thought about it. She said, just set your alarm. He nodded slowly. It probably won't happen again, anyway. That's the spirit. He chuckled, then sprinted for her one bathroom before she could go in. He blocked the door. If we're not going to get physical, I don't have an hour to spare. I'll only be a minute. She huffed as he shut the door in her face. She'd remember this about him. But when he came back out less than two minutes later, she decided maybe he'd been right to jump ahead. She would be more than a minute. Shower, hair, makeup. 45 minutes of her hour was taken with grooming. Some days she wished she was a man. Actually, lots of days she wished she was a man. Cassandra looked at Brady's damp hair. Did you use my brush? Your comb. She narrowed her eyes. Did you use my toothbrush? He held up his finger. Your toothpaste. You know, you're kind of bouncy when you've had a full night's sleep. His eyebrows pulled together, and he sat back on his heels. She said, bring a kit with you on Wednesday so you don't have to brush your teeth with your finger. He nodded and squeezed her arm. I will. Cassandra locked the door behind him, 
and thought she'd have to set her alarm a little earlier if he was going to be sleeping over. Maybe a lot earlier, and she could get the full benefit of having a steady fling staying over the occasional evening. And then she raced to the bathroom and tried to make up for those lost few minutes. Shane's car was parked in her driveway when she got home from work. She pulled in behind him and sat, wondering just how she was going to react. Angry? Sad? Happy for him? He opened her front door, and Cassandra got out of the car, just looking at him. Sandy blonde hair and bright blue eyes that were normally happy, and today were not. He ran to her, squeezing her. Cass, I'm sorry, so, so sorry. I'm the worst friend ever in the world. She squeezed him back. Yeah, I was about ready to cancel your membership. It's been a week. It had been one week, two days, and four hours. But who was counting? He pulled back. I've brought dinner to make up for it. Mushu and margaritas. And your pretty little bird? He shook his head. Just us tonight. Shane took her hand, leading her inside the house. And Cassandra said, that was wise? He nodded. You can get it all out of your system, so when you meet him, you'll fall in love with him too. That seemed highly unlikely. He said, but first, tell me what happened after the worst friend in the world left you alone to the tender mercy of your family. It felt like a lifetime ago. Cassandra recapped. I got drunk. I tried to leave. I detoured to a night in the penthouse. Shane stopped, turning. Penthouse, as in dear penthouse? Just about. He's big, he's tailored, and he has a scar. Shane sighed. Lucky. Actually, she thought it really might have been. He narrowed his eyes and flung his hand toward the bedroom. Wait, is that why your sheets are all rumpled? Penthouse was here last night? She dropped her keys on the counter and said smugly, I've been keeping myself busy. He laughed, pulling food containers out of a bag, and Cassandra got two big glasses for the margaritas. Cassandra poured and said, So, tell me his name. Shane turned to her, radiant, in love. His name is Christian, and when I accidentally reached for his drink, he said, these aren't the drinks you're looking for. Cassandra paused. Star Wars? Star Wars. Cassandra laughed. Shane said, he quotes Star Wars, he plays video games, he makes video games. He's a geek? Shane sniffed. Maybe. He's wholesome. Cassandra breathed in. Wholesome. She knew the terrible lure of wholesome. Mackenzie had fallen for wholesome too. Hell, Cassandra had fallen for it. If she hadn't loved Mackenzie like a sister, she would have stabbed her for a chance at Ethan O'Connor. Even then, Cassandra would have stabbed her if Cassandra had any kind of chance with him. Funny how wholesome could make you go all crazy. She said, does he even know he's gay? He knows, he just doesn't like it. He's a good Mormon boy. Cassandra blinked turning toward Shane. You fell in love with a good Mormon boy? I know, what the hell. And what's even worse is his fashion sense. Ugh, you should see it. Plaid, short-sleeved, button-up shirt, white undershirt peeking out at the neck, cargo pants. It's like he's standing out on the corner waving and shouting, I'm from Utah. At least he quotes Star Wars. He sighed. We role-played. She shook her head. I don't even want to know what that means. A role-playing game, like Dungeons and Dragons. You'll love it. We'll bring it over one night. Cassandra took a long drink, thinking she'd rather jab a fork in her eye. But she didn't say that to Shane. Just sat down on a bar stool and dug into her mushu. Shane said, do you think it just happens like that? Boom, you're in love? He pointed his finger at her. And I'm not talking about lust, because we both know that happens. But love? Real love? Forever love? Stand together no matter what love? 
Cassandra looked up at him and said, yes. Shane sat next to her, pulling his plate toward him, then just stopping. He stared into his food and said, forgive me? For what? Leaving me to my family or for not loving me? His eyes filled with tears. I do love you. I love you as much as my poor little heart will let me. I know. And she did. Cassandra said, I really hope I like Christian. Shane said seriously, me too. And I forgive you. He whispered, for what? For both. Shane put his arm around her shoulder, and she snuggled into his side, and knew she had as much of him as he could give, and it was enough. He said, now, tell me more about Penthouse. Cassandra smiled. Oh, him? You're going to like. Cassandra was out watering the flowers when Brady, Shane, uh, Brady drove up Wednesday night. She waved him in behind her car and tried to pay attention to the flowers instead of his sporty little car. It wasn't easy. First of all, they weren't her flowers, they were Shane's. He lived in an apartment and gardened at her house. Best of both worlds, he said, and Cassandra watered them when they looked droopy so Shane wouldn't yell at her. And second of all, Brady's car was a Nissan Z, and it looked fast. Fast and small, and Cassandra didn't know how Brady fit inside it. He ducked his head to get out, and she watched him, forgetting the flowers, forgetting the car. She told Shane that Brady was a man who had been beautiful once, had been favored and adored, and now he wasn't. His scar and his eyes told the world that he'd lost everything. She said, I want to drive your car. You can, if that was a euphemism. She laughed. It wasn't. He stepped into her space, and she looked up into his face, his dark eyes close, his hot body warming hers. She pointed the hose away from his shoes. Did you bring me dinner? I did, if that was a euphemism. He smiled, his lips spreading across his face, his eyes wrinkling. Cassandra forgot where she was for a minute, surprised by how it transformed his face. She shook her head. She was on a mission and wouldn't be distracted by how close he was or that it would only take a minute to get to her bed. Then let's go get dinner. We'll take your car. He let out a long breath and pressed his body against hers. He smelled like a rich man and she closed her eyes, tried not to be seduced. She put her cheek on his and whispered, come on, let me take it up Mulholland Drive, zip around those curves like it was made to do. He opened his mouth, and she said, and yes, that was a euphemism. Are you going to drive the speed limit? She pursed her lips. What is a speed limit? His body clenched, and silence ticked between them. She wouldn't tiptoe around him, wouldn't pretend she didn't know what had happened to him, to his family. She knew one thing about living with hard truths. You brought them out into the light, acknowledged them, acknowledged that whatever it was, it bit the big one. Hiding wouldn't make it any better. Hiding only made it shameful. And shame was ugly. Shame destroyed. It destroyed all happiness, all life. It destroyed the future. It destroyed all hope. Cassandra opened her eyes and pulled back from him. I'm going to drive fast, and I know you're not going to like it. I also know that this thing we've got going on will end. And if I know anything about rich men, it will end sooner rather than later. I've driven you. I want to drive your car. He gave her the car keys. You can go without me. The Z likes to go fast. I don't. Cassandra laughed, closed her eyes, tipped her head to the rapidly darkening sky, and laughed. Brady, if I get in that car without you, I am never coming back. The next time you'll hear from me, I'll be in Argentina. She only briefly wondered if you could drive all the way to Argentina, then decided she could at least try. He said, Brady? 
You'll still be Shane in the bedroom, he said, as long as it's still in the bedroom. And he sounded completely serious, sad and serious. Rich man with a fast car who wants me to call him Shane. She patted his cheek. Maybe your money isn't going to complicate things. He grabbed her wrist. I don't think you know anything about money or rich men. I know that you never give a rich man what he wants, not until he's worked for it. She'd learned that from Mackenzie, who'd found her own rich man and wrapped him around her finger without even realizing she was doing it. Brady smiled slightly. It's not a bad philosophy, actually. Cassandra didn't want to wrap Brady around her finger. She knew this thing they had going on wouldn't last forever. She didn't want it to. But she didn't mind poking him a little. Maybe bring him back to life a little. She could do that for him. She could thank him for distracting her, for giving her a little bit of fun now when she needed it. She turned off the water, knowing Shane was going to be mad at her for drowning his flowers and not caring one bit. She jingled Brady's keys. Are you coming, or should I call from Argentina? He shoved his hands in his pockets and turned away from her to stare at his fast little car. It's not Argentina I object to. It's knowing you'll eat in the car on the way. She chuckled. It's a good bet I will. You'll have to go through me to do it. I can only go through you if you're there. He nodded, looking over his shoulder at her dirty, wet flip-flops. But change your shoes at least. She smiled, flinging the hose toward the house. I'll give you that one. You don't even have to work for it. Cassandra parked in a pullout near the top of Mulholland Drive and looked out over the city. The lights twinkled, the city sprawled before her, the freeways curving snake-like along the valley. So many people, so much hurt and misery. It was easy to remember sitting here that she was only one in seven billion. Insignificant, really, her hurts, her misery, insignificant. She looked over at Brady, his hand still squeezing the door handle. He looked a little green, and Cassandra didn't know if that was from her driving or from the winding road. When he opened his eyes, she was still watching him. He swallowed and said, you are not driving back. She smiled at him. My plan was to distract you with a little hanky-panky when we got up here, but I can see that isn't going to work. This car is too small. He cracked his window and took deep, gulping breaths. He said, I thought we were going to go over the side a few times. Didn't you want to? He stopped breathing. He didn't look at her. He didn't have to because Cassandra already knew his answer. He did want to go over the side, and he didn't. She knew how that felt. She looked back toward the lights and just sat with him. She said, I don't know why those who get what everyone deserves always feel guilty about it. I deserve my guilt. You do. You deserve your guilt for hurting those you love. You deserve it for taking their life from them. But you think I should forgive myself anyway. Cassandra said, never. He turned to her in shock, and Cassandra said, you can't undo it. You can't make amends. You will never be forgiven. Some things just won't ever be. Then what the hell are we talking about? You don't deserve the guilt you feel for surviving, for living when they can't. There's no forgiveness, Brady. You're never going to find it. But maybe you can find life again. He pushed his door open, jumping out of the car. He slammed his palm onto the hood of the car and shouted, you don't know what you're talking about. Cassandra jumped, her heart thumping. Smooth move, x -Lax. Bring a man who can bench press a small elephant to a secluded area and piss him off. She got out of the car slowly and faced him. She kept the car between them and said, the man I love fell in love with someone else and he feels guilty about it. Guilty when he got something everyone deserves, to love, to be loved in return. I don't give a flying fuck about Shane. 
You're alive, Brady. You deserve that. To live. To spend as much time as you get driving your fast car fast. To sleep in a bed. He jerked. Cassandra shook her head. He'd woken up next to her twice now, and both times he'd stared at the bed like it was a sleeping dragon, like he couldn't believe he'd slept on it. She said, you're searching for forgiveness when it will never come. Maybe you should start looking for something else. You mean like loving someone who can't love me back? You're right, that sounds better. I'll start looking for that. She looked up and could almost make out a star if she squinted. I can't help who I love. You can't help who you killed. We can still live. Brady stared at her, his stomach heaving. No forgiveness, ever. And he knew she was right. He would never forgive himself. He'd made peace with that. But he didn't deserve to live, either. Cassandra was wrong about that. Didn't deserve to find pleasure in simple things. Couldn't sleep in a bed. Except when he was sleeping next to Cassandra, apparently. He didn't know why, except there was something so peaceful about her fatalistic view of the world. She saw how hard it was, how horrible, and then somehow moved past that. He knew, without even asking, what her motto in life was. Life's a bitch, what's next? What's next? Brady didn't have a next. His wife had been an angel. Not perfect, of course. They'd had their share of problems, most of them coming from him. But she'd been an angel, forgiving him, loving him. Without her, he was lost. He didn't yell at Cassandra again. My wife was an angel. I don't know why she was taken when I wasn't. And I don't deserve to live when she can't. Why did she marry you? He pinched his brows together. What? Cassandra waved her hand in the air and rolled her eyes. Anybody dies, all of a sudden they were a saint. I'm sorry she died. I'm sorry she left you here to suffer alone. And I'm sorry that you killed her. But I doubt that she was a saint or an angel because you aren't. And no angel could handle you. She couldn't handle me. But she loved me anyway. Cassandra squeezed her lips together, smiling at him. That's nice. That must have been very nice. It had been. And even if my wife hadn't been an angel, my son was. How old was he? Brady paused, swallowing the lump in his throat before saying, four. He cleared his throat. He was four, and he loved garbage trucks and swimming in the pool and getting thrown up into the air. A car drove up the hill, slowing as if to turn in, then speeding off again. Probably teenagers looking for some place deserted, to have some fun, drink some pilfered beer, to live. Brady watched the taillights disappear and said, I thought that as my nephews got older, that it would hurt more to see what he could have been. But it doesn't work that way. He'll always be four. When he looked at Cassandra, there were tears in her eyes, and he rounded the car. Do you really think someone like me deserves life? She nodded, the tears still swimming, and she sniffed. He kissed her, not as punishment, not as a distraction. He kissed her because he wanted to. He kissed her because she wasn't an angel. She'd never forgive him like his wife had, never look at him when he was Brady, like she looked at him when he was Shane. But she could handle him. She could handle what he'd done. She could handle what he'd always be. He said softly, what's next? She jumped, wrapping her legs around his waist, and he caught her. She said, I'm going to drive down this hill and see if I can make you toss your cookies. Then we'll go back to my place and you'll fall asleep in my bed and wake up wondering what the hell just happened. He huffed. That was exactly what he felt like when he woke up. And then? What are you looking for, Brady? She'd said he was looking for forgiveness, but that wasn't it. He hadn't really thought he was looking for anything. But now, he thought he might like a little bit of peace. He didn't deserve it, 
he never would. But maybe he could have it anyway. He said, When you get tired of pretending I'm Shane, what then? You mean, when you get tired of driving all over for a little rest and relaxation, when all you have to do is go down to your bar? I don't mind driving all over when I'm the one behind the wheel. It's you who will never be driving my car again. He rested her against the car, her legs tight around his waist, his hands circling her thighs. He stroked his thumbs up the inside of her jeans. She shivered. Then we'll say goodbye, and you'll find some other drunk girl to take up to your penthouse. And I'll find someone else who has a fast car and doesn't mind if I call him Shane. He moved his hips between her thighs, a slight pulse that rocked her and the car. I don't mind when you call me Shane. How important is a fast car? She cocked her head. I'm thinking. He pulsed again. Are you? Her hands curled and her lashes fluttered closed. She murmured, I'm thinking about thinking. I'm thinking how I'm going to get your pants off. I'm thinking about leaving all the thinking to you. You seem to have it covered. Good. He popped the button on her jeans. She opened her eyes a crack. If you're going to do all the thinking, you'll have to tell me what's next. He slid his hands under her bottom and boosted her up his chest. A small shriek flew from her mouth and her hands grabbed at his hair. He sat her on the roof of the car and rested his hand on her chest. He said, here's what's next. Chapter Three Brady pushed at Cassandra until she let go of his hair and lay back on her elbows. She pulled her zipper down and yanked at her jeans. She said, okay, I could like this. She looked over to where the hill dropped off and the city spread out below them. Maybe. He climbed onto the car, leaning over her. She flung her arms out wide, grabbing at the car. Is this roof going to hold the both of us? He said, I don't like it. Yeah, I'm heading in that direction, she said, and he snorted. I don't like Sundays and Wednesdays. I want every night. For as long as this thing lasts, I want every night. That would be flattering if you didn't want every night so you can be comatose for seven hours. He was already addicted to sleeping next to her. To sleeping. He'd been yawning since Sunday. He hadn't slept in six years, only taking an hour here, an hour there. One night of sleep and he couldn't function anymore. Cassandra said, maybe it's not me. Maybe any woman in your bed would do. He shook his head. He'd had other women. It was her. She said, just how many sluts have you taken upstairs lately? He ran a finger along her arm. Only one. She murmured, I feel like I should get mad, but I'm leaving a butt print on the roof of your car. Sounds slutty to me too. Brady slid his zipper down, and Cassandra said, I swear, I hate men. I'm here breezing in the wind, and all you have to do is pull down your zipper. There are women who hate men. You're not one of them. He flicked her nipple with his thumb, making it pucker, and she said, Oh, I'm starting to hate you. Her head tipped off the edge of the roof, her throat open and exposed. She muttered, I hope to God I set the parking brake. And Brady licked her neck. He looked past her, down the hill, and he whispered, Don't you want to? She peeled one hand off the car to grab at him. Only sometimes, and not today. Her breath rushed out, and Brady thought he didn't really want to today either. He said, You'll move into the penthouse. She squeezed her legs tight around him, trapping him. What? I'm tired of driving all over the place for a good night's sleep, when all I have to do is move you in. She blinked. He stretched out on top of her and said, Pool privileges are included. You want me to drive out there every night? He nodded. 
I want you to move in. It's in Brentwood. It's an extra hour of driving, both ways. I don't have two hours a day to give you, Brady. Brady. He paused, sad for a moment that he wasn't Shane anymore, then deciding it might be okay to be Brady again. He had to be Brady again. He said, twice a week is not enough, not nearly enough. Are we still talking about sleeping? No. She smirked. And who says it's only twice a week? He bit her jaw gently. Only me. She wiggled against him. Why? Give me one good reason. I've given you one good reason over and over again. She closed her eyes, letting her head fall back. He said, only me or Shane. Cassandra's eyes popped back open, and she raised her eyebrows. He said, I don't think he's going to switch teams. Just thought I could give you something in return for the long drive you're going to be doing from now on. You don't think he's going to switch teams? You haven't even met him. You seem pretty sure you'll never have him. But just in case he changes his mind, I give you my blessing. But only him. In case he changes his mind? She laughed again and again until Brady said, You can take my car. That'll make the drive a little more fun. Wait, wait, wait. Your car? You can drive my car when I'm not in it. Cassandra said, yes. When they'd both stopped breathing fast, Cassandra murmured, now that the excitement has faded, I'm realizing that this is extremely uncomfortable. Brady pushed himself off her, climbing off the car and noting that his knees weren't too happy with him. He grabbed her jeans, shaking them out and throwing them up to her. She scooted to the edge of the roof, and he helped her down. She pulled her jeans up and said, well, cross that off the list. Don't need to do it again. Let's just cross all of Mulholland off the list. We don't need to come back up here. She smiled, then sighed. It's not going to work, Brady. This, us, it's just for fun, just a little distraction. You already said yes. I wasn't saying yes to you. It was more of a, I'll have what she's having, yes. You were saying yes to the car. She grinned. Might have gotten a little carried away thinking about zipping along in your car. But there's the big problem of Argentina, remember? If I get in your car without you, I'm not coming back. You will. I won't. I won't come back. I won't stop. She nodded her head. Except for the occasional messy burrito and the more frequent speeding tickets. Is Shane going to go with you? She'd been happy and playful, but she froze when he said that. He said, I have no one. You have half of someone. Half of him plus half of me equals as close as you're going to get. And you? What are you going to do with only half of me? He smiled at the top of his car. I'll make do. He smiled at her. When she didn't smile back, he said, half of you is twice as much as I deserve. You really want this? He nodded. He did. Peace had turned out to be impossible to fight. She crossed her arms and leaned against the hood, staring out at the city. If I do this, I want it to be clear that I'm only using you. Your money. Your body. My car. She looked at him and nodded. When he nodded back, she pushed herself off the car, opening the driver's side door and saying, are you going to pay for the speeding tickets? No, but I'll pay for the gas. When Brady woke the next morning in Cassandra's bed, her alarm blaring loud enough to wake the neighbors, he stared at the ceiling, ran his hands along the sheets. Seven hours, again, no dreams, no screaming. He turned his head and found Cassandra watching him. Six years. Six years of wishing he'd died too. Six years of trying to punish himself. Six years of reliving that one moment that had changed everything. He didn't remember the accident, not during the day. But at night, he dreamed. 
and he didn't know if it was real or if it was a story his subconscious had made. Because a man couldn't destroy his whole world and not remember it. He pushed the sheet off, and Cassandra said, I'm never getting rid of you, am I? He stopped, poking his internal wounds. They were still there, he could feel it. But it hurt a little less, as if it was finally healing. No longer raw, no longer infected. He didn't know why he'd been given this reprieve. All he knew was that he would grab it with both hands. He denied himself the oblivion of alcohol, the flying freedom of coke. But this he couldn't fight, because it didn't feel wrong. It felt not like forgiveness, but acceptance. It felt like what was next. He said, it might come back. Cassandra said, I'm not that lucky. Brady blinked, then couldn't help it as his lips tipped up. His smile grew and hers answered until they were both lying there grinning at each other. He said, neither am I. She rolled toward him. What are you talking about? You get all this. She waved her hand down her body. And all it's going to cost you is your car. He laughed. The first time in six years he didn't try and stop it. And then he did it again. You're right. That is pretty lucky. And then they both got lucky. Shane had given Christian a few days to himself, to miss what he'd found, to see what he wanted to give up, because Christian didn't want Shane or his love. Shane already knew, and was trying to give Christian time to figure out that you can't fight yourself, that you can't be anybody but yourself. Shane had been lucky. His mother hadn't cared one jot that her son was gay, and if his father had cared, he'd hidden it well before he'd passed on. But Shane thought that the man had loved his son, had loved everything that made him Shane, and wouldn't have changed anything about him. Shane had had unconditional acceptance and love since the moment of his birth, had never been made to feel that something was wrong with him. Shane would give that to Christian. He would love everything about him, love that he was careful and cautious, love the daily struggle that had made him who he was, and he would give Christian as much time as he could. It was just Shane Wilder wasn't a very patient man. Christian opened his door, his hazel eyes cautious, and his brown hair brown, and said, you were going to give me a week. I know, two days was all I could last. I froze my car keys in the ice tray last night, which was why you got a third night. Christian smiled, like he knew he shouldn't give Shane any encouragement, but just couldn't help it. Shane said, I want you to meet my friends, brunch with Kenny and Tom, and then we'll swing by and say hello to Cass, see if dear Penthouse is there, because her exact words were, he's big, he's tailored, and he has a scar. Christian sighed, Shane. Shane sighed, Christian. I would love to meet your friends. I would love to be one of those friends, but you want more than that. Shane nodded. He wasn't going to lie about it. I do, and so do you. You just won't let yourself. He grabbed Christian's hand, holding on even though it was tense, even though Christian jerked. So, I'll take friends, for now. Christian pulled at his hand. And this is being friends? Yes, I hold Cass's hand. This is different. It was different, and it wasn't because their attraction was one-sided, either. But Christian couldn't say it, couldn't say that he was attracted to Shane. Come meet my friends, Chris. Resistance is futile. And there was that pinched smile again on Christian's face. Like he thought Shane was wonderful and fun, he just didn't think he should think it. Should, should, should. Oh, how Shane hated should. Shane wondered just who came up with all these shoulds. Shane stayed silent, hard though it was, and let Christian fight himself. Christian finally said, don't think that you can quote Star Trek at me and get me to do whatever you want. Shane sighed theatrically, 
and tugged Christian out the door. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Christian's smile was a little bigger, the pinch a little smaller, and Shane said, I know, you prefer Star Wars. When they got to the car, Shane let go of Christian's hand, and it wasn't his imagination that the contact lingered. The reluctance to let go wasn't one-sided. Shane decided he wasn't beating his head against a door that would never open. He was just beating his head against a door that might not ever open. Kenny and Tom were already at brunch, sitting down side by side. They'd been married for years, years before it had been legal for them to be, and they'd been one of the first couples in California to tie the knot when the state had granted them the privilege the first time around. They'd cried for the other couples who had missed their chance when it had been taken back, and cheered yet again when the Supreme Court upheld the decision that Proposition 8 was unconstitutional. Kenny always said it was necessary to be a lawyer if you were gay today, so you could understand what was going on, or married to one, or finally married to one. Shane bent to kiss their cheeks. Kenny, like he'd rather be in Hawaii, his brightly colored shirt sporting parrots. Tom in his double-breasted suit, even on a Sunday. Tom patted his mouth tidily and peered at Christian. And who is this? I was preparing myself for Cassandra's sarcastic comments. Kenny chortled. You mean coming up with your own, but put them away for now because this looks like a nice young man. Shane held a chair out for Christian, and he was not the only one at the table who noticed the pause before Christian took it. This is Christian, and he is a nice young man, from Utah. Kenny's eyes flicked down to Christian's plaid shirt. Utah, Tom said. A sad business there right now. Christian said, I do think most people were surprised when gay marriage became legal, I would have sworn it would be the last state to extend marriage to same-sex couples. Tom agreed. They passed a law to prohibit it. Kenny said, but it is exactly what happened in California. It shouldn't be too long before it is legal again. It took five years to make its way through the courts for California. I doubt it will happen any faster for Utah. Kenny sipped his cappuccino and slipped his hand into Tom's. Five long years, but for a moment, all things were possible, and some couples were able to take advantage. He sighed. When we heard the news, I was so excited, but Tom said to wait and watch. I detest when he is right. Tom smiled slightly. My dear, it happened so infrequently, one would think you could just muddle through until I was wrong again. Kenny raised an eyebrow at Shane and Christian. One would think. He waved his hand in the air in front of him. But enough of that. We are in California, where the birds are chirping, the smog is choking, and young lovebirds can sit stiffly next to each other. Just where did the two of you meet? Shane nearly groaned as the strawberry-covered waffles were placed in front of him. The whipped cream leaned precariously. The nuts covered it liberally. He said, at a wedding reception, and then filled his mouth with a large bite. Kenny grimaced at him, then said, not Cassandra's wedding reception, I hope. Shane closed his eyes, partly to enjoy the waffle, partly in shame. He swallowed and hung his head. Yes, I left her there, with her family, in purple. Kenny shook his head. Gasp, she will never forgive you. Tom said, of course she'll forgive him. Despite her mouth, she has a heart that is big and resilient. And all she has to do is look at these two to know her sacrifice was worth it. Kenny and Shane exchanged a look, and Kenny stage whispered behind his hand, alas, he is wrong again, and all is right with the world. Kenny turned to Christian, trying to include him in the conversation. And what did you think of our dear Cassandra? I see you survived the experience. Christian shook his head, and Shane said, he hasn't met her, yet. 
Kenny said, wise. Tom agreed, wise. He said to Christian, just know that she loves Shane, and she will love you eventually when she sees that you love him as well. Christian's cheeks turned red, and Shane thought there were quite a few mites missing from that sentence. Kenny looked between the two younger men, at Christian's stiffness and Shane's drooping shoulders. Well, there is always hope, Tom said. There is sometimes only hope. He squeezed Kenny's hand, until one day suddenly, it is no longer needed. They spent the rest of the meal talking about work and why some foods qualified for brunch and others didn't, until Christian had relaxed enough to give Shane a tiny smile when he quoted from Star Wars again, and to share a laugh when Kenny and Tom didn't recognize it. To them, Shane normally quoted old black and whites, and he wondered if Christian would recognize any of those. But then Christian said, making the older men laugh, real diamonds? They must be worth their weight in gold. Shane smiled at him, and Christian realized what he'd done. He said, my mom loves Marilyn Monroe, loves old black and white movies. She used to watch them all the time. Tom sat back in his seat. There's no need to make excuses, Christian. Not here with us. That shut Christian up and he said no more than two words for the rest of the meal. Shane wanted to hug him, wanted to grab his hand and just tell him it was okay, but he wasn't sure it ever would be. Hugs and kisses were shared as they rose to leave. Tom shook Christian's hand instead of kissing his cheek and said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Eleanor Roosevelt, fascinating woman, she was outspoken and controversial at a time when women weren't. And she is considered today to be one of the most widely admired of her century. Kenny hooked his arm through Tom's. Give our love to Cassandra and tell her to be nice. Shane smiled. I will, and I won't. Kenny chuckled. Wise. And then he squeezed Tom's arm and pulled him away, saying, I'm in the mood for a black and white. Let's swing by the silent movie theater for a show tonight. Shane watched them leave, feeling like he always did when he saw them together. He basked in their love. He pushed down his jealousy. They'd been together nearly 40 years, and in quiet moments, when too much wine had been drunk, both Kenny and Tom would cry at their luck. So lucky to find the one who could heal hurts when they'd been so young. They'd had so many years together, so many memories, and they'd always had each other. They'd never been alone. Shane and Christian walked slowly to the car, silently, and Shane didn't recognize Christian was angry until he said, why did you bring me to meet them? His voice was low, his hands clenched, at meeting Kenny and Tom. Shane's jaw dropped. You didn't like them? Was it to trick me into admitting that I'm, that I'm like them? I don't need to trick you, and I don't need you to admit anything. I don't want to be like them, like that. Shane pushed down his own anger and said with as much calm as he could muster, you don't want to be happy? You don't want to be loved? You don't want to be authentic? He waved at Christian's shirt. This is what you'd rather be, an actor? An actor dressing in a costume and saying lines you don't believe. It's not an act, Shane. This is who I am. Shane shook his head. You know, every once in a while I get a glimpse of the real Christian. He's funny and geeky and silly. He's unapologetic. And every time he comes out to play, I fall head over heels in love with him. But you hide him because he's been hurt over and over again. He's been rejected over and over again. Shane's anger dissipated as quickly as it came, because he knew that was the truth. Shane didn't reach for Christian's hand here in public, even though he wanted to. I wanted to show you Kenny and Tom, because that's what I want for us in 40 years. I didn't show them to you to trick you. I brought you here to show what is possible, what love can look like, because I don't think you've ever seen it before. Christian got in the car, slamming the door behind him. Shane didn't follow. 
He leaned against the trunk of the car and folded his arms, and finally felt rejected himself. It had taken 30 years. He should feel lucky it had taken this long. He didn't. He wasn't sure he could handle the rejection any better than Christian had. Christian didn't want to be like them, but he didn't want to be like that. Shane had shown Christian the most beautiful thing he knew of, and Christian couldn't see it, didn't want it, didn't think it was beautiful. The car door opened slowly, and Christian said quietly, I've seen love, but you're right. I've never seen it in that combination before. Shane blinked rapidly, tipping his head up. He turned to look at Christian, who sat with his head in his hands, his shoulders slumped. Shane took a deep breath, preparing for rejection again, but asking anyway. But you saw it today, didn't you? Christian stayed silent, continued to stare a hole in the pavement, and Shane remembered what Tom had said, that sometimes there was only hope. Christian finally looked up, looked at Shane, and said, I saw it today. Until, suddenly, hope was no longer needed. They drove to the beach and walked through the sand. Shane didn't touch Christian, didn't hold his hand, just walked next to him, smiling and watching the sun worshippers, the volleyball players, the muscle men. Christian looked away from the skimpy swimsuits and out to the horizon. He stared at where the sky met the ocean, disappearing and blending into one. His whole life he'd struggled, fought himself. He'd tried so hard to be good, but it had always been an act. He'd always had to work at being acceptable, to not do things that made his family uncomfortable, to not hear that worried silence that happened after he said or did something not quite right. He stared at the ocean and missed his home. He missed his mountains. California was full of hills, but there was nothing here like the mountains in Utah. There was nothing like standing on the valley floor and looking up thousands of feet. The empty expanse of ocean couldn't compete with it. Christian had abandoned his home when he realized he couldn't live there anymore. He'd slunk from his religion and his God when he couldn't look at himself in the mirror anymore. He looked down at his cargo pants rolled up to his calves, his muted green and blue plaid shirt. Shane had said it was a costume, but that wasn't quite right. It was a uniform, and he'd adopted it when he realized he couldn't trust what he liked to wear, when he understood that what he was attracted to wasn't socially acceptable. He closed his eyes laughing at himself. Everything he was attracted to wasn't socially acceptable. He opened his eyes to look at Shane, so happy, so carefree, his sandy blonde hair getting mussed by the breeze and the salt and the sand. Christian couldn't say it out loud. He couldn't push it past his lips. He could hardly admit it to himself, that he looked at Shane and wanted him. He turned back to the ocean, looking past the breaking waves, past the surfers and the boats, out to that endless nothing. Nothing was hard to lose himself in, and once again he wished for his mountains. Something to look at, something to wander up when he needed to be alone, something to distract himself when life turned out to be impossible. He'd spent a lot of years in his mountains back home, which had relieved both him and his parents, Hiking and the outdoors was manly, wasn't it? His family loved him, and he loved them. But he wasn't what they thought he should be, even though he'd tried. He didn't really know who he was. He'd been pretending for so long. Fun and geeky and silly. Only when he wasn't careful. Only when he wasn't trying to be socially acceptable. He looked back at the beach, at the tanned bodies shown off by scraps of material and knew that what was socially acceptable changed. Maybe one day same love wouldn't turn heads. Maybe a boy who loved to dress up in his mother's high heels and makeup, who loved to feel pretty, could just be himself. He didn't blame his parents. They hadn't known what to do with a son who didn't conform. They had no answers and had tried their best. And now Christian was standing in the same place, 
He had no answers and could only do his best. He'd known for years that he could never marry. He wouldn't have children or a family. He would be alone. And then Shane had come, and Christian wasn't alone anymore. And Christian wondered what happened when you changed your social circle. What happened when socially acceptable changed? What happened when you could have what you wanted? Shane said, We can swing by Cassandra's tonight. She'd like to meet you. I'm afraid. And Christian was only half joking. You don't need to be. She's going to love you. Christian raised his eyebrows. It worries me that you can say that with a straight face. And all I know about her is what Kenny and Tom said. Shane repeated emphatically, She will love you. Eventually. Christian nodded his acquiescence. He thought it might be better to get this out of the way. And he thought that if she didn't like him, it might end this thing before it even started. Shane smiled at him so happily that Christian felt bad for even thinking that. Shane whipped out his phone, dialing. Cass, I want to bring my Christian around for you to meet. We'll bring dinner. Christian flicked his eyes to Shane, wondering what he'd been about to say, and saw when Shane's face went blank. He stopped walking and shouted into the phone, You've moved in with Penthouse? What is going on? He listened, saying, It's an hour away. And then, Pool? We'll get our suits and head on over. He put his phone away and muttered, She's in Brentwood. I don't know what she's doing. You said you wanted to bring your... Christian held his hands up in question. What were you going to say? Cassandra always quotes, A bird and a fish can fall in love, but where will they live? I'm the bird, she's the fish. She calls you my pretty little bird. Christian didn't know what to say to that, so he asked, Do you love her? I do, she's my best friend. I'll always love her. I know she'll always love me. Even now that she's moved in with Penthouse? Shane shrugged that off. That's not love. That's a little bit of fun. She hasn't even told me his real name. Is that where we are? A little bit of fun? Shane stopped. No, that's not where we are. You're too much work to be a little bit of fun. He smiled, and Christian thought that was exactly right. This wasn't fun. Chapter 4 Shane and Christian drove to Brentwood, stopping for their suits on the way, and Christian put the thought of Shane in his bathing suit out of his mind, as much as he could. When they got to the hotel, Shane pushed Christian toward the changing room. He said, why don't you go put your suit on? I'll go find Cassandra. Christian grinned. You're not worried at all about us meeting, are you? When he was changed, he found Shane talking to a woman in a bright blue bikini black sunglasses on. She was smiling and laughing, and when Shane waved Christian over, she stopped smiling and turned. She waited until he was close enough to hear to say, I've seen him before. He was wearing black and white then too. Shane stared at Christian's long board shorts and said, I can't even see your knees. I think you might be hopeless. Cassandra grinned. He's from Utah. You have to make excuses. She pulled her sunglasses down her nose and ran her eyes down Christian's chest. The fashion might be farm boy, but so is the body. You've got to take the bad with the good, Shane. Christian blushed, and Shane said, Oh, good. It's not just me who makes him do that. Christian said, mostly to stop them talking about him like he wasn't there. Hello, Cass. It's nice to finally meet you. Her mouth pinched together and she pushed her glasses back up. Hello, Chris. Christian. Cassandra. Shane clapped his hands. Okay, glad that's out of the way. Is Penthouse coming out to play? Cassandra shook her head. He's working. And you're out here by yourself. I hope the drive is worth it. She smiled. We worked it out. Shane's brows pulled together, and he looked at her body in her little bikini. Well. You look whole and well. I won't complain about him yet. She looked at Christian, up 
then down, and said to Shane, there's no reason for you to complain. You're not getting replaced by Dudley Do-Right. Christian said, I'm not Canadian. He realized he was much more comfortable with her antagonism than the flat-out welcome he'd received from Kenny and Tom earlier in the day. He'd have to think about what that meant. Shane sat slowly. Am I getting replaced? Cassandra and Christian both looked at him. Christian didn't even think, just took the last few remaining steps to sit next to him on the lounge chair, to be with him when he was sad. Cassandra took her glasses off, her eyes on Christian. She said, you're not getting replaced, Shane. He's just a little bit of fun. Christian said, that's what you said, remember? Just a little bit of fun. Shane was still looking at Cassandra. I know, but then she smiled when she was thinking of him. Christian said, well, then it must be just a little bit of fun. It's not worrying until there's some work to go along with it. A little frown that tempers the smile. Shane's lips moved, and he turned his head to Christian. That is reassuring on so many levels. He said to Cassandra, is there any work going on between you two? She lifted her arms, holding them out wide to indicate her drink, the pool, the heat of the sun. There's not an ounce of work going on here, not by me. Shane took a deep breath, then pushed himself up using Christian's thigh. Then I won't worry about it, and I will go put my suit on and forget about work for a little while myself. Cassandra said, good luck with that. Christian looks like he's going to be a lot of work. Christian stood, heading to the edge of the pool. I'll wait for you in the pool. He dove in and swam to the other side. Cassandra grinned at Shane. That was fun. Do you think you could be done? I don't want him scared off. Could I scare him off? And if I could, would you still think he's the real thing? Yes, I know that you'll like him if you give him a chance. She sighed. He's it, Shane? He's the love that will last through thick and thin? You'll see. She only said, he's in the pool, don't waste it. I'm going to go get dressed, or undressed. He looked at where Christian was in the pool, too far away to hear. That's more fun when he can hear it. And later, you and me, we're going to discuss Penthouse. He's only for fun, Shane. A distraction for now when I need it. I still love only you. I don't want you to love only me. I just want veto power. She laughed, waving him inside. Go get your suit on so you can play with your friend and think about whether you want me to have veto power. He walked away, saying over his shoulder, you do have it. I know you'll only use it if you're sure. Cassandra's stomach clenched. She hated to agree with Christian on principle, but he was right. Love was work. Love was a constant balance between what you wanted and what was good for the one you loved. She watched Christian swim back and forth, purposeful and not having any fun, and finally sighed. She had some work to do. She drained her drink and jumped into the cool water to chase after him. She swam right into his path and he stopped, his head popping to the surface. It was Sunday afternoon, the weekenders had gone home, the business suits hadn't arrived yet, the pool area wasn't empty, but it was sparse. They were the only ones in the pool, and she'd stopped him in the deep end. They treaded water, bobbing silently. They stared at each other, no Shane standing between them this time. She liked that he looked worried, but then she decided he probably always looked that way a little. He was a worrier. She said, let me see if I have this right. You want him, you just don't want to want him. Shane? No, the abominable snowman. He didn't smile. I don't think it's any of your business. It is my business. I'm the keeper of his heart, protector of his back. He said softly, it must be nice to have a friend so true, a friend you can depend on no matter what. He's a lucky man. And Cassandra, in that moment, hated Christian. Hated that he felt no jealousy toward her. 
hated that he thought she was Shane's friend, because she wasn't. They were soulmates. It wasn't friendship, it was love. It was platonic love, but still. Their feet bumped in the water, and Christian pushed himself backwards. Cassandra said, do you even know you're gay? Because you don't act like it. That had been ruder than she meant, or ruder than she normally was, at least. His head jerked back, and she waited for him to say he wasn't, to deny it. But he took a deep breath and raised his chin. Because I don't dress colorfully enough for you? Because you flinch when he touches you. I don't like people touching me. If she was a different kind of person, she would feel sorry for him, would wrap her arms around him until he did like it, give him one true friend so he wouldn't be alone, would let him have Shane to himself so he wouldn't be alone. But she wouldn't, she couldn't, she wasn't. She said, Shane's not people, is he? No. Christian's eyes flicked behind her and widened. Cassandra turned, expecting Shane in his tight-fitting swim trunks, but it was Brady, standing at the edge of the pool and watching them. Christian said softly to her back, I think I could love him, if I let myself. I just haven't figured out how to do that yet. Cassandra swam away from him like she hadn't heard, swam toward Brady. She rested her arms on the ledge and looked up at him. He squatted and said, I'm going to guess that is not Shane. Good guess. What gave it away? You looked like you wanted to drown him. She tried not to smile. You'd hide the body for me, right? Brady's head tipped up to look behind her. That bad? He wasn't. Not that bad. Christian was careful and skittish, and those weren't her favorite personality traits, but he wasn't that bad. She just had no patience for people who could hurt Shane, who could hurt him simply because they didn't know how to stand tall and proud, who could hurt him because they didn't know how to accept what was. It was not lost on her that the people who could fill your heart, who could give you a home, were the ones who could hurt you the most. She ignored Brady's question to ask one of her own. Are you going to get your suit on? He shook his head. I have a meeting and then I thought I'd go for a drive. She touched his hand, her cool skin warming against his heat. Do you want company? Only if I drive. It is my car now. He grinned at her. I said you could use it to drive to work and back. I don't wanna go with you if you're going to drive. I'd die of boredom. It was just a little prick to see if he would bleed to see if his wounds were starting to scab over. He said, then I guess you should stay here with your friends and enjoy the pool. Or you could come back down here after your meeting and enjoy it with us. I have an appointment to keep today, Cassandra. She nodded, okay. A loud splash alerted her that Shane had come back out. Brady lifted his head and stood. He slid his hands into his pockets and watched Shane swim the length of the pool. His eyes tracked, his smile was gone. He murmured, that's who I'm a surrogate for? I think I'm overselling it. Don't make me come out of this pool and hurt you. He looked down at her. I remember you saying something about my wife that made me wanna chuck you down a hill. And I appreciate that you didn't, which is why I'm warning you. He stared down at her a long moment, and her breath came faster, her heart sped up. She thought she'd really like it if he put on a tiny little swimsuit and joined her, and it wouldn't be because she couldn't have Shane. Brady looked back at Shane and Christian, gave them the same blank stare, and she knew the water would be heating up where they were too, could practically hear Shane's breath getting sucked in. Brady said, don't kill anyone in my pool. Cassandra cleared her throat. Shane's here now, he's safe. He looked down at her and gave her a small smile, then turned and walked away. Cassandra thought, Lord have mercy, then ducked her head under the water.
she swam slowly back to Shane and Christian, taking her sweet time, trying to cool down. She surfaced next to them, gulping down air. Shane muttered, I know why you moved into his penthouse. I've got tingles. He poked Christian in the side, making him jump, and Shane said, Come on, tell me that man did not make you want to take a ride on the wild side. Christian turned a lovely shade of purple. He's impressive. Cassandra turned to watch Brady take those last few steps inside, and when he turned, she gave him a little finger wave. She said, impressive? Yes, yes he is. Shane sighed. Tell me he is one of those big hard men that loves to cuddle, and when he gets his hands on you, he is so gentle you want to choke him. Cassandra flicked her eyes to Christian, still purple, and said, gentle? He is not particularly. Shane groaned and whispered, rough? Oh my God, I'm never going to be able to get out of this pool. We'll just have to stay in here until you're all wrinkly and pruney. Yes, that is how long we're going to stay in here. Shane held up his hand. Only two more questions. Will he be joining us? And does he wear a Speedo? She shook her head. I don't know what he wears. My guess would be he wears nothing. Shane said with no heat, bitch. And she laughed. Cool your jet, Smokey. He wasn't that hot. Right, because your fripples aren't telling you to pop upstairs for a quickie. Quite a few parts of her were telling her to do that. But she said, this water is cold. Too bad that explanation doesn't work for you. Too bad the cold water isn't working for me. She looked down into the water. Perhaps Christian is onto something with those board shorts. At least while we're in the water, we just don't know what he thought about Brady, do we? Shane said, Brady? Oh, Brady. I like it. And Christian is a red-blooded gay man. We know what he thought about Brady. Christian had been watching them silently, but at that he said, I already said he was impressive. What more do you want? Cassandra said, we want to hear you say you'd tie that man down and have him six ways to Sunday, or that he could tie you down. Either one, really. I'm not going to say that. I wouldn't say it about a woman. I won't say it about a man. Shane sighed theatrically. He's going to be noble, respectful. Cassandra didn't sigh. She said, you wouldn't even think about it, would you, Christian? When he shook his head, Cassandra said to Shane, good Mormon gay boy, you'll just have to be catty and bitchy and lustful with me. Shane looked at Christian. Good Mormon gay boy, what am I going to be with you? He sounded like he was honestly wondering. What was Shane going to be? Who was he going to be? Cassandra swam away. She let him wonder, because that was all she had. She couldn't veto Christian. Shane would have to do that himself. She would be as catty and as bitchy and as lustful as they normally were. She wouldn't hide it from Christian. Because if he was going to leave, he would have to do it sooner rather than later. And if he wasn't going to leave, then she was going to have to like him. And she was pretty sure that was going to be impossible. When they finished swimming, they went up to the penthouse and ordered from room service just because. Shane ate his fish with gusto and said, I like it. I like the penthouse. I like Brady. You may continue. You didn't even meet him. You just like that he gives you tingles. Yes, I don't need to meet him. I just need to look at him. Christian ate his burger and fries with a little less gusto. He had asked for ketchup and mayonnaise, mixing them together to cries of horror. He dipped and ate, dipped and ate. And Cassandra and Shane just looked at each other. Christian said, are you sure putting our dinners on the tab was okay? Cassandra nodded. Brady will pay. He just doesn't know about it yet. Shane said, 
I'm sure he knows by now that you will make him pay in myriad ways. He's figuring it out, and he lets me be creative in how I pay him back. Shane groaned, closing his eyes. He whispered, you are killing me. Cassandra flicked her eyes to Christian, wondering just how long it had been for Shane. Christian met her eyes and ate another fry. Cassandra almost laughed, almost thought he knew exactly what he was doing. Shane said, he pays for gas, he's given you his car, he pays for room service. I don't even want to know what you are doing to deserve all this. You want to know. He leaned forward. I do, I do. Please tell me. She chuckled, shaking her head. Shane said, I looked when you were in the bathroom and I couldn't find any rope, no handcuffs, no sex toys. We can't keep those things out in the open. Housekeeping is in here every day. Christian let out a long, loud breath. Do you two only talk about sex? Cassandra looked at Shane. Pretty sure we do. What else is there? Christian closed his eyes. Movies, books, current affairs. Cassandra said, affairs? Shane said, you know who's having an affair? Christian shook his head. No, 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 something else, anything else. What else was there? Cassandra took a long, long sip of her wine, silently vowed that Shane and or Christian would pay for this, and said, so, you mean like Dungeons and Dragons? Brady rode the elevator to the penthouse, wondering if he should have taken a longer drive. The front desk told him that Cassandra's guests were still in residence, although they'd left the pool, all of them whole and alive. They'd ordered dinner, and Brady only briefly wondered if they were eating it on his bed. He had a table, but Cassandra liked to eat in bed, off his chest occasionally. But surely the three of them wouldn't be eating on his bed. Surely. He relaxed when he saw them sitting at the table. Three heads turned in his direction, and Cassandra smiled. She said, have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? He stopped. No. Cassandra said to Christian, you'll have to teach all of us how to play. And Brady raised his eyebrows. Shane shivered and whispered loudly, he's going to make you pay for even imagining he'd play a little D&D. Cassandra whispered back, I know. Shane held a hand to his chest. And look at me, using the lingo and everything. Cassandra swatted his arm and said, I know. Shane grinned at her and turned back to Brady. Come and tell me a little bit about yourself. Why? Shane whimpered, propping his face on his fist. Does he ever turn the menace off? If I say yes, he'll punish me, so yes. Brady smiled at her with his eyes and headed for a shower. When the bathroom door opened, Brady's hair was full of shampoo and he realized he should have locked the door. He said, that had better be Cassandra. No, but I won't peek, promise. I'm going to guess you are Shane, good guess. Brady paused remembering Cassandra saying the same thing, remembering what it was like to be a couple, not just together, but a couple. Shane said, I wanted to say hello, meet you. These long glances across a crowded room are just not enough. Brady snorted and rinsed his hair. Shane wanted to mark his territory. He might be gay, but he was still a man, and Brady was encroaching. He wanted to make sure I know my place with Cassandra behind you. Brady heard rustling, as if Shane was moving items around on the counter, and Shane said, I do want to make sure you know that, not just to warn you off, just to warn you. That's kind of you, but I'm just using her. She's just using me. That's okay. A little mutually beneficial using never hurt anyone. It's just when one party forgets that it's just for fun. Cassandra doesn't normally move in with men she's known for a few weeks. I made her an offer she couldn't refuse. The car, I know. 
She also watched me come in here. Brady said, so you are worried that I mean more to her than you would like. Shane murmured, she's checking to see how you react to me. If she didn't care about you, she wouldn't care what you thought. Brady turned off the water and pulled back the curtain. Shane's eyes met his in the mirror, and Brady said, I'm not going to react to you. I don't care one way or the other. Shane glanced down and murmured, I can see that. He turned around, kept his eyes up, and crossed his arms. Just two men facing off over a woman. Brady couldn't see that being gay changed much about being a man, just who you like to cuddle up to at night. Shane said, I can't at least tell her that she doesn't need to worry about you being a switch hitter. Brady chuckled, grabbing a towel and wrapping it around his waist. You think she'd care about that? Yes, I think she would care a lot, more than I want her to. Shane's eyes slid down Brady's chest. But really, who can blame her? Brady thought quite a few people could and would, including the two men facing off in this bathroom. Shane said, I love her, and I don't want her hurt. I don't know how I could hurt her, she loves you. I don't know why I'd hurt her, I love someone else. Shane nodded. Love, c'est impossible. Impossible and hopeless, including your little friend out there. I know, you can't even see his knees. Shane held up his hands and shrugged. Love, c'est impossible. Brady walked over to stand next to him at the counter. Shane propped his hip against the counter and watched. And who is it that you love? My wife. Shane blinked uncontrollably. Married? She died. Brady grabbed for his toothbrush and thought that those were actual tears popping into Shane's eyes. So you give Cassandra your body, but she will never have your heart. And she gives you her body, but you will never feel her love. Shane closed his eyes. Oh, that is so painfully beautiful. Oh, I love it. Brady grunted, and then Shane opened his eyes again. The tears were gone. Easy love is boring. Loving your dead wife is tragic. I adore tragic. Loving your gay friend is just as tragic. And I adore Cassandra. I love her. If she'd been born a man or if I'd been born straight, we would have been so happy. It would have been easy. And then we'd be boring. Brady turned his head away from the mirror to look Shane in the eyes and saw the same look that was in Cassandra's. Life's a bitch. What's next? And he saw also that Cassandra was Shane's, always would be. Brady nodded imperceptibly. He didn't want Cassandra, not her heart, not her love. She was only a little distraction, a little bit of peace. Shane pushed away from the counter and gave him a little finger wave. Thanks for the show. Brady waited until Shane had pushed open the bathroom door to say, you're welcome. Brady was still grooming a few minutes later when there was a light knock on the door. He sighed, hanging his head. He hadn't realized that when he'd moved Cassandra in, he'd moved her entire posse in. He said loudly, who is it this time? Cassandra opened the door and leaned against the jam. They've gone home. Are you done with meetings for tonight? He nodded, even though she already seemed to know his schedule. I'm free for a few hours. Oh, good. No, you've been very, very bad. A man's shower time is sacred. He walked toward her, slowly, menacingly. He wrapped his hand around the back of her neck and walked her toward the bed. She said, is it? And Dungeons and Dragons? He's from Utah. Excuses must be made. Brady sat down, pulling her between his legs, his towel parting helpfully. Just which one of us were you testing? You. I can't really picture myself sleeping with a guy who's played D&D &D before. She whispered, 
Look at me using the lingo and everything. She pushed at him until he toppled backwards. Not the question Brady had been asking, but he didn't need to ask again. Shane didn't need to be tested. Cassandra climbed onto the bed, climbed onto him, and said, I didn't send him in there. You could have stopped him. I don't think you know Shane all that well yet. He knew Cassandra. He said, I think we all dance to your tune. She smiled. That's nice. Now if only it was true. She stretched out on top of him, folded her arms against his chest, and rested her chin. She said, did you have a nice drive? No, it hadn't been nice, but it hadn't been not nice either. He wanted to get back here. He wanted what was next. He wanted to look in the mirror and see the same look in his eyes that he saw in theirs. The acceptance of what was, the hope of what could be. But he didn't want to leave his family behind. He ignored her question. What was Shane looking for in the bathroom? Cassandra pushed herself up, her brows furrowed in confusion. Then she laughed. Probably sex toys. Did you tell him we don't need any? No, I told him you were one gigantic sex toy. He should have guessed that. No wonder he came in to get a peek. No wonder. You didn't have to give him one. He shrugged. Seemed like the easiest way to assert my dominance, because mine's bigger. She laughed, shaking her head. Did he give you a peek too? Then how do you know? Because mine's bigger. She patted his cheek, still laughing. I don't think it works that way with him. She shrugged. But okay, if you're happy that it's been resolved. It's been resolved. She looked confused again, but he didn't clarify. He and Shane had laid down a few lines, had decided who would get what parts of Cassandra. And without coming right out and saying it, because they were men. And since Brady did know Cassandra better than a few weeks would suggest, he didn't tell her any of that. And since Brady did know Cassandra better than a few weeks would suggest, he wiggled beneath her until his towel came apart and she got distracted. Until she gave him the only part of her he wanted. Chapter 5 Brady went down with Cassandra early Monday morning to get the car. He told Rodrigo that she would be driving it. He just wasn't sure either of them were actually going to let her do it. His little Z was waiting in front of the hotel, Cassandra next to him tired and cranky that she had to wake up even earlier than normal to get to work on time. Brady couldn't decide what was worse, her driving his car tired or her driving his car pumped full of caffeine, so he'd ordered her coffee half decaf. She smiled when she slid into the driver's seat, and Brady briefly thought about Argentina briefly wondered if he'd see either one of them again. And then he remembered Shane, Shane and Christian. If that ever ended, Brady would have to take his car back from Cassandra. Rodrigo sidled up to stand next to Brady and said, Effie. And in that one word was all the disapproval one man could give another for letting a woman keep his balls in her pocket. You didn't give a woman your car. You didn't give a woman like Cassandra your Z. Brady nodded. If she brings it back with dings or dents, just take care of it. I don't want to know. Rodrigo said, you give her your little Z and you won't even talk to me about a raise? A smile played at Brady's mouth until Cassandra pulled away from the curb, over revving the engine. Madre de Dios. Rodrigo clutched at his heart. Cassandra gave a little finger wave out the window, and Rodrigo and Brady watched until she was out of sight, long gone, and they kept standing there. They sighed, heartfelt. And then Rodrigo thumped him on the back. Better go make some money, Jefe, so you can buy another one when she crashes it. Brady's heart squeezed, imagining Cassandra lying broken and bloody in his car. Another death on his shoulders. Then he pushed it away and turned to go to work. Rodrigo stopped him with, Hefe, wait. Brady turned back to find him looking pained. What's wrong? Her car, 
It's right there where everyone can see it. And if you need to go somewhere. The horror of Brady driving Cassandra's car nearly made him laugh out loud. Rodrigo said, let me take care of it. Brady nodded, carte blanche. Rodrigo grinned and said, now that is better than a raise. Brady lasted until noon, and then he sent a text to Cassandra. Make it to work all right? He waited for her reply, and waited. Twisted steel, mangled body. The Z was too powerful for her. He'd driven with her up Mulholland Drive, and hadn't been sure they were going to make it. She'd rev it, lose control, and spin it around like a top. He waited ten minutes, the fear and nausea pushing him to his feet. He paced in front of his window. When his phone chimed, he stopped dead and pulled his phone up to eye level like a man walking to his death. No, in Mexico. Mmm, burritos. His heart started thumping again. The breath that had been caught in his chest exploded out. His phone chimed again. I'll bring some back for dinner. He didn't try to stop the grin didn't fight the relief coursing through his veins. He wrote, one drip and Mexico won't be far enough away. We'll be home late, gonna stop by a car wash. Brady laughed. She wasn't home late. Brady was helping at the front desk, making his staff nervous with his presence when he saw Cassandra drive up. He walked outside, to the relief of everyone, and heard Rodrigo say to Cassandra, you would be lucky if the junkyard would take your little green p uh, car. Brady saw the fire flicker in Cassandra's eyes at the insult to her car, and he said, Rodrigo is getting your car fixed. Something's gotta be done to it if it's going to be parked in plain sight. It's a green 1996 Honda Civic. How good could he make it look? Rodrigo jutted his chin. You insult me. Cassandra folded her arms and faced him down. What are you going to do to it? Make it better. She narrowed her eyes. Impossible. Hefe, your woman's got a mouth on her. Cassandra said, Hefe? She turned to Brady. Your woman? Rodrigo jerked his thumb at Brady. Hefe, the boss. Cassandra nodded. She'd been born and raised in Southern California. She had to know what Hefe meant. Rodrigo looked her up and down. And you're not his woman? Brady said, she is. Cassandra raised her eyebrows at him. Rodrigo hopped into the Z and set out the window. Don't think she knows it. Maybe you want to take her upstairs and remind her. And then I'd like to talk to you about my raise. Cassandra watched him peel away her arms still crossed. Your woman? He's not politically correct. Cassandra snorted at that and got to the real issue. You just gave him my car to do whatever he wants? I gave you my car to do whatever you want. Not the same, because it was my car. Trust Rodrigo, he loves cars. She watched as Rodrigo parked the little Z in its place of honor and muttered, you could have just covered it or parked it somewhere else. And made Rodrigo run to kingdom come and back every time one of us leaves? She flung her hand out. It's right there. I could walk to it myself. And then what would I be paying Rodrigo for? He looked at her empty hands. Hey, where's my burrito? She didn't smile. She said, do you pay him a slave wage? Because I can't put out for a man like that. I do not, and he could have that raise any time he wants. He's been in line for a promotion for two years. Maybe you should tell him that. He knows, he won't accept it, he likes to be outside. Rodrigo jogged back, eyeing Brady and Cassandra. He called out, Effie's woman? Cassandra muttered under her breath, he's doing that on purpose, and turned back to Rodrigo. What? Don't worry about your ugly little car. I'll bring her back to you, a lady. Cassandra jerked her thumb at Brady. You'd better, 
or I'll make him give you that promotion you don't want. Rodrigo grinned wide enough to show gold caps on his back molars. He said to Brady, no wonder you let her drive your Z. Rodrigo put his polite smile back on as another car pulled up, hiding his gold caps just as he hid the tattoos marking his body, not forgetting who he used to be, not forgetting what he'd done in the past, just moving on. Brady had always thought that it had been easier for Rodrigo because he hadn't loved the person he'd killed, hadn't even known the man. But now, Brady wondered if it was just that he could accept what had happened, understood that he couldn't change the past, only the future. When they got to the elevator, Brady said, we were in prison together. You probably could have told me that before I started threatening him. Brady smiled. Vehicular manslaughter. He boosted a Maserati and hit a pedestrian. Cassandra was quiet a long time. She finally said, is that why he likes to be outside? Brady nodded. She said, you hired a car thief as a valet? A man can change. She grunted at that, and Brady wondered if all men could change, or if it was just a lucky few. They watched the floor number count higher and higher, and she said, I really wish I'd brought home burritos. On a Friday evening, a few more weeks into their thing, Brady treated her, Shane, and Christian to dinner. Cassandra was more impressed he'd taken the time off work than with the venue. Give her a burrito stuffed with french fries and she was happy. But she knew Shane would love it, so she'd gone along quietly. Christian looked uncomfortable. What else was new? When they were all seated, Cassandra said, Now you may tell us. Just what are we celebrating? Tomorrow I get my car back. Uh, no, you don't. Uh, yes, I do. Rodrigo is picking yours up in the morning. Cassandra studied the menu, noting the prices, then looked back at Brady. I'll have the lobster. Christian will have the filet mignon. Christian opened his mouth, and she shot him a look. He shut his mouth. Shane said, what about me? I know you're not going to pick the cheapest item on the menu. Everyone looked at Christian, then realized she was right and went back to looking at the menu. After Brady had ordered for everyone, lobster and mignon and duck, the waiter placed a large bowl of ice ringed by beautifully balanced shrimp in front of them. Shane wiggled in his seat with excitement. Christian and Cassandra looked at each other with wide eyes, and she thought for one moment that there was at least one other person at this table who would not be bowled over by shrimp. Cassandra said, this is not going to work. You're not getting your car back for a bowl of shrimp and outrageously priced lobster. Shane picked up a shrimp with his pinky in the air and said, if Ethan brought you here, you'd be giggling and promising him your firstborn. Cassandra looked at the pink shrimp and the red cocktail sauce and tried not to gag. Hot buttered shrimp was one thing. Cold shrimp, dipped in you can call it whatever you want, but it's still ketchup, something else entirely. No, I wouldn't. Shane wobbled his head and pushed out his lips. Oh, yes, you would. Cassandra thought about Ethan O'Connor and stopped thinking about shrimp and she started smiling. Brady squinted his eyes at her. What's going on? Shane sighed. That's her Ethan O'Connor face. He held up his hand. Wait, wait, here's mine. Shane's head tipped to the side, and his eyes lost their focus. He looked dreamily off into space, a silly smile tilting his lips up. Christian and Brady looked between Cassandra and Shane for a long minute. Then Christian said, who's Ethan O'Connor? Shane blinked and straightened his head. Oh, he's just the most charming man you'll ever meet. Our friend Mackenzie swept him off his feet. He muttered under his breath, lucky bitch. He patted his lips and cleared his throat. They come back to LA a few times a year. You'll see what I mean when you meet him. 
Cassandra shook her head, clearing it of Ethan O'Connor when the waiter placed her lobster in front of her. You should have seen the wedding. Everyone was walking around smiling stupidly, jumping to help whenever Ethan asked for anything. And Mackenzie just watched him wrap everyone around his finger and rolled her eyes. Shane said, and when Cassandra says everyone, she means us too. She didn't deny it. Well, he's charming and beautiful. Honestly, I think he married the one person who was immune to him. Shane shook his head. She's not immune. She just fights it when no one else does. It's a good thing they live in New York. I wish they didn't, but I'm kind of glad they do. Shane nodded. We would get nothing done, spend all our time making excuses for why we needed to pop by. We wouldn't need any excuses. Wyatt and Grant need to see their Aunt Cassandra and Uncle Shane, don't they? Mm-hmm. And we need to moon over their daddy. Cassandra's mind slipped into Ethan land again, where all the men were handsome and gallant and dreamy and made her want to have sex and then want to have cooing babies. When she came back to L.A., a smile was playing at the edges of Brady's mouth. He said, why don't you look like that when you think of me? He's a different kind of man. Ethan would never ask anything from me that I didn't want to give. And I would? Cassandra drowned a forkful of lobster in her melted butter. You wouldn't ask, and yes. The smile bloomed. A man walking past their table stopped and said, Ivy? Brady turned, the smile dropping from his mouth. When Brady saw who it was, he stood, shaking hands with the man. Carter. It's good to see you, Ivy. I heard about what... Brady nodded his head, cutting Carter off. The long, awkward silence made Cassandra and Shane reach for their wine glasses. Christian drank his water. Cassandra should have ordered him a drink as well. Carter finally said, still at the hotel? Brady nodded again, and Carter said, I haven't seen you at the club. Too busy. I know how that is. Still, a man's gotta take some time for fun. He looked at the table, which it looks like you're doing. He grabbed for Brady's hand again, patting his arm like a politician greeting a donor. It was good to see you, Ivy. Let me know if you come back to the club. Brady sat back down, and everyone watched Carter walk away. When it looked like Brady wasn't going to explain anything that had just happened, Shane said, Ivy? Oh, please tell me there is some story to that. Like, you were climbing up some ivy and fell, but your pants caught on a windowsill and saved you, and you were stuck swinging in the wind for hours, mooning everyone. Cassandra started laughing, but Brady said, no. Christian said, that would have been amazing. He should have just said yes. Brady nodded soberly. I should have. Cassandra sighed. Okay, then what is the story with Ivy? I, V, the fourth. Shane reached for his wine glass again. I liked mine better. Cassandra closed her eyes. The fourth. Why is it that Ethan's wealth is not off-putting, but yours is? Brady's lips twitched. Christian said, I like it. Everyone turned to look at him watching him cut his steak into tiny pieces and enjoying every melt-in-your-mouth bite like he knew he shouldn't. Cassandra said, the filet or the IV? Both. Thank you for dinner, Ivy. Brady. Christian nodded. It sounded like a childhood nickname. My brother is a junior, and any time someone called, we had to ask Big Steve or Little Steve. I think he would have preferred Ivy. Shane said, I think I'm glad I wasn't named after anyone. Brady said, my father goes by Carl, Carlton Brady Roberts III. Ivy was a school name. Shane put his fork down. Carlton? Carlton? Cassandra patted Brady's forearm. Just ignore the next few minutes. She said to Shane, he goes by Brady. Cass, 
Carlton. Oh, Carlton. He wiggled his finger between the two of them. This fling is over. He didn't pick it, Shane. And anyway, what's Christian's middle name? No, I don't want to know. Christian said, Hiram, and stopped the conversation. The silence lengthened until Cassandra said, finally, he didn't pick it. Shane mouthed to her, Hiram. Cassandra took another bite of lobster, thinking all she'd had to do was get Christian to say his middle name. She should have guessed that. Christian ate another bite of filet. Is it really that bad? Shane tried to clear his head with a shake. It's not Carlton, I'll give you that. Brady sent a dead-eyed glare over to Shane's side of the table, and Shane shivered. He whispered behind his hand to Cassandra, okay, fine, Carlton can stay. Cassandra nodded. Brady could have been named Rainbow Bright, and his badass self still could have stayed. Shane's obsession with names had come in high school. They'd both been in the drama club's production of Romeo and Juliet, and they'd rehearsed for months. Cassandra could still recite by memory, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Shane's reply had always been no. Romeo and Juliet would never have got off the ground if it had been called Romeo and Brunhilde. Cassandra could have said something about real, lasting love right then, the kind that lasted, no matter what name your love had been blessed with. But instead, she ate another bite of lobster. Shane said, Hiram, maybe I can work with it? Hiram, Hiram. When Cassandra glanced at Christian, there was a smile on his face, a smile that said Shane was just so funny. A smile that said, Cassandra's fingers tightened on her wine glass. Brady's hand settled on her leg under the table. His thumb lightly stroked her thigh. And when Cassandra lifted her eyes from the pale yellow liquid in her glass, Brady's gaze caught hers. Dark and nearly black and not dead. No matter how much either of them wished, they just weren't dead. The vice around her heart stopped squeezing. Her fingers stopped trying to wring the goblet's neck. Cassandra wasn't alone with her misery. She had Brady, at least for a little while, and he wasn't a small consolation prize. Shane whispered, dragging her attention back to him and Christian, maybe I can work with it. And when she looked at him, Christian was lightly touching Shane's hand. Shane's face blossomed with happiness. What about shortening it to high? Christian High Johnson. Ooh, I like that. Cassandra pushed her plate away, no longer hungry. She muttered, we are relieved. And Brady snorted. Yes, your majesty, we are all relieved. He squeezed her thigh hard and distracted her by ordering a triple chocolate layer cake for dessert. And by the time dinner was over, she was okay again, as okay as she was going to get. They walked back to the cars, and Cassandra watched Shane and Christian leave together. No hand-holding, a good foot between them. It was just so awkward. He was just so awkward. She looked down at her empty hand, and then Brady's, and told herself it was different. There was no awkwardness between them. They weren't dating. There was no wooing. It was two people having a good time together, nothing more. She held her hand out for the keys, and Brady said, you let me drive here. That was before I knew you were trying to take the Z away from me. I'm not going back to my Civic, not when I live with you all the way out in Brentwood. Trust Rodrigo. She snorted. I don't trust him. I don't trust you. I'm keeping the Z. Brady stuffed his hands in his pockets and looked up. Cassandra almost mimicked him, but then remembered she'd seen the stars. She liked looking at his face better. Sometimes she watched him sleep, just because she liked how he looked. She liked how she saw two people when she looked at him, before and after. She thought he might have been a little like Ethan before. 
go lucky, special, the air. She could see it even now. He knew he'd get his way. Whatever he wanted, he'd get it. And now he knew he'd never get the one thing that really meant anything. After. He looked down at her, catching her eye, and there wasn't any charm in his look. He didn't make her dreamy and forget who she was. He didn't make her want babies and marriage and happily ever after. Although, God, he made her want sex. He was anger and heat and black nothing, and Cassandra wanted it all. She had her own anger and heat and wanted to disappear into the black nothing, if only for a little while. She motioned for the keys again and taunted, Ivy? He coughed out a laugh, closing his eyes. Brady. Cassandra reached for the keys in his hand, slipping her fingers between his. Everyone would give him whatever he wanted, because he was scary and tragic and big. But she wouldn't, because she liked him after better. She liked him slightly frustrated and teetering on the edge. Brady let go of the keys and said, just know that I'm going to make you pay tonight for getting your way in this. She stopped herself from saying, yes, please, at the last second, and instead stepped into him, pressing herself against him and feeling every hard, bulging muscle. She swallowed, shivering with her want, and said huskily, only if I can't get you to toss your cookies on the way home. Cassandra woke the next morning in protest. It was Monday, she had an hour-long drive to make, and Brady kept telling her with his eyes that she wasn't getting the Z today. He'd also told her by hiding the keys. Cassandra crossed her arms and glared at him over the breakfast table. He took a bite, looking rested and ready for the day. And she knew he looked that way because of her. They'd expended quite a bit of energy when they'd made it back from the restaurant last night, and then had both gotten seven hours of shut-eye. And he could thank her by giving her the goddamn keys to his Z. He said, do you really think that's going to work? Do you really think I'm coming back here tonight? He blinked in shock, then reached for his coffee cup and took a long, slow sip before saying, it hadn't occurred to me that you wouldn't. I have uprooted my life to move in here with you for two reasons. Cassandra held up two fingers, and when he started smiling that satisfied man smile, she said, the pool and your car. He snorted out his coffee. He patted his lips, coughing, and Cassandra ate her eggs. When he could talk again, he held up his two fingers. I asked you to move in here for two reasons as well. We're even. Except you just took away one of my reasons. He shook his head. I'm replacing it. Trust me. She muttered, you keep saying that. I have no reason to. You have no reason not to either. I think you'll like your car. I think you'll prefer your car to mine. She tried not to laugh. Really, she did. There was such a thing as loyalty. But his car was a Z. She said, maybe you'll prefer it. We won't know until we see it, will we? Oh, she knew. But she pursed her lips and finished her breakfast. And when they went downstairs to see what a car thief could do to a 1996 Civic, her jaw dropped to the floor. Her old green Civic was no longer green. It was pearlescent peach. It looked brand new, but retro too. It had a rear bumper, shiny new hubcaps, shiny new everything. The windows were now tinted, except she could see through the windshield that the seats were now upholstered in black and white zebra stripes. Brady looked at her expression, heard the squeaking sounds she was making, and said, this wasn't quite what I was expecting. She rounded on Rodrigo. You said you were going to bring her back a lady. What kind of lady is this? A lady young enough to have some fun and old enough not to care what anybody thinks. Cassandra kicked a tire, a new tire. 
four new tires. She reached for the door handle and stopped. A shiny new door handle. It was the old shape and new hardware, all at the same time. Cassandra shook her head. Impossible, this can't be the same car. Rodrigo folded his arms. You say impossible? I say it is done. You've souped up my car. He gave a satisfied nod. She said, a new engine? Knew everything. She poked her head inside the window to look at the new zebra-striped upholstery, and Rodrigo said, now she doesn't have to drive your Z, Hefe. Cassandra pulled her head back out. Oh, please, you're telling me there's even a comparison between his car and mine, even now that it's new and improved? I doubt it. Rodrigo opened the driver door and waved her inside with a flourish. She sat, reluctantly, looking around critically. It's like my car, but it isn't. Rodrigo closed the door with a solid thunk. Take her for a spin. Brady got in the other side, smoothing down his tie and gripping the door handle, and nodded at her that he was ready. Cassandra said, oh, you're coming? He nodded again, not saying a word, and Cassandra's mouth tilted up. She started the car, ready to turn it back off and hand the keys over to Brady. He could drive the painted lady. It was his car thief who'd made her into one. And then sat there, as the engine revved, and the power ran up the steering wheel and into her fingers. She looked at Rodrigo, and he folded his arms and tilted his chin and stared back at her. Cassandra drove around the block, and then she went another block, and then she raced for Mulholland Drive, not caring that she was going to be late for work, not caring that Brady was sweating in her brand new seats beside her. She laughed and whooped as the car raced around curves, up and down hills, and she shouted over the engine and the wind racing in through the open windows, it's like I'm 18 again, but better, like I've got the looks, I can run down the block without wanting to keel over, but I've got some experience behind me as well, and I'm not so tiringly stupid. Brady didn't say anything, just gripped the door handle and tried to stay in his seat as she rounded corners. Two hours later, she made it back to the hotel. Rodrigo watched her pull up, his chin still raised, his arms still folded. She put the car in park and sat there and stared at him through the windshield. She said, so I have to tell him he was right? Brady unpeeled his fingers from the door. He already knows he's right. And Rodrigo did look like he knew exactly what they were saying. Cassandra said, can I drive your Z on the weekends? Do you think you're going to want to? When she didn't answer, Brady pushed open his door and said to Rodrigo, okay, now you can come talk to me about that raise. Chapter six. Brady woke with a gasp, sitting up in bed in the dark room. Cassandra slept peacefully next to him, and as he looked at her, his heart slowed and his muscles relaxed. He'd woken not from a nightmare, not from the screams that no longer plagued him. He'd woken from the absence. He'd woken because in his dream, he'd been happy, and he'd realized that with peace came forgetfulness. He was forgetting his son, his wife. All Brady had left of them was that one last memory, and every night that he slept, every night that he chose Cassandra, they moved a little farther away from him. One tear slid down his cheek, and another. He thought peace would be peaceful, but it wasn't. Peace came with its own heartache. Cassandra rolled toward him, her eyes opening to see him sitting up in bed. She reached for the tear hanging stubbornly to his jaw, wiping it away, and he gasped as the pain seared him. Another wave of tears flowed, and he rolled into Cassandra, gripping her tight and hiding his face against her chest. The tears emptied from him, and all the pain, the horror, the hate and self-loathing rushed out of him. 
Cassandra stroked his hair and cried with him, for him and with him. When he quieted, she whispered, life's a bitch. Life's a bitch, what's next? Brady said, his voice rough, his throat swollen, I don't want to lose them. My dreams are all I have left. Are they? Just because you can't see them, touch them, doesn't mean you don't have anything left of them. It was all he had. He had nothing else except the last memory. His wife's blood, his son's screams, his own personal hell, and he couldn't give it up because it meant he would be giving them up as well. And he didn't think he could give up Cassandra either. Couldn't give up the sweet release from this endless hell. She said, you have other memories of them. I'm sure you have pictures. Why aren't they here, where you live? I don't live here. I exist here. Then where do you live? Brady drove her to his home. The traffic as light as it ever got. The drive from Brentwood to Calabasas cutting through the last green space in Los Angeles and making her forget for a few minutes that they lived in the middle of a concrete jungle. He parked in the drive and looked at his home that had stood empty for so long. It was long and boxy, one story, glass and white walls, uber modern. His wife had loved it, but had kept telling them they needed something different. This wasn't a home where kids were free to be wild, and she'd wanted more kids, more happy, wild kids. The outside lights blazed, welcoming him home like they'd always done. And he knew that when he went inside, ghosts would be there to greet him. When he'd been released from prison, he'd headed here first, but everything had been exactly the same. The cleaning crew still cleaned, the gardener still tended. They'd changed nothing, just doing what they'd done for years because no one had told them differently. He'd taken one step inside, and had died all over. He'd rarely gone back since then. Brady walked around to the back first, and when Cassandra sighed at the pool, he almost smiled. Charlie loved to swim. He was fearless. He was only four, and he would run down the diving board and fling himself off. Samantha always said he'd give her a heart attack one day. Cassandra didn't react to the first time he'd said his wife's name, just sat down at the edge, taking off her shoes and sticking her feet in the clear blue water. I bet he loved the slide, too. Brady looked at the short slide built into the rocks and nodded. He closed his eyes, hearing the shrieks, remembering the fun they'd had together. Cassandra said gently, It all ends, Brady. It doesn't change what happened. It doesn't make it less or even tragic. The good times are good, the end. And the bad times are bad? The bad times blow. The bad times are inevitable. Celebrate the good times, remember them. But it felt so wrong. It felt so wrong to remember the good times when he'd been the one to end them. Brady unlocked the back door, stepping inside and leaving Cassandra by the pool. He wandered into the great room, white and clean, sterile. There were no toys littering the floor, no little handprints smudging the walls. The tears threatened again, and Brady turned away. The kitchen sparkled with disuse, and he sat at the counter and remembered all the times he'd sat here watching his wife clean up after a meal. Cassandra found him there, skirting around him to open cupboards and drawers. Dishes were stacked neatly, but the fridge was empty, the pantry bare. She swiped a finger on a shelf and found no dust, took out a bowl and held it up to the light to see it sparkle. She said, creepy. Cleaning service. They just keep cleaning an empty house? He nodded. I can't tell them to stop. I can't believe your TV is still here. He laughed, and it echoed. Cassandra sat next to him at the counter. I'd like to see some pictures. That will hurt. 
I don't know why it has to. Every end is tragic, Brady. It doesn't, can't change what came before. He waved his hand toward the office, and she tugged at him until he stood up to come with her. When they entered the office, she said, and the computer is here too? Did you hire nuns? He didn't have a clue what was on the computer. Wouldn't have cared if it had been taken. He pulled Cassandra to the bookcase, where seven thick photo albums stood side by side. And Cassandra said, scrapbooks. I'm getting a real impression about what kind of woman your wife was. He chuckled again, and this time it didn't hurt so bad. You don't scrapbook? She puffed out her cheeks. No. He grabbed the first, the one with swirling gold script that said, Our Wedding, and opened it to the first page. Yep, she's beautiful. I just knew she would be. And look at you, so young. I was 25. You both look like babies. He looked, and they did. They looked young and fresh. The bridal party flanked them, and he realized with a jolt how young his father looked, how old he looked now, how tired. His brothers stood next to him in the photo, his sister in her bridesmaid dress, all of them so happy, so together. Brady had lost more than just his wife and son on that stretch of road. Cassandra flipped the page, laughing and pointing. Is that an ice swan? When he nodded, she said, oh, please tell me there were doves too. I don't remember having doves, but I didn't remember the ice swan either. Then I will hold out hope. She sat down at the desk, flipping pages, pointing to people and asking who they were, laughing at the funny things that grabbed her. Brady stood right behind her, answering when he could. He didn't know how he was going to make it through seven scrapbooks full of memories. One for their wedding, one for every year of their marriage, and one named Baby. He knew before Cassandra opened it that the first picture was of the pregnancy test. He remembered how his gut had dropped when Samantha had shown it to him, remembering laughing when she'd taken a picture of it and knew that must have been a time when he hadn't been using much, precisely because he could remember it. He did remember the first ultrasound, when they told him it was a boy. And when Cassandra twisted the album this way and that, trying to make it out, he still couldn't see it. Could hardly see that it was a baby, let alone a boy. There were pictures of Samantha getting bigger and bigger. Pictures of the baby shower, Samantha surrounded in little blue clothes and gifts. He pointed at the next picture. She yelled at me for taking that last one, said she didn't want to remember when she was that big and awkward. She still looks beautiful. Cassandra flicked her eyes back at Brady. And I could call her something here, but I won't, so brownie points. She turned the page before Brady could say anything, and then he couldn't say anything. The very first picture of Charlie, screaming and hugged tight to his mother's chest. Samantha's smile so wide, the tears flowing down her cheeks. Brady walked away from that picture. He walked over to the window and stared out at the brightly lit pool. Cassandra's arm slid around him, and she laid her head against his back, and Brady didn't like it. Not here, not in his home, his wife's home. He pushed her arms off. How can the end not change what came before, Cassandra? How can I not look at that picture and not remember what happened to him? Just look at the picture and remember him on that day. Remember holding him in your arms. Remember how he smelled. Remember how he cried on that day. You know what I remember about that day? You know what I remember about all those important days? I remember that little baggie sitting in my pocket. I remember the feel of the bottle in my hand. He didn't know when he'd started using, just knew it was sometime in college. Couldn't remember why, it was just the thing to do. He couldn't know how many of the pictures he'd just looked at had been of him high. He would guess most of them were, because that was how he usually celebrated back then. And he wouldn't have called himself a user or a drunk until he'd been chained to a hospital bed 
dying because he couldn't get a hit, screaming and sweating, and unable to remember what had happened, what he'd done, because of the drugs he'd been on and the alcohol he'd washed them down with. Her arms came back around his waist, and she hugged him tight, squeezed her hands together so he couldn't push her off. You don't remember holding him at all? You don't want me to remember that other part? The reason for my misery? You live in misery, Brady. Tonight's for the good memories. The good memories hurt just as bad. And it was so long ago, so clouded. But he closed his eyes and tried to remember. I remember them wiping him down. He was blue and purple and covered in gunk. And they were so rough. And Samantha just held him and cried. She'd been screaming and in pain. And then she was laughing and crying. Sounds horrible. It had been horrible. And he didn't know how his wife could have even imagined doing it again. But he remembered it had been wonderful, too. Horrible and wonderful. And wasn't that the very definition of life? For a moment, he could almost understand it, could almost hear what Cassandra had been telling him over and over again. The horrible parts couldn't undo what was wonderful. You just had to get through it. Life's a bitch. What's next? Brady hadn't wanted a next. He didn't know why he'd been given one. He didn't know why he hadn't been given another one when he'd refused to do anything with the first one. But he looked down at Cassandra's arms, wrapped tight around his waist, and knew she was his next. He said, There's a pen holder on the desk where I used to hide drugs. She turned in his arms, forcing her to let him loose. She looked where he was pointing, and he pushed her toward the desk softly. When she picked it up, Brady could feel it in his hand, remembered what it felt like, how heavy it was. Cassandra took out the pens, looked inside, flipped it upside down. Brady stayed by the window and watched her. Smack it a few times. She did, harder and harder, until the false bottom fell out. No little baggies fell with it, and Brady started breathing again. Cassandra picked up the false bottom. Creative. Users are. She looked at him, and he said, I still want it. Every once in a while, it'll just hit me. I'll visit a place or see an old friend. I'll watch an old movie that reminds me of college. And I'll remember how good it felt. And I'll want it. Want it so bad that want just doesn't describe it. And the only reason I don't is because I tell myself I can still feel her blood. I can still hear his screams. I can't forgive myself. If I forgive myself, I will go back to that. He closed his eyes. I will do it again, to someone else's child, someone else's wife. I can't forget. I can't forgive. He waited. Waited for her arms to slide around him again. To tell him that he wouldn't. That she believed in him. That she loved him. That's what his wife had always told him. And he'd believed her. But when he opened his eyes, Cassandra was still by the desk, watching him and Brady knew why he could relax around her, why he could sleep, why he didn't need his nightmares when she was with him. Cassandra had already given her, no matter what, love away. She looked down at the false bottom, still in her hand, and Brady said, You won't forgive me, right? I come home a little drunk, a little high. You won't forgive me. There won't be any second chances. You won't love me no matter what, because you already love Shane like that. Cassandra dropped the false bottom in the trash and came toward him. She stopped a foot away and said, I won't forgive you, no matter what. He whispered, My wife would have. She would have forgiven me even that. Cassandra nodded. You said she was an angel. He nodded back at the woman in front of him. No angel just a woman who knew how to do no matter what. Brady closed his eyes, relaxing into his peace, finally sure he could remember the good memories, not afraid to lose the bad memories. He could find out what was next for him, 
he could sleep lying down in bed and not need his nightmares. He had Cassandra. She would never forgive him, no matter what. Her arms slid around him. Her chin rested on his chest. He opened his eyes slowly, carefully. She said, your cleaning service is going to freak out when they see those pens littering your desk. And Brady laughed. Chapter 7 Shane liked to think of himself as a glass half full kind of guy. He liked to think he looked for the good in people while making fun of the bad because, well, life was short. And when he'd looked into Christian's eyes and decided that this was it, he'd known there would be bad with the good. He just hadn't been prepared for a siege, hadn't been prepared for the bad to be never ending. He said, Please, God, make it stop. Christian turned, looking over his shoulder into the full-length mirror in the oh-so-cute boutique they'd passed and then turned right back around to enter, because a man never had too many clothes. In his closet, on his body, was a different matter. And that just wasn't something he could say to Christian yet. Where was Cassandra when he needed her? Shane let Christian admire himself, and went to find something wearable instead of the swill his beloved kept picking out. He grabbed a shirt, not plaid, not button-up, and brought it back. He held it up and said, what color is this? Christian cocked his head, taking a moment to get it right. I'd call it eggplant. You are gay, gay. Go put that blue checkered shirt back right now. We have standards. Christian glanced around the store guiltily, then glared at Shane and hissed, stop it. Shane glared back. No one cares. Half the men in here are gay. Another quarter are metro who wish they were gay. And the rest are pussy whipped. Christian turned away, hiding the blush on his cheeks. He muttered, and yet this shirt is on sale here. That shirt is meant to be worn ironically. I like it. You don't. Shane wiggled the hanger he was holding, tempting with eggplant. You like this. Christian's eyes darted to the shirt, and then back to the godforsaken monstrosity he was wearing. His chin went up, and he said, I like this. Gah, you are so stubborn. Shane came up behind Christian, holding the shirt up in front of Christian's chest, and pulling it this way and that. You like this. Shane cocked his head. It's a terrible color for you, but you like it. I'd go with a light pink or coral. You'd look amazing in coral, but I'll compromise with eggplant. Christian whispered, Shane. Shane whispered back, you can try on the eggplant, or I can go find something in coral for you. Maybe a pair of swim shorts that don't hide anything. Christian grabbed the shirt and ran into the dressing stall. Shane went back to browsing while he waited, finding a few more shirts for Christian to try on, and a few for himself. Shane glanced at his watch, knowing for a fact that it didn't take 10 minutes to change shirts, then slowly made his way back to the dressing area. Christian? Christian's voice floated over the door. I don't like this. It's a terrible color for me. Agreed, but come out so I can see you in something besides plaid. I'm getting tingly just thinking about it. Christian didn't come out. You're not even going to show me? No. Shane flung a shirt over the door. You need bright colors, beachy colors. Luckily, we live in LA and beach colors are everywhere. Shane flung the aqua blue shirt back over the door without a word. Shane pushed it back over. You are sticking out like a sore thumb in that costume of yours. It's embarrassing. I'm embarrassing you? Your shirt is embarrassing me. I lived with the swim shorts big enough to fit you, me, and Cassandra. I won't even touch those khaki cargos because I'd die a thousand deaths if I saw you in a pair of skinny jeans. But please. The shirt, please, the shirt. You don't know what you're asking me to do, Shane. He knew, he knew what he was asking. 
He was asking for a proclamation. He was asking for Christian to announce to the world that he was gay. He knew that's what Christian thought he was asking him to do by wearing color. It's a shirt, Christian. That's all it is. A gorgeous shirt that does not have buttons. When the door opened a little while later, Shane might have gasped at what he saw, at how the color brought out Christian's eyes, and how the material outlined farm boy pecs. Shane whispered, gorgeous. Christian shut the door, and when he came out a few minutes later, he was back in his plaid button-up. This is who I am, in public. Can you love even that? Shane pushed down his disappointment. I love even that. That stopped Christian, and he stood there, looking down at the aqua blue shirt in his hands. It is a gorgeous shirt. It is. And Shane bit his tongue, didn't say anything more, because he remembered something about a horse and water and drinking. The exact phrase eluded him, but he knew Christian had to do it himself. Christian hung the shirt up on the rack, and Shane grabbed for it. Then I'll buy it, just for the weekends, when you're at home and comfortable. He'd just keep leading his horse to water, as often as he needed to. Two could play that stubborn game. He bought the shirt to protests, ignoring Christian until he was out the door. Out the door and mad, for some reason furious. He whirled back to Christian, holding out his hands, one with the shopping bag swinging in it. You won't wear a shirt. You'll never hold my hand out in public, will you? We'll always be this, won't we? A gay man and his friend who must be straight because he has no fashion sense whatsoever. That's what you're protecting when you won't wear a shirt. Christian looked alarmed. Not here, Shane, please. You're protecting your image. God knows why you'll even be seen with me. I must be so embarrassing to you. He turned in a circle, his arms still out wide, showing Christian that nothing would happen. No one would look at them. No one would be shocked. Not here. Not in this strip of boutiques in L.A. When he was looking back into Christian's embarrassed eyes, he said, This is who I am. Will you love even that? Because, damn it, he wanted that proclamation. He wanted the words, out in public, out loud and he knew he'd never get them from Christian. Shane fell against the building, looking down at his feet. He sighed, I'll make you a deal. Here, in LA, where you can't throw a beach ball without hitting a gay or lesbian couple, we will be out. And when we go to Utah to meet your family, I will be your friend, who has a girlfriend. He pulled out his phone, flipping it to a picture of Cassandra and holding it out to Christian who has a picture of his girlfriend, even. The classic beard. She's not my beard because I'm not hiding. She's your beard. No, that's not right. She's my beard for you. She's my beard because you're hiding. She should be your beard. Christian started laughing, coming to lean against the wall next to Shane. He looked down at the phone, at Cassandra, who was loved at Cassandra, who would probably have a few choice words about being anyone's beard, let alone his. Christian said, just when I start thinking this is never going to work between us, you do something that makes me never want to let you go. Shane's head came up, and he turned his head slowly toward Christian. The feeling is mutual. Christian said sadly, it's never going to work between us. It would work if you would simply put the shirt on. I know you're joking, but that's what I'm talking about. What you want, I can't do. Shane said, I'm only kind of joking. All my problems with us would disappear if you would just take this ugly shirt off. Christian shook his head, rolling his eyes at Shane. And Shane said, I don't know why you are so afraid of people knowing that you're gay. It was the second time Shane had said that today, maybe even the third. Third time to call him gay, and Christian's stomach still turned at it. 
How could Shane not be afraid? How could he not be ashamed? Shane watched people walk by and said, if everyone disappeared off the face of the earth and it was only you and me forever, which shirt would you wear? You are really hung up on the shirt. It's your symbol. It's the flag you wave to show everyone that you are what they want you to be. I hate it because no one cares. Some people care. Name one. Christian ticked up fingers as he said, my dad, my mom, my three brothers and my sister, my two grandfathers, my grandma, my umpteen nieces and nephews, my aunts and uncles and cousins, my friends back home. You think they would all care that you were gay? Yes. And they'd do what about it? What level of care are we talking about? Whispers at family reunions when you show up with your boyfriend? Beat it out of the both of us when they see us kiss? Christian folded his arms. No, they wouldn't try to beat it out of me, or us. Then why are you afraid? Because I don't want to disappoint them. I'm not afraid of them, I just don't want to hurt them. Because Christian knew what disappointment looked like on his family's collective face. He'd seen it. He'd heard that awful silence and could imagine it even now. Because he was afraid they already thought he was gay. Because he was afraid it was something you couldn't hide, no matter what kind of shirt you wore. Shane said, it must really suck to be born into a family where so much is expected. To want to please those you love and continually fail at it. Because the expectations are impossible to live up to. That's how it is for everyone. All parents have expectations for their children. No, it's not like that for everyone. I forget sometimes how lucky I am. He sighed. And I don't want us to be like that. Christian looked at the expression on Shane's face and laughed. You're talking about the shirt now, aren't you? If you have to wear those ugly shirts to be happy, then okay. I love you. Not... I'll still love you, not I love you anyway, but I love you because you wear those ugly shirts. And I will make fun of you for it, absolutely. But I won't take it as a sign that you don't love me. Good, because that's not what it's saying. Shane grabbed his own shirt, pulling it from his body and saying, and this fashionably colored shirt doesn't say I don't love you. The smile started, before Christian could call it back, before he could even think what it meant to be smiling stupidly at the man next to him. He looked this way and that, at the people passing them, and saw that Shane was right. No one here cared. His family would. He wasn't wrong about that. But here in L.A., where the sun shone and the people were busy with their own lives, no one cared. And here in L.A., where his family didn't live and couldn't be hurt, Christian smiled at the man he loved. Shane held the phone up and snapped a picture of Christian before he even knew what was going on. Now I have a picture of both the people that I love, my friend Christian and his lovely girlfriend slash beard, Cassandra. I need a new phone. These pictures are terrible. And FYI, don't take it as a sign that I don't love you if I accidentally burn this shirt. I can find better looking plaid than this. His eyes lit up, and he pulled Christian from the wall. I know a store. We might be able to find something. Shane's warm hand was on Christian's arm, pulling him toward another hellish round of shopping, and Christian was pretty sure neon plaid. Christian took the phone from Shane, as he was pulled along, looking at the picture that was worth a thousand words. And Christian said, I'd wear the aquamarine shirt. What? If it was just you and me, forever? I'd wear the aquamarine shirt. Shane blew out his breath and said, I knew it. The shirt wasn't neon plaid although it was brighter and beachier than Christian was used to. And while it did feel like a step in some direction he wasn't sure he was ready for, he did look good. He looked good, and he knew it. And he hated that. 
but he could wear it in L.A. and not stick out like a sore thumb. He could even wear it to a Sunday dinner at Cassandra's. And Christian almost laughed at calling their gathering a Sunday dinner, almost forgot about the dread that would surely be involved at a Sunday dinner at Cassandra's. He'd grown up with Sunday dinners, a night when all the family came home to pot roast, sweet potatoes, pie, if his dad could be talked into it at church in the morning. His mom had always refused to make pie crust, always said just because she hated pie crust didn't mean she loved her family any less. Just meant dad was the one to make it. And Christian had loved that too, had loved how they were a team, had always wanted his own team. But there had been dread at those family dinners as well. Dread was just a feeling Christian wasn't ever going to get away from. It was inside him. Shane pushed his key into Cassandra's front door, saying over his shoulder, she's going to love it, the color. Christian wasn't sure if Shane was blind where Cassandra was concerned, or just insanely optimistic. But Christian wasn't going to hold his breath waiting for Cassandra to love anything about him. Just Christian's lot in life that he'd fallen in love with a man who already had his team. Shane called out, singing, Cass, we went shopping. A soft, in the bedroom, called back, and they followed her voice, Shane jabbering nonstop, and Christian wondered if maybe he wasn't so blind where she was concerned after all. Christian was used to dread and feeling out of place and slightly unwelcome. He was just wondering why dinner was here and not at the penthouse. Did a penthouse get old? When they entered the bedroom, Brady was getting out of the bed. A naked, clearly I'm in the middle of something Brady was just standing up. And he walked past them, calmly and unconcerned to the bathroom. The blood rushed out of Christian's head, and for a second he thought he was going to faint. Cassandra smirked at them and stretched. He works out. Shane gurgled. Christian focused his eyes on Cassandra, only slightly less embarrassed at finding the sheet outlining her body, and said, I'll wait out in the living room. And since he had no delusions about Cassandra, he knew that had been her plan all along. Didn't even need to see the sparkle in her eye to know it. Shane was standing there, mouth gaping open, eyes glazed. Christian heard him say to himself, how can he be a shower and a grower? Christian went to pour himself a tall, cold glass of anything. Shane shook himself and sat down on the bed gently. You didn't say he was going to be here. I might have come in a little slower if I'd known. No, you wouldn't have. You would have been sneaky, trying to get a peek of what you just saw full on. And where else would he be? Shane whimpered again. Working? I just didn't think Sunday night dinner included him, if it wasn't at his penthouse. It includes him. He sighed, and Cassandra said, it includes Christian. Slightly different, don't you think? And just to let you know, Unlimited sex with an outrageously hung man makes you mean. Cassandra stretched again, closing her eyes. Just to let you know, getting interrupted in the middle of unlimited sex with an outrageously hung man is what makes me mean. Shane patted her leg and stood. And you're forgiven. That would make anyone slightly cranky. Next time I'll text so you know we're on our way. Now get dressed. We're doing barbecue tonight. You know how to barbecue? Since when? Christian knows how. He would. Shane walked to the door, pulling the door shut behind him as he said, you just finish up in there so you can come out and be pleasant. Pleasanter, at least. She didn't want to be more pleasant. Wasn't going to finish. And then Brady came back in before she got her pants on and helped with that anyway but damned if she'd admit it made her any less mean. Christian knew how to barbecue. Shrimp that melted in the mouth when Cassandra hadn't even known you could barbecue shrimp. Corn, seared and sweet, and she groaned as the kernels popped as her teeth bit into them. She nearly kissed Christian right on the mouth, 
that's how good the barbecue was. He said, your barbecue looks like it's never been used before. Her mouth was too full to answer, so she just grunted. She lived in California, she had a barbecue. It had just never been inaugurated. Shane said, all you need to do is keep her mouth full of barbecue and no one will question whether she's your real girlfriend. Beards don't look like they want to eat you up. Cassandra choked on her corn, and Christian cried, no, don't tell her. You want me to be his what? Just for his family, Cass. I thought you could be my girlfriend, but realized, ha, huh, no one would believe that. Brady looked at the murderous glint in Cassandra's eyes and held up a finger. Problem. Cassandra said, lots of problems. She's already taken. Shane turned to him. She is? Cassandra folded her arms. I am? Brady nodded. F.A.'s woman, he said, making Cassandra chuckle. And she forgot about Christian long enough for him to get on the other side of the dining room table. Christian, safe with some distance between them, said, it was a joke. Shane showed me a picture on his phone and it just popped out that you were his beard, not mine. All the warm fuzzy from the barbecue disappeared from Cassandra's veins. It's not a joke to be ashamed of who you are. Christian shook his head. No, and no one said anything. Not even Cassandra could say anything to that. He said, I'm sorry, don't apologize. Shane said softly, Cass. She pushed her chair back. I tried, Shane. I tried, but I can't like him. I can't let him bring this into your life. It's apologetic shame. She jabbed her finger in Christian's direction. He goes, I'm using my veto. Shane sucked in a breath, and Christian just stood there. Brady speared another piece of shrimp and ate it. The longer the silence lengthened, the more the knot in Cassandra's stomach tightened. Mean. She was mean. It wasn't interrupted sex that made her mean. It was seeing what Shane had fallen in love with. It was knowing she wasn't anything like that, and she'd never had a chance. Not even if the fates had been kind. Not even if all their stars had aligned. Shane would never have chosen her. She was his best friend, not love. She said, get out, everyone. Cass, get out. Cass, let's just talk. She grabbed the edge of the table, shrieking as she flipped it on its side. The dishes and food went spilling, Shane and Christian jumping out of the way. Brady looked at the corn sitting in his lap and said, man. She huffed and puffed and stared at Shane. I'm using my veto. Cass. Before he could finish, before he could tell her that her veto was worthless, she said, get out. Christian headed for the door, and she sneered at his back, then turned back to Shane and waited, waited for him to choose. He said softly, I'll call you, we'll talk. He followed Christian, and when he closed the door behind them, all she saw was Christian. All she saw was the sorry in his eyes, not triumph, not glory. He felt sorry for her, sorry that she'd lost when he hadn't even been playing. Brady stood up, blocking her way before she'd taken even one step. The rage and hurt was swallowing her, and she said through tight lips, get out, Brady. No. He wrapped his arms around her, absorbing her blows as if he didn't even feel them. He held her tight, and she wanted to scream at him. She wanted to be alone. She was alone. Why couldn't he just leave her alone? He said softly, life's a bitch. It was, just one gigantic bitch. When her punches slowed, he trapped her arms to her side, squeezing and lifting her. She groaned, I don't want sex right now. But he didn't carry her to the bedroom. He carried her to the front door. She stiffened because she knew they were still here, still outside. She struggled against him and he squeezed tighter. He whispered into her ear, listen, and she shook her head. She wouldn't listen to them. She couldn't listen over the hurt of her heart and the anger in her blood. But he squeezed her, 
tighter and tighter, until she wasn't fighting her ears. She just wanted to breathe. Their voices floated through the open window, their bodies just out of sight. I don't want to come between you two. You're not. She's my Cassandra, and I love her, but not more than you. She'll come around. She's just having a hard time accepting what is. Cassandra would have gasped if she'd had breath to spare. She couldn't accept what was? And Shane was either dismissing her completely or knew her really well. Would she give up Shane if he wouldn't give up Christian? Christian paused. Why did you choose me? I love you. Cassandra screamed inside her head. Why? Why do you love him? And Christian said, why? Why do you love me? Cassandra closed her eyes, stopped fighting. Stopped fighting Brady's arms around her, just stopped. She knew without seeing that Shane had wrapped his arms tight around Christian, had heard in Christian's voice that he didn't think there was anything to love. And Shane would be whispering every little thing that he loved about Christian into his ear. Christian would be stiff in his arms, pushing at the contact, pushing at the words, because he wouldn't believe them. But he would someday. Someday, he would wear a bright shirt without being self-conscious about it. Someday, he wouldn't flinch when anyone touched him accidentally. Someday, he wouldn't be ashamed. Shane would give that to him with his love. Brady's arms loosened enough for her to take a deep breath, but she didn't move away. Just let his heat warm that cold place inside her. She didn't stop the tears, just let them flow silent and hot down her cheeks. Christian said, it's not going to be much better when you meet my family. Shane laughed. I really, really doubt that. I make them uncomfortable, so I don't go home often. And what are you going to tell them about me? Christian didn't answer, and Cassandra turned away from the window, pushing at Brady. She didn't want to hear any more. Didn't want to hear Shane getting hurt again and again. Christian finally said, You're asking me to choose between you and my family. I want you to choose between a painful truth or an unhappy lie. A painful truth or an unhappy lie. Why were those the only options in life? Shane said, This love is true. I don't understand why, but I know that choosing us, choosing love will hurt you. It will hurt others that you love. And I know that if you deny who you are, deny us, then you will never be happy. You can't be happy lying to yourself. I don't think happy is possible for me. Cassandra wasn't sure happy was possible for her, either. Brady wiped a tear from Cassandra's cheek, and Cassandra looked into Brady's dark eyes. Shane said, I would take all your hurt if I could. I would share it if you'd let me. Cassandra whispered, can't it be a happy lie? Brady's chest rumbled against her, and he took a step backwards. Might as well be. Might as well be. She just would have to come up with a lie that was happy. What had Brady said? Half of him plus half of Shane was as close as she was going to get? Half of him plus half of Shane was almost enough. Half of him plus half of Shane plus a smidgen of Christian? She said, ugh. Brady took another step backwards and said, stop thinking about him. And what should I think about? His shrimp. Do you think if we rinse it off, we can still eat it? Cassandra thought about it, then nodded. It was good shrimp. Shane pulled up to the house early the next morning, as Brady was leaving for work. Cassandra stood in the doorway, watching as Brady nodded at Shane, watching as Brady got in his car and left without pause. Cassandra knew that if Christian had come too, Brady would have stayed. She was pretty sure he'd been protecting Christian when he got between the two of them. But he didn't need to protect Shane. Cassandra folded her arms and said, You're going to be late for work. I'll talk while you get ready. You'll just listen. 
She'd listened plenty yesterday. She didn't want to listen anymore. I'm not ready, Shane. Not ready to listen, not ready to like him. Not ready to be replaced. He's not replacing you. He's not taking over any part you hold sway over. He's joining you. Between the two of you, my life is perfect. If you'd stop trying to chase him off. He's the kind of person who can be chased off. That's why I'm trying. Then why is he still here? He's stronger than you think. He's more than you think. She was pretty sure he wasn't. I love him, Cassandra. I love Christian. The end. Are you trying to kill me? No, I'm trying to get you to accept it. She couldn't accept what was. Exactly what she hated about Christian. He's good people, Cass. Every bone in his body is good. He makes me want to be good. She said, ugh. He laughed. He's the angel on my right shoulder. You're the devil on my left. He whispers to me to be good. You whisper to me to live. I need you both. He's going to hurt you. Shane shook his head. He's good people. He won't hurt me. You won't hurt me for a different reason. You love me and that means everything to you. She did. And it did. He said, I love you, Cass. The end. And that meant everything to her. She'd do anything for those she loved. Do anything for those who loved her back. What do you want from me, Shane? I just can't start liking him. You don't have to like him, you just have to accept him. She could see Shane turning into good people. Could see something different in him, now that there was Christian. She'd liked him just fine before. She was afraid that she wouldn't like him if he changed too much. And she wasn't afraid of that at all. It wouldn't happen. She sat down on her front stoop and watched cars drive off to work. She was going to be late, and she just didn't care. Shane sat down next to her, looking at his flowers. They'd suffered these last few weeks and looked it. You know what my vision of the future is? Flying cars and phone chips in our brains? It's going to happen. You know it. She laughed with him because it was totally going to happen. He said, but before that. She shook her head. She didn't think about the future. She trained it out of herself. Sunday barbecues, Tuesday night D&D, &D, shopping expeditions, more people who we love just means more fun. I think it just means a third wheel. Lots of great things of third wheels. Tricycles, the Reliant Regal. Those three-wheeled cars are funny, not great. They're different and special, and only for a select few. Only for those who can appreciate not normal. They'd never been normal. She'd never wanted normal. She said, what about Brady? Shane reached down to deadhead a flower, twirling it between his fingers. You like him. He was just supposed to be a distraction, but you like him. She perked up. And are you being unreasonably jealous about it? It wouldn't be hard to. I just think of walking in on you two yesterday morning. She butted him with her shoulder, and he said, If you had found him first, I would be. But I can't let myself feel even a twinge when I'm asking you to do the same thing with Christian. He would have, before Christian. He wouldn't have cared about fair or being right. He just would have been jealous and wouldn't have tried to be good. She said, What's going to happen when you've transformed into good people and I haven't? I think there's a cap on how good I can be, especially when you're sitting on my shoulder. I'm not getting off. You're not allowed to. He put an arm around her shoulder and their heads knocked together. I love you, Cass. My first friend, my best friend, my good friend. Your bad friend. He smiled. My worst friend. She smiled back. When he was tired of trying to be good, he would always have her. I love you, Shane. He held up his pinky, and she hooked her own through it. She looked at the wilted flowers in front of her house. You need to fix your garden. Christian and I will come Saturday morning, 
and replace them all. She would have to accept that there wasn't just Shane anymore. There was only Shane and Christian. She couldn't have one without the other, and she wouldn't give up the one. Shane squeezed her pinky. He wouldn't let her give up the one. She squeezed back. I'm still going to make fun of his clothes. Of course, we have got to get him out of that plaid. The smile came and went between them. She had Shane on her shoulder, too. She didn't need anyone on the other. Didn't want an angel over there. She thought about putting Brady over there and chuckled. She could have a devil trying to be good on one shoulder and blackness on the other. Almost made her smile again. Almost made her happy. Which wasn't a lie. She was happy when she was with Brady. Even when her clothes were on. She was happy when she was with Shane. Oh, shit. Was that the lie she had to be happy with? That she was happy when she was with Christian? She said, I'll accept him, but I won't like him and I won't be happy about it. He makes good shrimp. You have got to be kidding. Shane shrugged. You'll like him one day. I'm just giving you a place to start. She closed her eyes. She didn't think about Christian. She didn't think about the thousand and one things that irritated her. She just thought about his shrimp. And she said, he does make good shrimp. And corn. She nodded in agreement. Great corn. The things you don't like about him will go away. And maybe that's what she hated most about him. Shane would burn all those things away with his love, and she'd have no reason to hate Christian. And then she'd have to like him. And then she'd start trying to be good. But then she realized it was okay. She'd put Brady on the other shoulder for now. Put a definite cap on how good she could be. They would be okay. Cassandra was eating off Brady's chest again. Dip, 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 crunch. He kept his eyes closed, listened to the soft sounds of some Sunday movie on the TV. They'd stayed at the hotel this weekend, alone. No one had been invited to join them, and Brady hadn't minded. He didn't mind either way. Cassandra was just as entertaining as a Sunday movie when her feathers were ruffled, but he knew drama could be overwhelming when it was nonstop. Dip, 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 crunch. Last weekend, he'd video conferenced from Cassandra's living room, tried not to get distracted, and failed miserably when she'd done a striptease across the dining room table. He'd hoped that she wouldn't flash his family accidentally or on purpose, and then he'd smiled at the thought. His father had stopped talking. His brother Marshall had said, Brady? Cassandra had wiggled, and Brady had cleared his throat, forcing his attention back to the screen. I'm out of the office, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Cassandra had opened her mouth, and he'd shot her a look, not ready for his family to hear anything she would say. Dip, 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 crunch. He opened one eye a crack to find Cassandra looking at him. He murmured, you're getting bored. I've seen this movie before. You could go out to the pool. She thought about it, then leaned down to lick a drop of salsa off his skin. Are you going to come with me? I have a meeting in an hour. And he needed to take a shower and wash the salt and crumbs off. He didn't know why she thought his chest worked as a table. He didn't know why he just didn't tell her no. Except there was something so relaxing in having her snuggled up to him. He didn't want her over at the table. And then you're going on your drive? He thought about going on his drive, thought about going home and letting Cassandra play in that pool. He thought about maybe calling up his brother early and saying, he didn't know what, except hello. Hello, and he was sorry. He'd been thinking of those photo albums, remembering. He'd thought he'd died six years ago. He was surprised to learn that he hadn't. He was surprised to find he was glad he hadn't. I was thinking of selling the house. 
Cassandra dipped. She crunched. She said, I think there's someone you need to talk to about that. He opened both eyes. Who? Samantha. The unexpectedness of her name hit him in the chest. And either Cassandra didn't hear his breath rush out, or she just ignored it to say, I was thinking of going out to the graves today. Say hello. You could come and tell her that you're thinking of selling the house. He pushed her off his chest and sat up, the chips falling to the bed and the salsa splattering on the sheets. You don't know anything about their graves. His voice was as tight as glass right before it cracked. His fists clenched like right before they shed blood. He stared down at them. She swiped at the salsa stain. I'm so embarrassed, she said, not sounding embarrassed at all. What will housekeeping think we do in here? He closed his eyes and said softly, don't talk about them. No. His fists spasmed. Leave it alone, Cassandra. You mean like how you always leave it alone? When I want to put my fist through Christian's good face? That's different. No, it's our dynamic. You get in my way, I push you out of yours. And I'll keep pushing because you can't sell your house without talking to your wife about it. It is just not done. She's dead. He whirled on her. She is dead. Oh, Brady. I don't know why she has to be dead in here, too. She knelt on the bed, reaching across to pat his naked chest. He pulled away, heading for the bathroom and locking the door behind him. She couldn't leave him alone, couldn't let him have one peaceful Sunday. There always had to be drama. If it wasn't hers, it was his. He showered, and when he came out to dress, he didn't look at her, didn't say a word but he felt her eyes on him the whole time. Felt her eyes on him as he walked out the door. Chapter Eight Brady's office door opened 10 minutes later. He didn't look up, didn't need to. There was only one person in this hotel who would dare open his door when it was shut. You don't know when to quit. That is true. Quit is a four-letter word. You love four-letter words. She smiled when he looked up, walking over to his bookshelves and fingering a book. That is true, too. Guess it's not a four-letter word. You can't stay in here during my meeting. Why not? You're distracting. I'll keep my clothes on this time. That would only partly help. He said, I'm sorry. She looked at him over her shoulder, an eyebrow cocked, and Brady said, I should have stayed to fight. That would have definitely been more fun for me, but an apology is not what I want. His computer pinged, early. He looked at the screen, at his brother's name. If I tell you I'll go with you to their graves, will you leave me in peace for the next hour? She thought about it. It took her a long time to think about it longer than he really thought necessary, and he was just wondering if he was going to have to carry her out of his office when she nodded. She finally said, is this your meeting? Yes. She smiled at his hesitation, and he said before she could say anything, it's my brother, the rest will call any minute. She waved at his computer magnanimously, and he almost called her your majesty again, for old time's sake but she meandered slowly to the door, and Brady answered the call instead. Brady, wasn't sure if I could catch you early, but I thought I'd try. Marshall? You were different last week. I wanted to talk, see how you were doing. I'm doing better. Brady looked up at Cassandra, her hand on the doorknob but watching him, listening. Marshall said, I'm glad. Brady looked back at him, really looked. Every week Brady had seen, but he'd never looked. How's Gretchen and the kids? They're good, Peyton starts junior peewee this year. I'd like to see some pictures. Marshall nodded. I'll email you some. And then stopped as Cassandra propped her head on Brady's shoulder and gave a little finger wave at the screen. 
Hello. And this is why you've been different lately. She was why he'd been different lately. Cassandra is distracting, Marshall said. Distracted and almost happy. Cassandra smiled. It's the sex. Brady closed his eyes in pain, and Marshall chuckled. It usually is. Brady said, she was just leaving. She patted his shoulder. I'll go bug Rodrigo until you're ready to go. We're going to say hello to Samantha and Charlie after the meeting. Bring some flowers. Brady pushed out a long breath. She pushes every button I have. No one said anything, and when Brady opened his eyes again, Marshall was smiling. Good. Cassandra looked at that smile and poked Brady. He looks just like you. If you didn't have an extra hundred pounds of muscle here, here, and here. Marshall nodded. Everyone thought we were twins growing up. I don't think anyone would think that now. Funny how overdosing on weights will do that. It's his drug of choice now. How did she know that? Brady opened his mouth to wrest control of the conversation, and his computer pinged again. He stared and said slowly, it's dad. Early, Marshall smiled. We're all glad you're back, bro. I'll call back for the meeting. His screen went dark, and Brady just kept staring at the computer. You're going to have to leave. Cassandra pulled her chin off his chest. I'll go see if I can get Rodrigo to give me the keys to your Z. And Brady wished she'd fought with him. Wished he'd had an excuse not to answer. Wished he didn't have to feel this horrible pain of coming back to life. Being dead was easier. When the door closed behind her, he answered the call. The flowers were like a dead weight on his lap. The smell was sweet and fresh, and he didn't think it was appropriate. They should be scentless, plastic. They shouldn't make him think of new life when he was going to put them on a grave. Cassandra had been behind the wheel in the Z, the flowers in the seat next to her, when he'd come out from his meeting. Rodrigo arguing with her about something through the open window and grinning at her flip answers. He'd held the passenger door open for Brady, grabbing the flowers and passing them in when Brady was settled. Rodrigo hadn't said anything, just tapped the top of the car when the door was shut and jumped back when Cassandra revved the engine. She hadn't said a word on the drive over, hadn't tried to distract him at all, hadn't asked about his father, and Brady thought just maybe she did know when to leave things alone. Maybe she could tell that his relationship with his father was more complicated than the rest. Or maybe she just thought that visiting the graves of his family was enough drama for right now. She pulled into a slot at the cemetery, and when the sound of the engine died, she said, don't ever tell this to Rodrigo, but my car's better. Brady just looked out the window, looked at the gravestones, some tall, some set into the grass, and wondered which ones he was searching for, not even knowing where they were buried. He hadn't gone to their funeral. He'd been a suicide risk, no bail. He cleared his throat. I don't even know where to even start. Cassandra opened her door, pulling a paper from her back pocket. Start with the map. Start with this large area blocked off for Roberts. He got out with her, coming around to look down at it, and suddenly remembering when his grandfather had died and he'd been buried in the family plot. I should have known. Sometimes we just don't want to. They walked slowly across the grass, careful to walk between the gravestones, he had to keep looking at the map, reading inscriptions as he passed. So much death, so inevitable. But the cemetery was unexpectedly peaceful. The grass was green, and the farther they walked, the quieter it got. The sounds of cars and busyness fading. Brady had thought it would be painful to be here, but it wasn't. And when they found what they were looking for, Brady was glad for the flowers. Glad they smelled beautiful and looked fresh. Samantha would like them. 
The black marble shone in the sunlight, clean and well cared for, and Brady put the flowers in their place. A large R was scrolled intricately above his last name, his wife and son's names and dates carved into the stone. The left side smooth, waiting. Cassandra said, that's kind of horrifying. He laughed because it wasn't. It wasn't horrifying at all. That's exactly where he wanted to be buried. Had his father known that? I'll go wait in the car, she said, and Brady shook his head. She's not here, Cassandra. Cassandra listened to the peace and quiet, and she must have felt what he felt, because she said, I know, she's off in heaven with the other angels, but she'll still get your message. He looked down at the black marble, and then he looked up at the blue, blue sky. No clouds today. The smog pushed inland. He took a deep breath and smelled grass. He smelled flowers. He wasn't dead. He hadn't been dead these last few years, and he'd hurt too bad to be dead. He thought, standing here, that death wouldn't hurt. Death would be a release. Death would be peaceful. Brady said, she's not going to care about the house. He looked at Cassandra's short, choppy hair, so carefully spiked, at her hands stuffed into her pockets, pushing at him until she didn't need to. She won't care about you. Cassandra laughed. <laughs> nice. You know what I mean. She's happy. She wants me to be happy. She whispered, yeah. That's what love is, and she loves me. Cassandra smiled at him, happy for him. He said, do you want me to be happy? Cassandra froze. Uh. He looked down again at that smooth marble waiting for his name. I don't want your heart. That's good, because I've already given it away. I won't ask for it back. Brady couldn't ask for his back even if he wanted to, and he didn't. Do you think there's a word for two people who've given their hearts to other people? Yeah, I think there's a word for it. He laughed at her tone, at the expression on her face. Do you think there's a good word for it? She shrugged. There might be. Friends? Okay. Lovers? Yes. It wasn't quite right wasn't quite what they were. They were something more. He just didn't know what to call it. Cassandra said, maybe family. A strange sort of family. That's the only kind I do. Like you and Shane and Christian. Please don't say his name. Here, in this place, when I feel so calm. He's your family too. Cassandra turned away growling at him under her breath and trudging back to the car. And Brady thought family might just be the word. Who else would poke and pick and push? Who else could still expect to be forgiven, no matter what? He said to the blue sky and the green grass, I know you're taking care of Charlie, doing a great job like you always did. No one answered. She wasn't there. He whispered, I know you've forgiven me when you shouldn't have. The bright flowers reflected off the black marble, and they looked like spring, like a new beginning. They looked like love and hope and life. He looked at his son's name, etched into that stone, if not forever, then for a very long time. And he didn't know how to say that he was lucky to have had what little time they'd had together that being a father had been the best part of his life, and God knew he wished he'd been a better one. So he said, you keep running off that diving board, buddy. Keep trying to give your mom a heart attack. That's the memory Brady would remember. Not the screams of pain, but the shouts of joy. He wouldn't forget again. And then he turned, following Cassandra back to the car, and leaving his wife and son to their peace. Christian arrived late for brunch, 
and then laughed when he realized he was still there before Shane and Kenny. Tom sat in his gray double-breasted suit, nodding at him companionably and sipping his coffee. He said, they got distracted, shopping. Christian sighed, I expect I'll get a new shirt out of it. I expect more than one. He looked down at his new aquamarine shirt, worn just for Shane, and hoped the new ones wouldn't be too bad. He ordered the strawberry-covered waffles, because they were good, and he liked what was familiar, and sat there. He tried not to twiddle his thumbs nervously, but he just had nothing to talk about. And then Tom asked him about the game he was working on, and about growing up in Utah. And Christian relaxed, interested, despite his discomfort at being alone with someone he hardly knew. Tom ate a bite of omelet, wiping his mouth and saying softly, they're not like us, Kenny and Shane. They don't understand what it means to stand out from the crowd, because they always have, and they like it. Yes, that described Shane exactly. Christian looked at Tom's gray suit and said, Kenny doesn't try and buy you more flamboyant clothes? Tom smiled slightly. I'm a lawyer, once a lawyer, always a lawyer. And I've always used that as my excuse for dressing like this. But really, it's because I'm comfortable with the image this suit presents. But for the last 40 years, every tie I've worn has had something crazy on the end. Kenny gets them specially made. And I think I could wear a different one every day until I die, and I wouldn't have to repeat. He unbuttoned his vest, pulling out his tie and showing Christian the bare-assed chap wearing cowboy winking over one shoulder. Christian's cheeks flamed, and Tom tucked it back in, laughing. When we're home, I'll wear whatever he buys for me. And when I'm out, I wear this. And we're happy. It's important to find what will make both of you happy, if you want to last 40 years. Christian stared down at his waffles. I think I'd like to last 40 years. I'm just not sure I can stand out in the crowd for that long. I don't think I have the stamina. Can I tell you what I've seen change in the last 40 years? And then Tom waited, waited for Christian's nod. There have always been those who care a lot. Those who care about what goes on between two people, whether those people are gay or unmarried or different races. And there have always been those who don't care. By definition, those who care will be louder than those who don't. That is how it will always be. Christian nodded again. Tom said, but the number of people who don't care is getting bigger. And one day, they will drown out those who care just by their sheer numbers. Because every time a beloved actor or a revered sports star comes out, it causes someone to think about the issue to question whether a different kind of love really is different. And every movie, every TV show that shows an unapologetic character being who they are will change that fear of something different into acceptance. It won't happen quickly. Change never does, but I'm legally married to the love of my life and I didn't think that would happen in my lifetime. You're married in this state, and very few states otherwise. Tom nodded. Those who care are fighting with laws now, but they are fighting a losing battle, because public opinion is changing, even in Utah. It has been changing for the last 40 years, and it will keep changing until no amount of money can sway a vote, until no amount of fear-mongering will stop equality and freedom until no one has to be ashamed of who they are. Tom dug into his briefcase, pulling out a stack of papers and handing them to Christian. He flipped through, seeing picture after picture of happy, tearful couples finally able to unite, gay and lesbian, all in Utah's state capital. You weren't alone in Utah. You're not alone here. Tears sprang into Christian's eyes, and he said through a tight throat, it didn't last. That's how it goes, one step forward, one step back. 
All we can do is take that next step forward, be part of the next wave. Tom patted his lips again and cleared his throat. It's all we can do. Being part of the next wave is standing out in the crowd. Tom nodded. It is, and for some of us, it is quite the gesture. Did Kenny know what it meant for you to be willing to do that? Tom laughed. No, he knew that I loved him. Why wouldn't I want to get married? But I knew, and I think you know too. Christian knew knew what that kind of sacrifice meant. It meant that you loved that person more than you loved yourself. It meant that you'd last the next 40 years. It meant that your love was true. It sat in Christian's gut for a week, a knot tied tight, and he wasn't able to loosen it, couldn't shake it, couldn't forget about it. He couldn't talk about it with anyone. Not with Tom, because Tom loved Shane. And Tom had already made his gesture, and he very clearly had a bias. Not anyone in Christian's family. He laughed at the idea, and it was brittle and lonely sounding. And then he did the last thing he thought he'd ever do. He drove out to Brentwood, and he sat in the bar, and waited for Cassandra to come down and sneer at him. Because she loved Shane, and she hated Christian. And somewhere between those two extremes was the right answer. She slid onto the stool next to him and looked at his drink. Is that just an orange juice? Yes. Are you trying to make it look like you're drinking a screwdriver? No, I just wanted orange juice. She sneered, and Christian's shoulders relaxed. He smiled at her, and she narrowed her eyes at him, so he smiled down at his drink instead. She told the bartender, anything strong, as long as it's quick, and the second one follows right behind it. She grabbed the shot glass, draining it and gasping. Her eyelid twitched and she said, yep. It looked like it hurt, and Christian had never understood why people drank. Oh, he'd tried a glass or two, but it tasted horrible. He preferred orange juice. She picked up the second shot glass and said, am I going to need this one right away? Are you asking me? Why are you here, alone, looking for me? He took a deep breath, and she said, God, hang on, I am going to need this one. He watched her go through the ritual a second time, and it looked worse than the first one, because she added a little head shake to go with the eye twitch. She sat, gripping the bar, not looking at him, and he wondered if it needed a few minutes to take effect. But then her body lost its anger, and she leaned her elbow against the bar and propped her head in her hand and looked at him. No sneer, just a kind of tiredness. Christian cleared his throat. I'm, I'm. He glanced around the room, seeing if anyone was paying attention to them, to him. Spit it out, Christian, before I do something that will make Shane mad at me. There's no Brady here to protect you right now. She didn't really look all that dangerous right now. She looked like she was thinking about taking a nap on the bar. And he decided this was as good as he was going to get. He spit out, I'm thinking of asking Shane to marry me. Her eyes widened into saucers, and she whispered, Excuse me? He didn't repeat it. She'd heard him. She lifted her head up, and then Brady was right there, standing between their stools and saying, this looks like it should be a private conversation. There was a long pause, and Christian was glad he couldn't see what was going on between them. A staring contest? A furious, silent argument? Brady said, you can bring a drink up. I'm going to need the whole damn bottle. He nodded, gesturing to the bartender to send one up, and Cassandra slid off her stool and walked away stiffly. Brady put a hand on Christian's shoulder and shook his head slightly. They waited until she was out of sight, and then Christian whispered, are you scared of her? One side of Brady's mouth quirked up. I've been to prison, so no. Christian never, ever wanted to go to prison. He said, thanks for getting between us. 
I sometimes think I should let you two go at it. She'd like you more if you tipped her on her ass. I wouldn't do that. Brady squeezed Christian's shoulder, then dropped his hand and followed after Cassandra. Christian watched him, wondering why he hadn't cared about Brady touching him. He hadn't even noticed. He'd seen the man naked, and that memory still made Christian's face flame. But his touch hadn't made Christian uncomfortable. It was the touch of a friend, someone he knew, someone who didn't want anything from him that he wasn't sure he could give. He had a friend. He thought it was Cassandra he was coming to talk to, but really it was Cassandra and Brady. Cassandra's tug of war between love and hate, and Brady's impartiality. They made a good team. Christian wondered what would have happened if there had been no Brady, and then decided he'd rather go to prison than find out. Christian was acting nervous again. Shane didn't know what had happened, but ever since brunch, he'd been skittish, reserved. He and Kenny had shown off their purchases, and Shane had given Christian a new shirt, and all he'd done was stare down at it like it held the key to all life's mysteries. Shane had known he would hate it. It was too bright, too bold, too noticeable, just like Shane. Shane had never doubted himself before. He was who he was, and he liked it. He'd been blessed to be surrounded by people who felt the same. And Shane knew Christian liked who he was, despite how bright and bold and noticeable he was. But Shane couldn't take the awkwardness tonight, couldn't stop thinking about what was wrong. So he drove out to Brentwood to talk to Cass. He waited at the bar for her. He couldn't even get up the energy to flirt with the bartender. Cass sat down next to him and said, what the hell are you wearing? Gray. Why? Shane shrugged. I didn't feel like being noticeable. Brady came to stand right behind Cass. Two nights in a row? It's as busy as LAX around here. Go away, Brady. Brady smiled, then stopped. If he gets plastered, he's not driving home. I know. Wait, are you talking about calling him a cab or taking him upstairs? A chuckle escaped his lips, and he squeezed her neck. Those days are over. Cassandra turned to watch him walk away. Her eyes narrowed as she looked at his butt, and she said loud enough for Brady to hear across the room, good. Brady smiled again, and Shane said, hello, stop undressing your boy toy with your eyes and pay attention to me. She turned back around and said to the bartender, something sweet and fun. I don't want anything harsh today, and the same for him. It's just so much more fun to get wasted when someone will join you. Shane nodded, I know what you mean. They waited for their drinks, and when they came, they were bright pink and served in tall glasses. Shane tried not to feel better, but the drinks were just so bright and happy. Cass took a long sip, her eyes closing as the sweetness hit her tongue. She smiled at him, then frowned at his shirt. You going to tell me about the gray? He sighed. I bought Christian a shirt he hated. And he returned the favor? No, I just wanted to wear gray. I don't want to be too bright and loud. He could see the dawning realization in her eyes. I'm trying to decide if I hate Christian for making you want to be something different, or if I love you for wanting to make someone you love happy. She took a sip, thinking about it, then said, eh, I can do both. She watched him take a small sip, so unhappy. He means that much to you? Yes, but this is just a shirt, Cass. It wasn't just a shirt, and she knew it. So she just sipped, and he just sipped. When their drinks were gone, she said, he came here. Who, Christian? She nodded. He needed to talk. And he came to you instead of me? His voice got louder and louder with each word, and the pain of it seared him. It was about you. The futility of his ill-fated relationship swamped Shane, and he slumped in his seat. He's going to break up with me. 
Cassandra tapped the bar and said, Christian should realize that I would never keep anything from you. Shane closed his eyes and laid his head down on the bar. She said, maybe he knows that, and that's why he came to me. Is he that sneaky? No. She stroked his hair, petting him, and he kept his eyes closed, basked in being loved. She said, do you want to know what he needed to talk about? I don't know, do I? It took her a moment. Yes, I don't want to tell you. It's that bad? Depends on your perspective. Just tell me, is he breaking up with me? No, he's not breaking up with you. But it's still bad? It still depends on your perspective. He opened his eyes, keeping his head down. Cass, am I going to think it's bad? The bartender put two more happy drinks in front of them, and she stopped stroking his hair to take a long, long pull from her straw. You won't think it's bad, but I don't know if he's going to go through with it, and if he does, you'll like it as a surprise. I can't even imagine what it could be. She shook her head. Nope, damn near gave me a heart attack. He started smiling a little. I won't hate it even a little? She shook her head again, and he lifted his. He took a sip of his happy drink. I don't need to wear this gray shirt after all. No, but you might want to show Christian first. He'd like it. You're a good friend. The best. But we're not friends, Shane. We're family. He nodded. Then, you didn't hurt Christian when he came to talk, right? Brady was there. Ah, good. So, are we going to get wasted or what? He nodded. Is Brady going to take me upstairs and do unspeakable things to me when I've lost all feeling in my feet? No, but he might get you a room. Well then, waste on. Chapter Nine Getting wasted was fun. Waking up the next morning was not. But when Shane rolled over on the bed, groaning, Christian was beside him, on top of the covers and fully dressed, which was the only reason Shane knew he wasn't a hallucination. Christian said, Hi. Hi. When did you get here? Last night, about the time you and Cassandra started doing karaoke. I don't remember that at all. I didn't even know they had a karaoke machine. They don't. Shane laughed, then grabbed for his head. The bed moved as Christian got out, and Shane's stomach rolled with it. I just don't understand why you do this to yourself. When Shane was pretty sure his stomach wasn't going to empty itself, he said, I'm a glutton for punishment. You should be glad or we would never have lasted as long as we have. Christian pushed a glass of cool water into Shane's hand and laid a wet washcloth on his forehead. I am glad, but I'm still going to try and get you to like orange juice. The older I get, the more likely it becomes. Right at this moment, he was swearing to himself he'd never drink again. Christian popped pills into Shane's hand. Brady sent these up, said you'd need them this morning. He'd need a few good more than just two, but it was a start. Might take the edge off enough. The man is a god among men. Did he call you and tell you I was here? Cassandra did. Shane braved the light to crack open one eye. She did? Are you sure? Pretty sure. She called me a few choice words and said you thought I was going to break up with you. She told me you weren't. Christian shook his head, and Shane sighed, resting his head against the pillow and closing his eyes again. When Christian sat down beside him and slipped his hand into Shane's, he thought he'd die a happy man right there, because he was still pretty sure he'd like to. Two pills were not enough. Did she tell you anything else about what we talked about? No, she said... I don't remember exactly what she said, but that I'd like it. I'll wait, 
I like surprises. Christian didn't say anything, just sat next to him holding his hand. Not ready, obviously, for whatever surprise he was contemplating. It was okay. Shane really did like surprises. He didn't mind waiting, not when he knew he was going to like it. Christian said, Cassandra likes me more when she's nearly comatose. She smiled at me. Shane shared his own little smile at the proof that one day the two people he loved would love each other, then stopped because moving his face hurt his head. Shane thought he'd feel better if he tried waking up again, could feel the black of sleep hovering. Shane, please don't wear gray again. You don't need to, and it is not your color. He struggled against sleep enough to murmur, How do you know it's not my color? I know. And then he fell asleep. Christian's hand tucked nicely into his own, the image of Cassandra smiling drunkenly at his pretty little bird, lulling him off to dreamland. All was right with the world, or would be, the next time he woke up. Mackenzie and Ethan came to town. Cassandra talked them into staying at Brady's hotel, even though it was a farther drive to the office. And when Rodrigo called up to tell her they were here, like she'd bribed him to, she ran downstairs to see the boys, and Mackenzie and Ethan. She stopped when she saw Mackenzie, one eye trained on Wyatt and the other pushing Grant in his stroller. Pregnant Mackenzie, in the no one would think it's a little weight gain she is obviously pregnant phase. Again. Cassandra said, again? Mackenzie turned, rolling her eyes. Tell me about it. Wyatt saw his favorite mark and ran up singing, Auntie Cass, Auntie Cass. She braced herself for the assault, grinning as he tried to knock her over with his enthusiasm. Grant squealed in his stroller. Not really sure who Cassandra was yet, he was too little to remember her, but just like his brother, saw someone he would like to smile at. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Brady come out from his office, heading for them. Tall, Dark, dangerous, big. Mackenzie's eyes widened, and Cassandra smirked. Tell me about it. Best friends didn't need to say a word. Brady shook hands with Mackenzie, and didn't look at Wyatt clamped to Cassandra's leg. Ethan came over after registering, shaking Brady's hand, and then taking Cassandra's hand and holding it in his. Hello, Cassandra, lovely as ever. His voice washed down her spine like warm water, so relaxing, so calming, leaving her only with the thought that, why, yes, he was lovely. His green eyes twinkled and she blinked up at him, tinkling a laugh. Brady watched her, his eyebrows knitted together. What's going on? Mackenzie peeled her son off Cassandra's leg and her husband off Cassandra's hand. She's lost the rest of her brain cells. Oh, this is her Ethan O'Connor face. Mackenzie laughed. <laughs> yes. He looked at the slightly dazed look in Cassandra's eyes, at the matter-of-fact look in Mackenzie's. It doesn't bother you? Since there is only one woman on this planet who doesn't look at him like that, I've gotten used to it. Cassandra shook her head, clearing it. She looked at Mackenzie's growing belly and said, Pretty sure even that one woman looks at him like that occasionally. Ethan rubbed Mackenzie's belly lovingly. It's my proof to the world. Even this one looks at me like that occasionally. Brady found something else to look at. Ethan noticed his discomfort and asked for a tour of the hotel facilities. And when they trotted off, the women headed for the elevator. The women, the boys, and the three nannies. Cassandra could on occasion hold her tongue, so she didn't comment on it, in front of the nannies. Mackenzie watched the floor number tick higher. Will I be meeting Christian as well? Cassandra tried not to make a face. Tonight at dinner. And? You'll hate him, because you're my best friend. I never understood how you could have so many best friends. Shane, me, the guy who changes the oil in your car. Cassandra grinned. 
Shane's not really my best friend. I just don't know what else to call him. Other half? Part of my soul? And Brady? What do you call him? A nice distraction. A big distraction. The elevator door dinged and opened, and Wyatt went racing down the hall. Cassandra murmured, tell me about it. They shared a little look that said there would be D-E-T-A-I-L-S, and Cassandra was oddly reluctant. She didn't want to share Brady and their top-of-the-car adventure. Yeah, okay, she'd share that. That had been pretty good. Mackenzie headed right for the couch, groaning as she sat. I hate being pregnant. I hurt constantly. Is it because you're getting old? Shut up. Cassandra went to sit next to her, patting her friend's knee and watching Wyatt run in and out of each room, Grant toddling after him. It's worth it, though, right? Mackenzie massaged a sore spot, nodding. I want a girl, you know? Cassandra started to say, maybe this one, then trailed off when Mackenzie shook her head. Another boy? Well, give it 18 to 20 years, the world will thank you. That's what I'm afraid of. Not even my best friend can keep her head screwed on when my husband smiles at her. What am I going to do with three more of them running around? What did Ethan's mom do to keep him contained? She tried to get him married off as quickly as possible, which, now that I think about it, is not such a bad idea. She nodded, thinking it through, then stopped and sighed. Of course, that didn't work out real well. Maybe I'll just take lots of cruises. I'll come with, for moral support. Okay, if you stop ogling my husband in a swimsuit. Cassandra sniffed. I've gotten over pretty boys. I like mine a little scary now. Mackenzie said, oh, good. You were embarrassing him with all that adoration downstairs ten minutes ago. Cassandra laughed. I wasn't embarrassing him or adoring him. What would you call what you were doing? Floating in the river of his eyes? Ethan and his eyes came into the suite, zeroing in on Mackenzie rubbing her belly. You need to lie down, take a nap. The boys need to take a nap. I, a grown woman, just need to sit for a little while. The nannies will round up the boys and put them down. You, a grown woman, growing the third of my six children, need a nap. Cassandra said, you're three nannies. Some days it's not enough. Mackenzie held up her hand, ticking up her fingers. One for Wyatt, one for Grant, one to tag in when those little green eyes are too much to take and everyone starts thinking it is a good idea to fill the bathtub with ice cream. Cassandra grinned, watching the three younger women running around chasing the boys, the young, pretty women. You're not worried a little bit? Mackenzie laughed. Nope. Ethan said, the trust, it's terrifying. The trust, and what I do to you. He shivered. It's seared into my brain. Even when we have a softball team's worth of nannies, she won't need to worry. Mackenzie flicked her eyes to Cassandra, telling her without words that Cassandra just had no clue. Maybe sometimes even best friends did need words. Mackenzie said, We won't ever need that many nannies. Six is never going to happen. Your mother likes me already. She's just being polite. We're going to have to go the distance. He wiggled six fingers at her, and just to make sure she knew how he felt, said, Six. You're going to have to get a different wife if you're set on a fourth, fifth, or sixth. Cassandra chimed in. You're going to have to do a fourth, at least, for a girl. You just said, oh. Mackenzie closed her eyes. You're losing your touch. Ethan twinkled at his wife. You do want a girl. I wasn't going to just tell you. You like making me change my mind. He smiled this time at his wife, long and slow, everyone else forgotten, the most important person in his world. Mackenzie opened her eyes to that look 
and floated in that green river. Cassandra decided that was her cue. She pushed herself off the couch, heading for the door and saying over her shoulder, I've missed you, Ethan. Hey, and you, Mackenzie. I just didn't think I needed to say it. Mackenzie grumbled. We're out of practice. It'll come back to us. It's like riding a bicycle, right? Brady was sitting in his chair when Cassandra got to the penthouse, his eyes closed, his face empty. She wondered if the weekly meeting with his family had been bad, or maybe he hadn't liked seeing her Ethan O'Connor face in action. She put her hand on his shoulder, and he opened his eyes, and the pain in them made her realize it wasn't about her, wasn't about his family. It had been about the children he'd studiously avoided, about four-year-old Wyatt wrapped around his leg, Grant kicking away in his stroller, pregnant Mackenzie. Cassandra sat in Brady's lap, just sat there quietly with him so he wouldn't be alone. He shifted, moving her into a more comfortable position. I don't know why it surprised me. I knew they were bringing their children. I'll ask Mackenzie if the kids are eating with us tonight. Brady shook his head. I'll just drink. He snorted, then let out a long breath. No, I'll just deal with it. She wiggled against him. Would a lie down on the bed nap help? No, but a drive would. Cassandra cocked her head. Was that a euphemism? He stood, holding her in his arms and walking her toward the bed. Pretty sure it was. The kids did not come down to dinner, and Cassandra breathed out a sigh of relief for Brady. It would be easier on him, even if she would miss them. Shane was vocal with his disappointment, though, and he ran upstairs to kiss and hug them hello before sitting down to dinner. He showed the table four red handprints on his pants when he came back down and said, Spaghetti, now I know why they're eating up there. Mackenzie hid her laughter unsuccessfully behind her hand, and Ethan shook his head. I should have warned you. Cassandra put her hand under the table, on Brady's thigh, just resting it there. He smiled at her, patting her hand, telling her he was okay. He laughed at Shane's Ethan O'Connor face, at the tilting of Shane's head and the unfocusing of his eyes as Ethan talked and joked with him. Brady whispered, glad it's not just you. Cassandra leaned toward him. It's everyone. Look at Christian. Christian was trying not to stare, trying not to smile stupidly. He kept glancing down at his plate, away from those green eyes, pulling his lips into a semi-frown. Cassandra almost liked him for trying, made her remember when Mackenzie was trying to tell herself she wouldn't fall for a golden boy. Brady laughed again. It's not everyone. Cassandra looked around the table. Mackenzie, Christian, Shane, Cassandra, everyone was under Ethan's spell. Oh, you mean you. I never thought you'd fall for it, actually. Because you used to be him. You know all the tricks. Brady raised his eyebrows at her. You think I used to be like that? Charming? Cassandra nodded. Yeah, I've seen the pictures. You were a golden boy, and I have no doubt you could wrap everyone around your finger. And looking between Ethan and Brady, she could see that what he'd been through had been hell. It showed in every pore, and it hurt her. It hurt her to see how all-encompassing tragedy could change a man. How he would have been happy, and now there was darkness. Brady said, I don't think I was ever like him. He seems to genuinely care. Ethan did genuinely care. It was his secret weapon. And Cassandra thought it was what Brady had lost. She was sure he knew how to be charming. He hadn't forgotten the skills. He just didn't care anymore. About himself. About anyone else. Except he kind of did. She couldn't count how many times he'd stepped between her and Christian, he wouldn't let her attack someone who didn't know how to defend himself. He was protecting Christian, yes, 
but he was protecting her too. And when Brady was sleeping next to her, nearly dead with exhaustion, with six years of sleep to catch up on, she could see what he would have looked like before. And then he would wake and open his eyes to find her in bed beside him and not his wife. And every morning he would remember and die again. And then he would look out the window at the morning sun shining off the hills and feel the bed with his palms and sigh and smile at her. He was brutal, yes, with his honesty, with his words, with his body. That's why she liked him. He was truth. Everything else had been stripped from him, leaving only the raw truth behind. It was what she loved. Cassandra sucked in the last word, choking on it. She met Mackenzie's eyes across the table, and apparently best friend was working again, because she didn't need to say what she'd been thinking. Love? They had something, but it wasn't love. Not for her, not for him. He was still in love with his dead wife. She was still in love with Shane. She checked, making sure. But there he was, in her heart. Hers. And see, there was Brady right next to him. Her Brady. Tall, dark, hurt, dangerous. Hers. Well, shit. Mackenzie stood up stopping Ethan in the middle of a sentence. Okay? She smiled at him. Just one of the joys of pregnancy. Cassandra, will you come with me? Ethan watched them walk around the corner, his eyes following Mackenzie, worry in them. Mackenzie steered Cassandra into the bathroom, heading for a stall as soon as they entered, and Cassandra said, Oh, I thought you were trying to get me alone. I was, but I really do have to go. She flipped the lock and said loudly, So what was that? I just remembered I forgot to do something at work. Hopefully I'll get fired tomorrow morning. Hmm, you looked like you needed a bucket of ice cream to cry in. Please, I remember your bawling into your pathetic pint of ice cream when you realized you'd given your heart away. It was traumatic. Ethan O'Connor, roughly three billion men in the world, and I go and fall for Ethan O'Connor. I'm still embarrassed about it. Cassandra smiled. Does he believe anything you say? No, kind of like I don't believe you were thinking about work a few minutes ago. I know you. Well, I wasn't thinking about falling for someone who would embarrass me. I'm not sure I could be embarrassed. Okay, if I accidentally fell in love with Christian... I'd have to go hide my face in a pint of ice cream. I get that now. Mackenzie came out of the stall to wash her hands, and she wasn't smiling, and she didn't say anything. She waited, watched Cassandra in the mirror, and didn't say anything. Cassandra sighed. Mackenzie, I've already fallen in love, and it wasn't a pint of ice cream I hid in. It was a keg of beer. Before my time. Well, it was in high school. We didn't start with the beer floats until college. Mackenzie stopped drying her hands. I thought the nausea was over, but that... She shook her head, cleared her throat. You won't distract me. I was just surprised to find someone else taking up room in my heart. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting it with Brady. Cassandra could hear it in her voice. Why? Why had she fallen in love with someone who couldn't love her back completely? Again. Why is it bad? Because he loves his dead wife. The guilt he bears for killing her will always outweigh everything. I'd always have to share him with her. How would you like to compete with an angel? Mackenzie said softly, What is it with you and sharing? Cassandra didn't know. I'm hopeless. No, I do know hopeless when I see it. This isn't it. Cassandra looked in the mirror at herself, at a woman who would love only the parts they could give, who could be happy with just those parts. She said quietly, and she didn't know if she was trying to talk herself into it or Mackenzie, we can't all have the fairy tale. Some of us have to accept as good as it's going to get. And maybe as good as it could get, 
wouldn't be that bad. She'd thought this whole time that when Shane fell in love with his bird, that it would mean he would love her less, that he would have to love her less. But her heart wasn't divided. She could love both Shane and Brady. She did love them both. She wasn't quite sure she wanted to. When they came out, Ethan was waiting for them, pacing back and forth in front of the ladies' room, and when Mackenzie smiled at him, there wasn't any kind of embarrassment in her eyes. Why didn't you send someone in? He was by her side in two large steps. Are you okay? She stroked his arm, sidling into him as best she could. We were just catching up. Girl talk. Ethan's eyes flared. Now I'm really worried. Mackenzie laughed. I know how to girl talk. Cassandra shook her head. No, she doesn't. Ethan turned those green eyes on her and outspilled all her secrets. We were arguing about my sorry love life. Ethan peered at her for one more long moment, then relaxed and stroked his hand down Mackenzie's belly. Okay, maybe you're right, and this will be the last one. I don't think I can go through this again. You don't think you can do it again? Pregnancy is hard on a man. He held one elbow out to Mackenzie, the other for Cassandra, and when he was sandwiched between them, Mackenzie said, You're going to pay for that. Ethan smiled at the proof that everything was okay with her. I know. Brady stood next to Cassandra and watched the O'Connor's car pull away, back to New York, and Brady felt a little like Shane, slightly glad they lived on the other side of the country, glad he didn't have to look at any more brainless smiles from Cassandra. It was unnerving, and he'd laugh with her about it, get her to admit she liked a little friction in her love life, and Ethan O'Connor would have never made her happy except she'd stop talking to Brady sometime during the week. At first, he'd thought she'd just been busy with her friends, with the kids, and he'd been glad to be busy himself. He said, are we going to talk about it? She didn't look at him, hadn't looked at him in days. Talk about what? About whatever is wrong. She waved at Rodrigo, and he jerked his thumb at her car. When she nodded, he grabbed the keys and went to get her car. Nothing is wrong. Brady looked up at the sky, then closed his eyes. He almost smiled. It had been a long time since a woman had told him nothing was wrong in that tone of voice. He didn't say anything until her little peach lady pulled up in front of them. Didn't say anything even then. Cassandra said, I need to go home. I haven't been home since they got here. Shane's flowers are going to be dead again. She whispered, I just need some time, alone, to think. About what? She looked at him then, looked, and he knew something was wrong. He'd done something. He just had no idea what. Are you coming back tonight? I know you can't sleep without me beside you. I'll be back tonight. I don't know what it means that you can't sleep without me, but I'll be back. Brady fought the anger, fought the embarrassment. He didn't need her pity. I didn't sleep for six years without you. I can do it again. Her lips thinned, and she walked around the car to where Rodrigo was holding her door open, his face politely blank. Do you really think you could do it again, Brady? Do you still have a choice? because I don't think deciding between no sleep and always sleeping with me is much of a choice. Do you? There's no choice there. There's only need and what you'll do to meet that need. Brady couldn't help it as his eyebrows rose to his hairline. Couldn't help it that he was standing there looking completely clueless. What the fuck are you talking about? The only choice I have is to accept or deny. My only choice is the rock or the hard place. My only choice is the frying pan or the fire. My only choice is to be happy with what I can have or to be miserable without it, because I can't change what I can have. 
He lifted his hands in the universal sign of incomprehension. What does that mean? She sat down in the car, slamming her door shut and leaning over to look at him through the window. She said something, flicking her hand to emphasize whatever it was she was saying. He shouted, I can't hear you. She sat back up, and all Brady could see was her hands gripping the steering wheel. She finally rolled the window down and shouted back, I just need to think. Rodrigo came to stand next to him, watched with him as Cassandra peeled away. What the fuck just happened? Rodrigo clapped him on the back. It's good to see you with woman trouble, Hefe. What is life without a little woman trouble? The fog of confusion cleared a little as Brady's frustration turned to anger, as his anger triggered his need. He sucked in a breath through his nose, blew it out through tight lips. He rolled his neck, turning away from the road and looking at his hotel, at the people streaming in and out. He closed his eyes and clenched his fists. God damn it. He would never beat this beast. He would never be free from this monster. The monster who waited for any tiny chink to dig its fingers in and free itself. The monster who waited patiently because it knew it only needed a moment of weakness to escape. All Brady could do was sweat the want out. All he could do was work his muscles so hard that the endorphins would calm his need. He would blow off his meetings, change his clothes, and go hit the gym. Brady clenched his jaw and said, Get my car, Rodrigo. Rodrigo grinned. You going to go after her, Hefe? Yes. Chapter 10 An hour later, Brady pulled into Cassandra's driveway. He'd driven like a madman for half a block, and then had pulled over and raged in his little Z. He'd screamed and beat the steering wheel. He'd punched the roof until his knuckles bled. He'd pummeled his thighs until they were numb. He'd fought until he'd sat breathless and spent, until he was too tired to do what the monster wanted. And then he'd cried, his shoulders bent and shaking, the tears falling unchecked. And he understood what Cassandra had meant. He had no choice. No choice except to keep fighting or to give in. What he wanted was to be free, and that would never happen. He didn't know what Cassandra had been talking about when she'd said she didn't have a choice, but he knew what it felt like. Brady sat in his car and looked at her little bungalow, at the little dead flowers in her front yard, and then he turned the car back on and reversed out of the drive. Another hour later, Brady was digging in the dirt with his hands, pulling out dead flowers and carefully planting the pansies he'd bought at the hardware store. He hadn't known what they were called, just seen them and grabbed them because they were pretty. The sun was hot on his back, and he loosened his tie, unbuttoned the top few buttons of his shirt, and rolled up his sleeves. The door opened slowly, and Cassandra came out to watch him, her eyebrows pinched together, her arms folded. What are you doing? Planting new flowers? Why? Because these looked sad. She watched him another long minute, then went to turn the hose on enough for a trickle. She crouched beside him, watering the flowers he'd planted. She looked at his hands, lightly touching his bruised and raw knuckles, and he said, I was thinking. When he glanced at her, she was fighting a smile. That's my kind of thinking. He took one of her hands in his, twisting it back and forth. Then how come I don't see any signs? Because I think with dishes, not my hands. He dropped her now muddy hand. Smart. Sometimes. Most of the time, no. He popped another pansy out of its little black container pulling at the roots gently. My wife loved to plant flowers. She loved making her world beautiful, said it gave her a little glow, and I never understood what she was talking about until now. Cassandra stood up, 
turned the water off, and went inside, shutting the door behind her so quietly that Brady knew she wanted to slam it. He said loud enough for her to hear through the window, Okay, I'm starting to get a glimmer of what you needed to think about. He heard an inside door slam, and it made him feel better. Better enough to smile at his little purple flowers. Good enough to plant the rest of his flowers, to water them, all the while looking forward to doing a little thinking with Cassandra. They could probably do some pretty good damage between the two of them. When he was done, and as clean as he could make himself, he followed her inside, sitting down on the couch when he saw it had been the bathroom door she'd slammed, just sat and waited. He closed his eyes, cataloging all the protests his body was making, hands and knuckles, thighs, even under his fingernails where some dirt was stubbornly clinging. He was sore, and he felt good, at peace once again, his monster chained back up. He'd fought, and he'd won, and he was grateful for it. He heard the bathroom door open, and then Cassandra was curling up beside him on the couch, not touching, but right there next to him. He listened to her breathe, and thought about taking a nap, and she said, I didn't care about your perfect wife when I wasn't in love with you. Brady's eyes blinked open. Then because he didn't know what else to do, he blinked again. Love? She laughed, short and bitter. Sucks, huh? He picked his head up to look at her, and her skin was washed clean, her hair slightly damp in a ring around her face, her eyes bright with tears. He said again, Love? She sniffed. I don't want to love another man who can't love me all the way back. Another one whose heart can't be all mine. Another man I have to share. She closed her eyes, leaning her head back and whispering, I'm tired of sharing. Brady looked at her, looked at the sad turn of her mouth, the freshly scrubbed pinkness of her face. Love? They were fun. And she was right, they were need, but love? She turned her face toward him and slowly opened her eyes. Another short laugh escaped her lips and she closed her eyes again. I need a picture of that look for my scrapbook. Brady shut his mouth with a snap and tried to say something that didn't sound horrified. And out came, why do you love me? And why are you telling me? She shrugged. It's love, Brady. Why hide it? You don't have to love me back. He gurgled, and she patted his hand. And I love you because. She tipped her head. Why do I love Shane? There's things about him that I like, and there's things about him that I hate. Why do we decide to love who we love? I don't think it's a decision, it just is but you do decide what you're going to do about that love. There has to be a why. Does there? Yes. She opened her eyes, meeting his straight on and saying, do you want to know my why? He was shaking his head before he'd even thought about it. She smiled slightly, like she'd been expecting him to say no, but still a little sad at it. She sighed. I don't want to tell you why, anyway. I haven't decided what to do about this love yet. She flicked her eyes at him. I wanted to think about it. And next time she shouted at him that she needed to think about something, he'd let her do it without chasing after her. She lifted one hand, weighing her decision in the palm of her hand. I can have part of your heart and be happy. She lifted her other hand or have none of it and be miserable. That's my choice. He said, I don't want to hear this. I know, this is your punishment. He put his head in his hands and tried not to laugh, tried to figure out what he was feeling here. Horror, wonder, disbelief, she said. At least I can have mind-erasing sex with you. A possibility of children if you can ever look at one without cringing. 
she grinned. Oh, now please let me get my phone so I can take a picture of you looking like you're going to faint. She gripped his thigh, using it to push herself up, and he said, I can't have any more children. I had a vasectomy. He squeezed his fists. I don't want any more children. Cassandra stopped. She stood there, one step from the couch, and stopped. Stopped smiling, stopped breathing. All the blood drained from her face, and Brady stood, wrapping his arms around her, taking her weight as she drooped. He didn't love Cassandra, wasn't sure how he felt about her loving him, but he hurt watching her, hurt seeing her take this final blow. He'd taken away the possibility of making a family and home with him, taken away all hope. He whispered, baby, I'm sorry, so sorry. And he was. He wished he could give her everything she wanted, wished he could give her something, just one thing that she wanted. And he couldn't give her anything. He didn't have a heart to give, didn't have a way to give her a child even if he one day wanted to. He picked her up, ignoring his aching muscles, carried her into the bedroom to lay her gently on the bed. Brady climbed in beside her, curling around her and whispering over and over how sorry he was, stroking her hair and trying to heal a hurt he'd just dumped on her, without thinking. He'd been surprised, surprised that she was thinking of children with him. She'd surprised the truth out of him. He'd surprised the hope out of her. Brady called Shane, because who else did you call when you needed to be taken care of except the person who loved you? Can you come to Cassandra's? I, I hurt her. Excuse me? You did what? I don't want to leave her alone. Please, come. I'm coming right now, but believe me, we will be having words. Brady hung up. He deserved words. Wasn't sure how scary words from Shane were going to be, but he deserved them. He sat down on the bed beside Cassandra. She hadn't spoken to him, hadn't looked at him. He hadn't known that she'd wanted children. Hadn't known she might want children with him. He'd lain with her all day and all night. And all day and all night. She'd hardly stirred, hadn't eaten. He'd stopped saying sorry when his voice had given out. Stopped trying to get her to eat, to drink when she turned away from him. Brady heard the key turn in the door, and he whispered, Shane's here now. He'll know how to heal your hurts. Shane came running into the room, crawling into bed without bothering to kick off his shoes, and scooping Cassandra up in his arms. Oh my God, Cass, what did the big scary man do to you? He crushed her to his chest flicking a finger between him and Brady and saying, words. Brady nodded. I told her the truth. Shane squinted his eyes. What truth? Cassandra croaked. Don't. I don't want to hear it again. Shane looked between them. You didn't touch her. Only with the truth. Fucking truth. Why can't people just lie? White lies say I love you. Cassandra sniffed snuggling into Shane's arms, and Brady said, I'll come back after my meeting. I just can't miss this one. He'd missed a handful already, and if he could miss this one too, he would. Cassandra shook her head. I have to think. Brady opened his mouth, and she turned her head to meet his eye. She had to think about what to do with her love, and he was suddenly glad, glad she knew he couldn't give her anything she wanted. He nodded. He turned away, stopping at the door to her bedroom and gripping the casing, wanting to turn around and say something that would help her make her decision. Except he didn't know what he wanted her to decide. So he left. Shane at least got her to eat a little soup. He wrapped her up tight in her blankets, pulled a chair in next to the bed, and read the celebrity gossip to her. She didn't sleep, she just lay there, 
her eyes open and dead. Shane had thought, when he'd heard Brady stutter that he'd hurt her, that perhaps their sex play had gotten a little too rough. Completely understandable, if you asked him, considering. He'd thought he'd find Brady looking embarrassed, and Cass alternating between laughing and groaning. He hadn't expected to find her destroyed. Destroyed with words. Destroyed with the truth. The truth. Oh, the truth. He didn't know what truth had knocked his Cassandra to the ground. Wasn't sure what truth could knock her out. She'd tell him when she was ready. And until then, he would sit by her side and think about how the truth could only destroy when it came from someone you loved. Shane took a few days off from work. And when she wasn't better, still wasn't talking, not even smiling at the celebrity feud article he'd read to her, he called for reinforcements. Tom and Kenny came, watched over her during the day, pampering and fussing over her. Kenny brushed her hair and painted her fingernails, chatting nonstop. Tom forced more soup down her throat, alternating between concerned friend and gruff uncle. And at night, Shane slept next to her, holding her hand. Christian took over evening duty when he came one night to check on Shane, recoiling in shock when Shane answered the door with a scruffy beard and weak old pajamas. Shane covered his face. Don't look at me, I'm hideous. Christian pulled Shane's hands down. You look like you've been worried sick. She just lies there. And you haven't slept in how long? He couldn't remember. He slept in fits, afraid that she'd finally want to talk and he'd be zoned out. Christian said, I'll sleep with her tonight. Go sleep, take a shower. You don't have to do this alone. Shane almost started crying, nearly dropped his head on Christian's shoulder and just cried. From the exhaustion, from the worry, from not being alone. Christian was still holding one of Shane's hands, and he tugged him toward the door. Shane hesitated. Call me if she wakes up? Christian nodded, and Shane pulled away. Just let me tell her you're here. Christian followed him into the bedroom, sitting in the chair next to the bed and studying her carefully. Worry and shock crossed Christian's face, and Shane wondered if he'd have to call someone soon. Who do you call when someone broke? Shane squeezed her hand and said quietly, Christian is going to stay with you tonight. She didn't blink. No spark of life at Christian's name. No refusal pushed past her lips. She didn't care, and Shane worried even more. Wondered if he needed to chase Brady down and tie him up and torture whatever truth out of him. Christian said, go home, Shane. We're okay. He looked between Cassandra and Christian and nodded. Christian would take care of her. Christian listened to her breathe, so quiet in her little room. He looked at the celebrity magazines littering the floor near her bed and said, I don't think so. He pulled out his phone, bringing up his blog feeds. Let's see. Ooh, Peter Mayhew had to cancel convention appearances for filming episode seven, maybe? He glanced at Cassandra, then back down at his phone. You'd know him as Chewbacca of course. And you're really worrying Shane. He looks like, he looks like hell. I'm sorry, but there is no other word for it. Her foot moved, pulling at the blankets, and Christian held his breath. He said, I'm sorry, Cassandra. Whatever happened between you and Brady, I'm just so sorry. The blankets moved again, and when he looked at her face, her eyes were closed. He put away his phone. Oh, look. The release date for D&D Next was just leaked, July 15th. I'm sorry to be excited about that when you're like this. Her eyes opened, and Christian leaned forward in his chair. Sorry, so sorry. I'm sorry. Her lips opened, and she croaked. Christian? Yes? Go away. He smiled. Sorry, can't. I told Shane I'd stay and watch you for him. So sorry. Her hand hit the bed, and Christian leaned back in his chair, 
He watched her blink, listened to her breath speed up, then slow down. I'm sorry, stop apologizing, Re, about whatever happened between you and Brady. But you are hurting Shane, and I, I love him. She sucked in a breath, closing her eyes and saying without any heat, without any rancor, I hate you so much. Maybe. I know you don't like me, but I try not to take it personally, because I feel bad for you. I'd feel bad for anyone who had to watch the man she loved fall in love with someone else. You- She choked and coughed, pushing herself up in the bed. You feel bad for me? You feel bad for me? He could see the rage building in her eyes, thought he might be really stupid to keep egging her on. But he knew she hadn't spoken in a week, and screams were better than silence. Oh, how he hated silence. He was pretty sure even Cassandra would agree with him about that. Christian whispered, I pity you, Cassandra. Her anger pushed her out of bed, pushing her onto weak and wobbly legs. You pity me? You pity me. I'm sorry. She screamed wordlessly and launched herself at him, hitting and scratching and screeching. Christian huddled in his seat, protecting his head with his arms, and sat there, let her scream at him, her hot tears splashing onto his arms and face, his ears ringing from her screams, his arms stinging from the slaps. He was glad that she'd been an invalid for the last few days, knowing it would have hurt far worse if her strength had been up. She didn't last long, and she fell to the floor, still screaming, and then the screams turning to great gulping sobs. She cried and cried, and Christian wished she was still hitting him. He slid from his seat to huddle on the floor next to her, and he said over her cries, you have people who love you, Cassandra, people who would do anything for you. You're not alone. You've never been alone, not once in the last week. I don't pity you, I envy you. I envy all the love you take for granted. And she said, what is love? What is love when all it does is hurt? When you can't have what you want? When you can't have children to shower with that love? Christian's heart thumped. Brady, he won't have any more children? She choked. He can't, even if you wanted, he couldn't. She held one hand up snipping the air with her fingers, and Christian understood the crass gesture. He took a deep breath, trying not to let the tears prickle his eyes. But he understood. No children. No children when family was all you wanted. She lifted her head, saw the tears pooling in his eyes. You know that want. To have someone who is all yours. To have a future. It's the fairy tale. Love and kids and a happily ever after. He nodded. He knew that want. Knew not everyone could have it. Love isn't only about children. It's about sharing. Sharing the good, sharing the bad. It's about not being alone. She started laughing, looking around the room. I love two men, and I'm still here alone. No, not here alone. I'm here proxy for Shane, because I love him and he loves you. She looked at him and said softly, you didn't stutter that time. He hadn't. She'd already attacked him for saying it, and he'd survived. She looked at his arms, red from her blows, and didn't meet his eyes when she choked out, I hurt you. He didn't answer until she looked up. I forgive you. She crumpled then, lying back down on the carpet, facing away from him and sniffling. Shane won't forgive me, and Brady would have protected you. Christian leaned back against the chair, stretching out his legs. She jerked when his legs touched her back. He wasn't too comfortable with it either, but he stayed there. Stayed until she relaxed against him, her back pressing warmly against his cargo pants. He stroked her hair. Softly, haltingly, Shane will forgive you. I provoked you for your own good. She sniffed again, and Christian said, 
and Brady wasn't protecting me. He doesn't love me. Her back jerked with her laughter, and when the laughs turned back to tears, Christian said gently, I think I know what it looks like when someone loves who they don't want to, when someone loves when they think they shouldn't. You would. He almost laughed, because she was almost funny. He said, if you could have all you want with someone else, would you give up Shane? No. He smiled, no hesitation. If you could have all you want with someone else, would you give up Brady? She didn't answer. And Christian smiled again, because she wasn't hesitating. She didn't answer because she didn't want to say it. Christian said, I think I know what it looks like when someone loves with all their heart. When someone loves no matter what. It's not all my heart. It's half my heart. I don't think so. My parents have five children, and they don't love each of us with one-fifth of their heart. They love with all their heart. They love each of us with their outrageously oversized heart. She laughed. And you think somehow I've got one of these oversized hearts? I think you have the biggest, strongest heart I've ever seen. I think you have a heart that won't break. When it's bruised and raw and bleeding, it still loves. I think you have a heart that needs two people to watch over it, because one is just not enough. She turned her head toward him. I might have to stop hating you if you keep saying things like that. Sorry, I'll stop. She blinked, and the smile was slow in coming, but she finally closed her eyes, shaking her head, smiling. She sighed. Christian. She laid there, her eyes closed, still smiling. Christian leaned his head back and stared at the ceiling and wondered if sometimes family could come in different flavors. If maybe family could come in circles, connecting one to another. He and Cassandra weren't in the same circle, but they were connected, maybe almost family. And he decided he'd keep that thought to himself. She opened her eyes to look at him, at his arms folded across his chest, and she touched the mark she'd made on his skin lightly. I'm sorry, Christian. I won't, again. He chuckled, and she sat up. On all that I hold holy, I won't hit you again. He couldn't help his expression. What do you hold holy? Shane, my love for him. If I ever hit you again, I'll give him up. He knew a vow when he heard one, and he nodded. Okay. She nodded back. Then, Smacks don't count. I never thought they would. Chapter 11 When Shane called to check on Cassandra in the morning, she was the one who answered, and he screamed, You're talking! Why didn't Christian call me? He said, and I quote, that you looked like hell, so we let you sleep. He skipped work again and drove like a maniac to her house and she was showered and dressed, and she smiled at him when he burst through the door, and Shane hugged her, crying on her shoulder. Cass, don't do that to me ever again. She whispered, thank you, Shane, for taking care of me, for loving me. He squeezed her, feeling bones she did not have before, and pushed her away. Did you eat? Christian, has she eaten? Tom and Kenny showed up for their shift, crying out when they saw her among the living and passing her between them until she was black and blue from hugs. She exchanged a look with Christian and said, you were right, I'm universally loved. Christian nodded and everyone else in the room froze. Kenny put a hand to his chest. Oh my God, she's had a near death experience. She shook her head. I was thinking, don't do that. Okay, I'm pretty sure I'm done thinking for the rest of my life. Shane let out a breath. Okay, good. He didn't leave for a few more days, just in case. But he slept, still next to her in bed, still holding her hand. And he showered and shaved, and they were all grateful for it. 
Christian came by every night after work for dinner. And while Shane wouldn't say it out loud again, he thought Kenny might have been right. She'd had a near-death experience. Because she smiled at Christian and laughed at him. And when he apologized, she smacked his arm lightly and said his name like she was talking to a naughty puppy. And then they'd grin at each other, at some inside joke. Made Shane almost want to cross himself. He took her to work and back, to the grocery store to stock up, not wanting her to drive, not wanting her to be alone. Not yet. They stood in front of the drinks, trying to decide what Christian would want without calling him up, because he was making shrimp tonight and they didn't want to disturb his preparations. Cassandra said, Margaritas? He doesn't drink. Neither does Brady. They grimaced at each other, then sighed. Shane said, what do people drink if they don't drink? Root beer? It's like I'm five years old again. What about Coke? Shane hung his head. I don't even know if he drinks Coke, seriously. Cassandra grabbed for a bottle. Root beer it is. What we do for love. Cassandra slid her hand through his arm. What we do for love. And then they both stopped, in the middle of the aisle, with root beer in the cart. Shane said softly, I like him. No veto? He shook his head. Do you think it's possible to love two people? He looked at her then. Yes, I know it is. I told him I loved him. Mm, I was privy to the aftermath. Cassandra shook her head, took a deep breath. I didn't expect him to say it back. I just thought it should be out in the open. Plus, I had to think about it. Shane muttered, cursing at her to never do that again. And she said, he can't have children, vasectomy. She forced it out through a tight throat, refusing to cry in a grocery store aisle. Oh, Cass, what God hates you, right? She shook her head. He was probably thinking, nope, only need one of those. Make sure she doesn't breed. Shane wasn't sure if her tears were what started first or if it was the laughter. She looked up at the industrial ceiling of a suburban supermarket and raised her fist, shook it at a god neither one of them was sure existed, and cried and laughed. Shane wrapped his arms tight around her, cried with her, and wondered if this was the reason for their love the reason she needed lots of parts of hearts, to prop her up when she wasn't strong enough on her own, to cling to Shane when loving Brady hurt, to be snug in Brady's arms when Shane's love wounded, and to have Christian on standby when both of them failed. Shane said, maybe Brady won't love you back. It would be easier, wouldn't it? Easier if you hadn't loved me back and we could go our separate ways, Easier if Brady wouldn't love me back and I didn't have to be constantly reminded that I had his heart, just not all of it. Go find someone else who could give me everything I wanted. Shane nodded, because it would be easier, and she said, yeah, I'm just not that lucky. He sighed, and you say that with a straight face. I've seen him au naturel. She laughed and squeezed and pushed him away. Yes, there are some side benefits. It does lean to the side, doesn't it? I thought I noticed that. She wiped her eyes. You're not going to be even a little bit jealous? You'll make me feel bad at how I treated Christian. Oh, I'm going to be the cattiest, jealous queen you ever did see. Every fight, I'm on your side. He leaves his underwear on the floor? What a bastard. Ditto could be said about you and Christian. I know. Cassandra started walking again. We've got a strange kind of menage a fourth going on. Menage a quatre? Kinky, I like it. With root beer. Ugh, ruin it, why don't you? No kink goes on when it's root beer flowing freely. She looked into the cart and nodded. Absolutely zero kink. Shane glanced at her. You going to call him? She shrugged. 
I don't know. He hasn't called me. Shane bit his tongue. Maybe I'll call him. He nodded. I mean, you just have to, if only for the side benefit. The shrimp was delicious. Christian had grilled mushrooms with it this time, and Shane had thought he would die it was so good. They'd eaten outside, the setting sun their entertainment, and then Cassandra had taken the leftovers inside, saying she needed to be alone with it, and to not follow her for a few minutes. Christian hadn't even blushed, and Shane thought they might get so comfortable with each other they'd be like an old married threesome. Christian watched her go inside and said, she loves you. Cassandra? She does, and you could be just a little bit jealous about it. I am, not because you love her back, but because I wish I had that myself. You can. She'll love you too, eventually. Christian laughed. No, she won't. But I don't need her to love me like that. Because I have you. You love me like that. Shane blinked. And Christian said, you love me no matter what. I could tell you that I only ever want to be friends, and what would you do? I would tell you good luck with that. And then? And then I would be your friend. Christian smiled at him. I don't know what kind of water you two drank when you were kids, but I'd like some. I'd like to be a part of it, a part of you. Shane put his head in his hands. This is my punishment for Cassandra, for loving her for her love. I couldn't give her everything she wanted, and now you can't give me everything I want. Stuck in the hopeless friend zone forever. Christian put his hand on Shane's thigh. Shane, I don't want to be your friend. Shane looked at the thigh on his hand, at the physical contact, at the first time Christian had instigated. Shane lifted his head out of his hands, and when his eyes met Christian's, Christian said, I'm a good Mormon gay boy. That's who, what, I am. I believe in love for time and all eternity. And maybe others don't believe in it for me, but that's what I'm offering you. I don't want to fling with you. I want forever. I want to get old and gray with you. I want to believe that we'll be having brunch together for the next 60 years, and then for a few millennia after that. Tears prickled Shane's eyes, but he said, You do take the long view. Christian said, I'm asking you to marry me, Shane. Shane's bottom lip wobbled, and he whispered, But you're not on your knees. Christian smiled and went to his knees. Christian held his hands out, and when Shane gently grabbed them, Christian said, Shane, I love you. I love everything about you. I love me when I'm with you. I love how fearless you are, how loyal. I love your flamboyance and your optimism. I love that you haven't given up on me. Shane shook his head. Never. I didn't think I would ever have this. I didn't think I could, I didn't think I should. He grinned when Shane grimaced at that hateful should. Christian said, I don't think this will be easy, for me, for you, for my family, but it will be worth it. He brought Shane's hands up, kissed them. Will you marry me? One tear spilled over, and then another. Shane opened his mouth, and for the first time in his life, he was speechless. He sat there crying, looking down into eyes that loved him, eyes that were asking him to marry him, eyes that wanted to be with him forever. He cleared his throat because he wasn't going to ruin this moment by not being able to say yes. And then he held up a finger and cried just a little bit more. He hadn't prepared for this, no daydream, no fantasy had involved Christian on his knees, proposing. And Christian just waited, patient as the day, as patient as Shane had been with him. Shane said, I love you. Christian nodded and waited some more because that hadn't been a yes. 
Shane cleared his throat. This is never going to happen again. I want to enjoy it as long as possible. Christian scooted on one knee toward him, smiling. Is it going to eventually be a yes? Yes. Good enough. He rose up, placing his hands on either side of Christian's face and pecking his lips. Love you. Shane pulled him down onto his lap and kissed Christian for real. A flash in the dark blinded them as Cassandra took a picture, capturing that moment forever. She waved the camera at them, smiling, and said, Surprise! Christian called his sister the next day. He could hear his nieces and nephews playing in the background, loudly. And he knew he'd never have that. No kids. When he'd been told his whole life that's what a family was. When that's what he'd wanted his whole life. He listened to his sister talking excitedly, telling him about school events and milestones. When she paused, asked him what he'd been up to, he said, I'm getting married. Linnell yelled, what? To who? Christian took a deep breath. His name is Shane. There was a long pause, and Christian closed his eyes. He finally said, are you surprised? No, a little. Mom and dad will be. They're going to be shocked, but they won't be surprised, Christian. He blinked. He'd tried so hard to hide it when he couldn't. He'd tried to be something that he wasn't, and everyone had always known. The knot that had sat in his stomach for the last 28 years loosened. Everyone already knew. How could it be so wrong to be, how could it be so wrong to be gay when everyone could know just by looking at him? He turned to Shane, who was sitting on the kitchen counter swinging his legs and eating guacamole out of the bowl with his finger. Shane watched Christian, just let him do what had to be done. Christian smiled at him, and Shane smiled back. Linnell said, do you want me to tell them first? They're not going to come. I already know that, but I thought they should know. I'll come. Tears sprang into his eyes, and he turned away from Shane. He opened his eyes wide, blinking rapidly and saying softly, Thank you, Linnell. I would like that. Cassandra didn't call Brady. It had been almost a month since he'd walked out and hadn't walked back in. She wasn't sure if that's what she was waiting for, for him to walk back in. She wasn't sure why she was waiting at all, except maybe just putting it off as long as possible, because like ripping off a Band-Aid, it was going to hurt. Whether it came off slow or fast, she knew whatever happened next would hurt. She flipped through bridal magazines with Shane, picked colors with Christian, because he could not be left alone with that decision. They didn't want to end up with black and white tablecloths or plaid. Dear God, not plaid. And every time she got into her little peach lady, she thought of Rodrigo and the pool, thought of the penthouse views and the air tub, thought about the long drive to Brentwood that had become second nature, and Sunday evening meetings followed by a long drive. She didn't think about sleeping next to a hot body who couldn't sleep without her. She didn't think about eating off one finely built chest. She didn't think about the sex, hardly ever. Cassandra drove to the cemetery and wiped two spotless gravestones, put flowers in their holders. She had thought that she had something to say or to ask, but it was so quiet that she just stood there and listened, and didn't interrupt. She drove to Calabasas and a boxy modern house, with a pool that she'd never taken advantage of, and a for sale sign sitting on the front lawn, and her heart knocked in her chest. She slammed on the brakes, lucky there was no one behind her, and stared at the sign. For sale? She parked her car in the drive, and just sat there, wondering what the hell a for sale sign meant. She got out, 
wandering around the outside of the house, peeking in windows, and got angrier and angrier. Because he'd just left her, knocked her on her ass and left her for a month without a word. She'd told him she loved him. It wasn't a four-letter word. It wasn't a life sentence. Okay, with her it kind of was. He wasn't getting rid of her. She thought about it, and he wasn't getting rid of her. Brady was in his office when he got a call from the front desk saying there was a situation at Valet. Can Rodrigo take care of it? Rodrigo's the situation. That was new, and Brady felt a tug of curiosity that quickly died. Call security. Sir, I think you need to take care of it. Brady looked at the phone. Who is this? Are you new? No, sir. I'm not new, and there's a situation at Valet that you need to take care of. And then whoever was calling from the front desk hung up on him. Brady banged a fist on his desk, and then did it again for good measure, before pushing himself up and stomping out of his office. He didn't even look to see if a guest was checking in, just turned the corner, roaring, if there is a problem in the hotel. No one was paying attention to him. They were all looking out the front windows at Rodrigo, arms folded, jaw jutting, facing off against Cassandra, who was jabbing her finger in his chest and shouting. She was thin, a good 15 pounds lighter than when he'd left her. Her hair was a little longer, pulled back in a short ponytail instead of fashionably spiked. Brady's heart thumped in his chest, and he just stood watching with the rest of his staff. She'd decided what she was going to do about her love. She'd decided, and he didn't want to know. He'd known she would come tell him. No matter what she decided, she'd come tell him, because she didn't believe in hiding anything. Good or bad, she'd put it out in the open so it wouldn't fester. A very quiet voice said behind him, Sir, aren't you going to stop them? He wasn't. He was going to wait right here half hoping that Rodrigo could keep her out of the hotel. Except Rodrigo raised a hand, and Brady was running, across the lobby and out the door, before it registered that Rodrigo wasn't going to hit, just jabbing his finger at the little peach lady. Brady burst through the doors, skidding to a stop, and Cassandra stopped yelling. She looked at him, at the suit size of muscle he'd lost in the last month, and her jaw dropped. She said, loud enough for God and man to hear, are you using again? No. Are you using again? He said, no. Her eyes searched his, and she flicked her fingers at his shirt. Off. Let's go inside. Take it off, Brady. There's no point in going inside if you've started using again. He stripped his shirt off, in front of his hotel and his staff. His eyes never left hers as he undid his tie and handed it to Rodrigo. One button, two, all the way down to his pants. And he never dropped her eyes. She studied each arm carefully, smelled his breath, stood on her tiptoes, grabbed his jaw and looked up his nose, measured his pupils. The sun beat down on his shoulders, her fingers stopped digging into his face and started cradling and he wanted to close his eyes and feel this moment. Feel this moment, when he was claimed by a woman who would never let go. A woman who would never let him give in. She let go of him, and turned to Rodrigo for a long moment. I'm sorry. She held her hand out. It won't happen again. Brady took his shirt and tie back. What did she say? And how much of a raise is it going to take? Cassandra didn't look at Brady, just kept her eyes on Rodrigo and her hand in the air. I made him worry about you. Rodrigo said, won't happen again? She shook her head, and he shook her hand, nodding. Now, I'll go park your little peach lady. Brady whispered, it's not going to happen again. Let's go inside, she said, and Brady shook his head tipping his head up a little, out here in the sun. 
in front of your staff? It's love, Cassandra. Nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to hide. She turned to him, blinking, and said, Love? That's what you came to tell me, right? That you love me, no matter what. She whispered, no matter what. He wished it didn't have to be like that, that he could give her what she wanted, but he couldn't. He said, I can try to get it undone. It's possible, at least. You checked? He nodded. He'd checked. Didn't know how he could survive having another child, but for her, he would try. She linked her fingers through his and smiled at him. He said, you may not care about the why, but I do. I want to hear it. I love you because, because I crawled into your arms and liked being there. Brady shook his head. No, that's not it. I love you because I found a home. Because my heart saw in you someone who knew hurt. Someone who knew how to stand back up again and again. To cling to what was good and say fuck you to the legion of hurts. To say what's next. She stepped into him, sliding her arms around his waist and murmuring, I miss this. I miss you. I missed being with someone who'd died, someone who'd killed what he loved most in the world and hadn't stopped loving them. Someone who'd learned the hard way how not to quit because life is hard. He said, life's a bitch. What's next? Oh, I like that. He rested his chin on her head, hugging her to him. My wife wasn't perfect. You were not second best. I want you to know that. She squeezed him. No, not second best, just alternate reality. Just if life was kind, we would be with other people, but it's not, and we're lucky to have each other. He shook his head. I don't like alternate reality either. If your wife was here, would you be choosing me? He closed his mouth and she chuckled. We'll just call it permanently temporary. As temporary as a heart attack. My one love, part B. He tipped her chin up, stopping her mouth with his own. He said, how about just love? Also. Our also love. Our secondary love. He kissed her again, silencing her. And Cassandra said against his mouth, how about just love? The end. Epilogue, three years and nine months later. Christian pulled out the bottom of the chair, turning it into a bed. He fluffed a pillow. He folded a sheet, just so, and tucked it in. Cassandra closed her eyes so she wouldn't have to watch him anymore. Brady sat next to her on the hospital bed, holding her hand in his big one, and saying quietly, you going to be okay here? Shane said, not so quietly, the real question is, is Christian going to be okay with her? Christian looked up from his sheet. I'll be okay, she's trapped in that bed. Cassandra grinned. She was trapped in this bed. Her legs were encased in compression sleeves to keep her blood from clotting. And while her legs were no longer numb, she was pretty sure she didn't want to stand up. She could cross C-section off her list. Didn't need to do that again. She said, we'll be okay. Shane rocked Tabitha Cassandra Johnson Wilder in his arms and watched Christian get ready for the first night shift. When everything was just right, they put Tibby in her bassinet and rolled her out into the hallway for an evening stroll through the maternity ward to look and be looked at in her pink plaid onesie. Cassandra sighed when they left, and Brady maneuvered her pillow into a more comfortable spot. She said, you going to be able to sleep without me? No, I'll unpack some boxes. I might have us moved in by the time you come home. She looked around the sterile hospital room at Christian's makeshift bed. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to sleep without you either except for these drugs they've pumped into me. They might knock me right out. Mm-hmm. 
He put his head down next to hers on the pillow, and Cassandra whispered, are you going to hold her? Brady shook his head, but Cassandra knew he would. When they were alone with the baby, just the two of them, and he could remember when he'd held his son. He could cry with no one but her to see. Cassandra would cry a little with him, and then he would hold Tibby again and look in her eyes and not remember his son. He would only see her, and he would fall in love with her. He said, I don't know how you're going to be able to give her up. I'm not giving her up. Aunt Cassandra and Uncle Brady live right down the street from her. I'll be the go-to babysitter. I'll see her first steps, hear her first words. I'll have after-school snacks, Sunday afternoons, lazing by the pool. I'll be who she sneaks off to after fights with her dads. I'll hear all the crazy boyfriend stories, and she'll call me when she gets her first fender bender. He smiled. I can see that. She grinned. I couldn't have children with Shane. A hot, glistening turkey baster was as close as I could get. And by the way, you wielded it so expertly, I'm still coming. He chuckled, then sniffed. She said, I can't have children with you. Why do I always fall in love with men who can't give me what I want? Some things couldn't be undone, and his vasectomy had turned out to be one of those things. So Cassandra had done what she always did, be happy with what she could have. And hey, she'd got to make a baby with Shane after all. When Brady opened his eyes, she was smiling at him. She whispered, I can't have what I want, but I'm lucky enough to have what I need. You give me what I need, Brady. Fast cars and hot sex? Yes, those figure prominently, but also a home. Arms to crawl into when I need them. Love? Always love. She raised her hand, looking at her wedding ring. Remembered Shane and Christian shanghaiing her, stuffing her into a wedding dress that was gorgeously purple. And even though she'd never tell them, they knew without her saying a word that it was just perfect. The families had been there, both sets of them, inside the hotel's reception room. Mackenzie and Ethan, their three boys running around and smiling charmingly at anyone who got in their way. And there had been a little glimmer in Ethan's eye that said this time it was a girl. The look in Mackenzie's that said it had better be. It hadn't been. But maybe this time it was, or the next. Ethan did want six, after all. Brady had stood at the front, waiting for her, and she'd shaken off her two men, stomping up to Brady. You really think I'm going to say yes? Brady smiled that sinister smile that made her shiver, and Shane fan himself. When have you ever said no? He had a point. But she made him sweat a little when the official asked her, made him and everyone wait. And Brady just waited until she was good and ready, until she was sure this wasn't her second choice. If she could have the world exactly as she wished, this is what she would have chosen. And she said, yes, the end. Brady smiled, not a little smile, not sinister. He showed her the braided wedding band, tipped it to show her the inscription inside. The end. And then slipped it onto her finger. She turned her head on the pillow toward him and said, I wanted Shane. I wanted children. I need you. I have everything I need. Brady closed his eyes, smiling, because he believed her, because she didn't need to say it anymore. Life was hard, some harder than others, but they'd both pick it to be exactly like this. They lay there together until the door opened back up to Christian and Shane, comparing Tibby most favorably to all the other babies on the floor, and how she must be the most beautiful girl in the whole world. Shane kissed Christian goodnight, took one more picture of Tibby with his phone, because a whole night without her is going to be excruciating, and leaned in to pet Cass on the cheek. He whispered into her ear, no better friend ever lived, Cass. He looked up at Brady. Thanks for sharing her. I don't think it was me who was sharing. 
She took Shane's hand on one side and Brady's hand on the other, closed her eyes, and listened to the five heartbeats inside this little room and smiled. Her family. When they'd left and the nurse had brought her some pain pills and they'd turned off the lights and turned on the nightlight that Christian had brought and he'd settled into his uncomfortable looking bed, Christian said softly, Cassandra? She kept her eyes closed and whispered, yeah, thank you, thank you for my family. She opened her eyes to look over at him. I was just keeping them warm for you. He made a soft sound and another, and Cassandra listened for a moment, not knowing if he was laughing or crying. And then she made a soft sound herself, not knowing if she was laughing or crying because she was laughing and crying. The baby woke up, squirming and chuffing. Christian jumped up, picking her up and patting her back, his face filled with worry and concern. He gave Tibby the tiny dropper full of milk Cassandra had managed to pump earlier, tried to get her to suck at a little bottle. He rocked her, soothing her, until the baby finally quieted. Christian wrapped the baby back up in her blanket an expert already, put her back in her little bed and smiled at Cassandra. She smiled back because she knew there was no one more careful than Christian, no one who would be more gentle with the two people she loved and couldn't have than him. And Cassandra finally realized she was laughing. They were all laughing. This has been Some Like It Hopeless, written by Megan Bryce, narrated by Tess Irondale. Copyright 2014 by Megan Bryce. Production copyright by Megan Bryce.